and we are live. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Wildlife Board work session for March 31st, 2021 at 9 a.m. Uh, I just want to go through a roll call with the Wildlife Board to make sure everybody's there that uh, Brett Selman has called in. And he's not going to be available. <clears throat> Hopefully he can show up later on in this meeting. I'll start the roll call with Kevin Albrecht. Here. Randy Durth. Here. Donnie Hunter. Here. Carl Hurst. Here. Wade Heaton. Here. The board is all present. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, turn the time over to Ashley Green. going to give us a DWR update this morning. Ashley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll just be brief today. We have a long day ahead of us and a, a lot of uh, great presentations uh, for the board today. So just wanted to update you on a couple of things. Um, first of all, as requested by the board at, at your December 2020 meeting, uh, the division has begun a review of our landowner permit rule. We've assembled a diverse committee of both landowner and sportsman interests, and we held our first meeting of that committee last week. Kevin Albrecht is representing the board on that committee. Uh, we'll, we'll be meeting uh, throughout the next uh, two or three months, and our goal is to bring a revised rule through the public process this fall. Uh, just a couple of things about COVID-related items. Uh, most of our staff are still teleworking for much of their work week. Regional supervisors and section chiefs are currently working on what our staffing operations might look like post-COVID. So we'll be re reviewing those plans and our, our uh, post-COVID staffing plans will be Im implemented as soon as it's appropriate to do so. I wanted to give you a, just a quick update on our big game application period that just ended on March 18th. As has been the trend for many years now, our applications continue to rise. We finished the application period with 571,710 applications, which was 46,000 apps above last year or nearly a 9% increase from 2020. So there continues to be a lot of interest in hunting big game in Utah, which is great. Uh, just wanted to throw those numbers out as we go throughout our day and talk about permit numbers. Just uh, wanted the board to be aware of that and we can keep those numbers in mind as we go through our discussions today. Then the last update I wanted to provide uh, to the board was I know there's a lot of questions about uh, when we might get back to normal, whatever that means. Um, so we've begun working on what our public process might look like post COVID. Uh, we're looking at some hybrid model options that could take the best parts of our current virtual process and, com and combine them with uh, the old in-person meeting format that we've all been used to. Uh, we'll bring those details to the racks and the board once we get a better idea of what the technology will allow us to do. Uh, implementation uh, obviously will depend on COVID protocols in place by state and local health departments, as well as when we can get all the technology in place to be able to do something like that. So we'll get you an update as soon as we can. And that's all the update I wanted to provide today, Byron, so we can get into our meeting. Thanks, Ashley. Any questions from the board for Ashley? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, Covey. Give us uh, your presentation on what data goes into a buck deer hunt recommendation. Hey, Byron, I wondered if I could just hold on one sec, Kobe. I wonder if I could just uh, just take a couple of minutes really quick, Byron, and just kind of introduce kind of the full agenda and what we're planning on doing today. Is, is that all right? That's fine. Go ahead, Ashley. OK, thank you. So really quick, I just wanted to just uh, let the board know we've got a uh, some really great presentations. I just wanted to thank all of our staff throughout the state. This is a really busy time of the year for them. We just finished a capture season and, and a recommendation cycle, but we've got some really great presentations. Kobe and Ken are gonna give us kind of a statewide big picture view of some of the issues with just hunting statewide, uh, some of the research uh, that's been conducted and some of the data that obviously that we collect that helps us make our recommendations. And then, all of, and th and then we'll have a segment where all of our uh, regional wildlife managers uh, will spend some time talking about each unit within their region and we'll have all the biologists uh, are also on board in case there's any questions but we'll go through each region and each unit and talk about all the data points that, that have been collected that went into making the recommendations and then um, after that's done uh, in the afternoon uh, Darren will give us an update on predator control efforts that are going on around the state and then Daniel Eddington will give us an update on our WRI efforts uh, 
what's uh, currently in the queue and what's being proposed for the upcoming year that that have a specific emphasis on mule deer habitat. And then uh, at the end of the day, we've got uh, an open board discussion where we can talk about any other issues that's uh, top of mind for the board, or we can answer any questions that, that we haven't adequately addressed throughout the day. So that's kind of how we'd like to proceed. Thanks, Ashley. Chloe, you ready? Uh, yes, Byron, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with that, I'll, I'll give my presentation. So you're going to be seeing a lot of technical presentations today and a lot of presentations that but technical in nature, very data driven. This presentation is not that. There, there is some a slight technical aspect to it when we talk about the cycle of deer. But then when we get into uh, what I wanted to share with the board is there's always conflicting sentiment and, and how we manage and why we manage and share some of those pressures that I know you feel and we feel together and, um, and go through the scale of management and talk about what that really means and why sometimes both groups can be completely correct and saying completely different things. So with that, uh, deer in the scale of management. And my slide should have just changed and there it did. Whenever a biologist manages the population, uh, a deer population, first there are several questions that they ask themselves. Uh, where is the population currently? Where do we wanna be? And what recommendations will get us there? Well, to get a current status, it's, a, it's kind of a big thing. It takes a year round monitoring effort. We'll go through this and we'll look at it. It's the life of a deer. Uh, starting in uh, spring when fawns are born, we'll call it neonates. Um, and we'll also go through what the biologists are doing during that time to understand this a little better. So spring and summer, adults and yearlings just made it through, uh, the yearlings just made it through their first winter, adults made it through another winter. Uh, the transition from winter to spring is the hardest time for a deer. You know, this is when their diet changes, they come back off woody brows and onto hotter feed, uh, forbs. It's also when fawns are born. Um, and we see a lot of mortality right in during this transition. Some deer are in such poor condition that when they transition, they just don't make it. Fawns drop end of May, beginning of June, and biologists are continually monitoring uh, cause of death. Cause-specific mortality is what we call it, to understand what is driving survival and mortality in these populations. Uh, any of the neonate studies that we're doing across the state begin. You know, we've done neonate studies the last couple of years on both the book lifts and the cash. Uh, and, and again, when I say the word neonate, I mean a fawn that is zero to six months old. And when I say the word fawn, I mean a, an animal that is six to 18 months old. And we continue as biologists to man monitor range conditions, drought impacts, health and survival. We go out, we, we, we monitor deer, we look at deer, how are they? What do they, what do they look like? What are they using? What does the habitat look like? Is it overutilized? Is it underutilized? And we continue that on through summer. We get into fall and this is the time of harvest. It's when we have hunters of field. It's where most of the interaction from our public is with deer. It's where we collect data from field check stations and harvest surveys to know how many we remove from the population for our models later on. We continue to collect cause specific mortality and we get some of the most important data all year and that is the post season classification ratios. Our, our post season buck doe ratios, our post season fawn doe ratios to know how many bucks we're left with after all of our harvest and to know what we're going into winter with as far as our uh, as far as the number of fawns on the landscape. Winter starts a new survival year for deer. Now this is important. Survival year for deer starts December 1. We monitor December 1 throughout the year and in November we start a new survival year. During that we go out, we capture deer, upwards of 800 plus animals across the land. We look at fawn weights 
We look at body fat on adult females. We collar and monitor those animals to see what the cause of mortality is. We evaluate, uh, during this time of year, we also take all the data that we've taken, we evaluate that data. Um, and that's where we get our population model. It's also the time where we recommend next year's buck permits and we continue to assess winter conditions. So biologists are out looking at, we take data on temperature, snow depth and forage availability to see if there's a situation where we need to feed these animals, do an emergency feeding to, to help them get through the winter. So that's how we find out where we are, right? As biologists, that's what gives us the current status. Um, we look at all the metrics and we say, here are the number of fawns coming into the population. Here are the number of bucks removed from the population. Here are the number of does removed from the population. Here is the percent survival. And this is how many we have to have in order to make everything work. Well, where we want to be, Kent said we should call this the Pentagon of Possibilities. Because where we want to be is not, it, it's not the same for everybody. And there are a lot of things to take into account. How many animals are appropriate? How many bucks do we want left post-season? Uh, what kind of distribution should we have? How many permits should we be issuing in order to get there? How much depredation are we willing to tolerate? And what about hunter success rates and hunter satisfaction? Uh, where do we take that into account? With all of this and all the possibilities to be all over the board, um, really this is where we need a management plan because we can be in several different places. Management plans help set up they, di they dictate the priorities. They set the goals and objectives and they give us the strategies to use to get there. They also balance the competing demands on the landscape and say, okay, we'll tolerate this much depredation and more than that, we need to reduce that population or we need to try other tools. Um, and they define what success looks like. Without a management plan, you're all over the board and you don't know what success looks like. And know, it's important to remember that every one of these plans it's created by a committee of diverse constituents, and then it's taken through a public process and modified to where we all agree we're going to manage to this over the next period of time. And that period of time is usually somewhere in five to seven years. And Mule Deer in Utah, we like really, really tight windows. We found out we like five years. You know, we want to know, we want to re revisit, sit down and see what's working in this plan and what's not every five years. So that's where hunt recommendations come in. You know, now we know what success looks like. Um, we know what we're supposed to try to manage to. And so the biologists sit down and they make hunt recommendations to the plan that we've all, all agreed upon. They're shaped by data, knowledge, experience, and they're adjusted annually. So it should be easy, right? And this is the part where, as I, as I look at as I look at everybody, um, you know, it should just be something we sit down, we say, here's what they are. And everybody says, all right, thanks. And we move on. Well, why isn't it easy? Why is it difficult? And I think that comes down to the scale of management. I'm going to give an example here, and I want the board to know this is an elk example, right? But what I'm really trying to highlight is scale and the fact that we experience wildlife and we manage wildlife at different scales. We experience wildlife at the canyon scale, at the local scale, at the individual animal scale. And we have to manage wildlife in order, in order to get quantifiable metrics at the population scale. So again, it's an elk example, but I think it works well with deer too, just to talk about some things that we've learned about scale. So the Wasatch, big unit, central Utah, lots of people live around the Wasatch, pretty important unit. Uh, we watched this unit shoot past the population objective, but the public was not seeing elk during the hunts. Well, who was right? Well, here's what our data showed. In 2007, 6,700 animals. 2010, 7,700 animals. 2012, 8,900 animals. We're at 9,000 animals and we're supposed to be managing for 5,400 animals. But this was the conundrum, right? We were in a situation where our public was saying there are no elk. And we were saying, well, they're elk. Like, 
we're still way over objective. Um, we even took constituents on flights. We took a flight on this unit with a constituent and we counted the population objective in four hours. This unit takes 35 hours to fly. We counted it in four, not an estimated an actual physical count. What we realized along the way is it's, it's, it's really a question of perception. Like, that both could be right. Um, it took a lot of working with the constituents. It took a lot of meetings, a lot of, and, and we got to a point where both opinions can be right at the same time. I don't know if you're seeing a duck or a rabbit here, but either way, you're right. It led to the formation of Wasatch Elk Committee 1.0 and 2.0, a revision of the statewide management plan with new hunt types and new management tools, and to the biggest GPS collar study done on elk in the West, and broad-based support to increase the population objective by 3,000 animals. Well, here's what it looked like when we did the collar study. Now, the message I'm trying to send here isn't that all deer are on private land because of pressure or that, and, and deer behave very differently than elk. The message I'm trying to send is that from perception wise, both opinions can be right. And this is what happened on Wasatch elk. On the left is a percent of elk on public land on the Y axis. On the X axis, this is a Julian day calendar proceeding from zero all the way through the end of the year. In the winter, about half the elk are on private and half are on public. As time goes on through summer, the elk up on the national forest you end up with right around 75% of your animals on public land. As you proceed into fall, and you start to have pressure, apply pressure to these animals, what we saw was a drastic decrease in the number of animals that would stay on public land, down to where at the peak of the pressure during the rifle deer hunt, 75% of those animals were unavailable and on private land, and 25% were still available to the public. That's a big number. Um, you know, we have 9,000 elk. So when we changed tools, readjusted, and managed a little differently, we were able to change the shape of this curve. If you look between these two slides and you just see the shape, you can see that we smoothed it. And then when you look at the actual numbers, in two years, we increased at, at the very worst point during the peak of the, the rifle deer hunt, where we used to have 25% of elk on public land, um, we ended up with 35. That's about 900 elk that now are available to the public that weren't before, just by changing a few strategies and listening to the public. Scale matters. So individuals experience wildlife at a scale that is much different than the scale which we manage wildlife. You can't manage wildlife on a local individual scale. When, when somebody corners one, one of you all as a board member, as a biologist and says, I've had the worst time I've ever had the last couple of years on my unit. And it's been going downhill and I've never seen it worse. And we look at them and we say, well, what we can say is that population peaked in 2015. You know, if we're, if we're talking about the man type, for example, that population peaked in 2015 it's been more uh, resistant, more resilient to drought than some of the units around it. It's been relatively stable uh, since then. It hasn't fallen off much. We grew a lot of deer from 2010 to 2015, and we're still above what we were in 2010. And they say, well, I hunt Timber Creek. And in Timber Creek, I'm telling you, it's the worst it's ever been. It doesn't mean they're not telling the truth. It doesn't mean those pressures aren't real. What it means is that they're experiencing wildlife at the scale of Timber Creek. And because you can't take management metrics on that scale, um, you, you can't tell what a population is doing at a small scale. There is no way to collect that data. Um, and then their experiences shape their perceptions. We are working hard to try to continue to do things to bridge this gap. I think one of the biggest things we've done are GPS satellite collars. These give us a point every two hours of how animals use the landscape. We're trying to communicate and educate that here's what buck doe ratios are, and this is what that means. However, 
you know, your hunt may be different. We're using things like georeference databases and just taking the time to listen. You know, just taking the time to listen and hear others and say, I understand that was rough. I'm, I'm sorry. There's a lot of things that go into a hunt from water to moon phase to anything else. And I, I'm sorry your, your, your experience was poor. And here's how the unit's doing as a whole. Now, this is where I, um, I, I, I read a lot of comments, and I probably shouldn't. Um, I'm not one of those people that lets it roll off me very easily. It affects me, for sure. And I read comments about our biologists not understanding this scale. And <clears throat> I put a couple slides in here. These are our district biologists and our wildlife managers from across the state. And I can tell you that every one of us has a timber creek. Every one of us understands how populations do. And the people, the folks that we've hired, the men and women that we've hired to manage wildlife across our state, they get this. They get that they can have a super poor hunt where they don't harvest. And then they can come back and classify deer and they're up. You know, they, they understand the difference in this. Um, and I guess I just wanted to share that we, we are hunters too. We're not just biologists. We're not just out in our new fancy trucks once a year. We work hard to manage these populations. We work hard to meet the management metrics. Um, and we love wildlife and we hunt. So what does all this mean? Like, why did I present this today? There are a few reasons. One, just biologists collect data year round on deer. It's not a one and done. It's not fall classification. We're looking at cause specific mortality, body fat and disease survival all year long. Another point is that management plans dictate priorities, provide direction, define success. If, if we're all over the place, there is no way to understand what success looks like. Wildlife management occurs at a different scale than human wildlife interactions, and both perceptions may be valid. But if we have data, let's look at the data. If, if all we have are opinions, let's go with mine, because I like mine the best, right? I remember having a conversation with Dax one time about a management action that I took, and I said, well, Dax, I, I really like the idea. And he looked at me and said, of course you do. It was your idea. And I took a step back and thought, well, yeah, of course I do. It was my idea. It's a pretty good idea. Um, but if, if, if it's just an opinion, it, it's, that's what it is. You know, let's look at the data. It may conflict at times with what we hear. And we understand that as, as a board, I'm sure you share a lot of these same sentiments. I know a lot of our board members are hunters. They experience wildlife at this scale as well. Um, and so sometimes the data, when we give it to you, it, it, it seems conflicting. I think my final point is that just managing to the plan and listening to the public makes for the best wildlife management. Uh, I love our public process. I'm grateful that we have a public process. We're able to take into account good, constructive comments. And, and finally, just a plea to, to let the plans run their course. They're not that long. They're only five years long. And there's no way to evaluate the effectiveness of a plan if we're changing it every year. And that's what I had to present. So with that, um, I'll take any questions. Any questions from the board? Kobe? Yes, Byron. That was a great presentation. That, uh, that's one of the best ones I've seen you do. So good luck. Not good work. <laughs> this day. Thanks, Byron. It's not saying much, but I do appreciate that. <laughs> Kobe, this
this this is Carl. It's not a question. I just I think one of the the key things is is determining what success in deer management looks like, and I I really like that phrase on that. Um, I'm I'm going to use that as I talk to people, but I think that's the 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 key question to, that I'll be asking people that I interact with is is what does success look like to you? And I, I just appreciate that because that, that will help me tremendously. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I have a comment. So, Colby, we, we too, when we when we go to the store, we live in these local communities, we, we hear those comments. We, we get them. We understand, you know, exactly what you get. Um, but sometimes I think uh, – um, you know, there, there is data that, that shows um, that, that the populations are struggling, and I understand that we need to look at it as a whole. Um, but, but for an example, here on the Manti fair end drainage, we did two fuel cycles with a helicopter, and we didn't count any deer. Um, and I, I, I didn't know that it was as bad as it was, but when I go to the store, I, I get hammered. P people are mad. You know, they, they let me know. What, and so... I get that there are other areas on the unit that are that are doing bad, but it's my hope that we don't forget about the, those areas, um, or, or I should say, there's areas that have deer on the rest of the unit. But it's my hope that we don't hear, we don't lose what those people are saying, and that we don't forget about those fair and drainages that are really struggling. I think that's a great point, uh, honestly, Kevin. It, and that, and that's why I think listening and, and and trying to understand when when a member of the public says, "Hey, I know this is what the unit does, is doing, but this is what I'm experiencing," and trying to understand, um, trying to understand that, and work. I'm not saying we don't work on it. I'm saying that there is a gap there. We continue to work to bridge that gap, and we have to continue to take meaningful, meaningful data. And sometimes that data is at a scale that's a little larger. But you're right. It doesn't mean we forget places like South Manti. It means we work hard on them. We try to bridge the gap. Yeah. I think, I think you know, those, those South Mantis, those, the boulders, those that are really struggling, we need to, we need to look in here and then find out a, a management plan that can work specifically on those. So, so Colby, I'll ask you the, I'll ask you the tough question. Uh, I mean, what is the answer, or maybe there isn't an answer, to we just need to grow more deer. I mean, is it killing fewer bucks? Is it, I mean, we, we, we limit our doe tags to, to problem areas. It, it, is it really just that we need to weather the drought? What, I mean, how do we grow more deer? What, what's that golden answer? Yeah, and I know, wait, wait, I know you had a question too. I'll answer Carl's question first. And um, the answer is we're doing it. You know, we are setting ourselves up in every way to be able to grow when we can grow. We're identifying limiting factors. We're identifying units. Uh, Kevin mentioned the boulder. You know, this last year, we got a lot of cars out on the boulder. Um, and, and we're learning about boulder. The boulder is, it, it's summer range limited. You know, it would, nobody would guess that, but the, the deer that came off that mountain came off extremely skinny. And so we need some summer habitat projects in order to bolster that population. So when it comes down to it, Carl, I guess I, I, I better be concise and answer the question. And that is that harvesting more or fewer bucks won't change what our deer are doing. You know, when there's a big biological window on how many bucks you can harvest and how many deer you have on the landscape as far as the population goes. Um, the things we can do to grow more deer are be in a position to grow deer when the climate allows us to grow deer. And what I mean by that is we can make sure that our habitat's in good condition. We can make sure that we've reduced predator loads where they're having an impact. We can make sure that um, we, we have the right distribution we can hit target areas, pull back off other areas. Like those are the things that we can do. Um, but buck hunting doesn't influence that. And, and I wish that that were the silver bullet. Man, if that were the silver bullet, 
We cut from 225,000 permits in 1994. We should have gear out our ears, right? Yeah. Right? You know, we're, we, we're down, we're recommending 74,000 permits this year. Like, if that were the silver bullet, we figured that out. We know how to cut. That's easy. I wish it were that easy. I really, really do. Thank you. Bye, Sorry, Red White. Uh, I just, I just want to make a comment, kind of to Kobe's overall, you know, overall presentation. It was really, to me, it was about kind of the overall landscape, the overall picture for management, and and there's a political component to that. And, and Kobe talked about it. You know, we look at data, we look at, you know, public input, and and, and that sort of thing. And I and I appreciate that because there, there, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, we get, uh, obviously, the division goes through the data, and, and the majority of our decision needs to be data-driven. But there is also a social component to this, and we talk a lot about it and try to ignore it as much as we can, typically, because the, that social element is driven not by the data. It's driven by our observations of Timber Canyon. And, and, and I appreciate that. We certainly need to take that into account. That's uh, to me. That's one of the major reasons why, uh, you know, we've got the rack process. But you know, we've we've talked a lot about the rack process and getting public input. Certainly, COVID has kind of killed our public process. But we still get a lot of input, as Kevin mentioned. We're getting input in the grocery store. We're getting input on the phone, emails. Uh, we're getting input from everywhere. And the legislature we're getting input from. So there's a, it's not just the RAC process or it's not just the data or what the division uh, is they're proposing to us. There's a lot of variables that we've got to consider. And then I think we have to decide how do we prioritize that? You know, as we're making, as we're setting management plans, what is most important? Like Carl said, how do we def define success? And, you know, I really think it does boil down to everybody's got their Timber Canyon. Every one of us and every member of the public out there that hunts, that's one of the major reasons why we split the general season deer units uh, the way that we did. We've got a lot more units and a lot more herds. But even within each unit, each general season unit, there are at a couple of dozen Timber Canyons. And so, I mean, this, this is never black and white. There is never an easy answer to this. We've got to consider the overall picture, but we've also got to consider unit-wide pictures and even Timber Canyon pictures occasionally. Um, and so I, I just, I appreciate Kobe trying to, you know, or not trying, he did a good job of kind of describing it for us, but this is pretty complex. You know, when we really start considering everything that goes into a vote, at that table, when we're trying to decide what to do, it isn't simple. Thanks, Wade. Any other board members? I think that our next segment, uh, Kent's gonna answer some of those questions for us, hopefully. Kent, are you ready to go ahead? I am. Mm -hmm. Come on. All right. Everybody seeing that? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and Byron, I guess I'll start off. Um, it's up to you and how you want to do this. It, it, has a lot of data in this presentation. Um, so if we want to stop during the talk and if have people have questions or if you want just to go the whole way through it and ask everything at the end, um, I'm fine either way. Do you have a, a preference on that? I think we need to go all the way through the presentation, Kent, so we don't get sidetracked and 
at the end. You got some extra time, so just okay. go ahead with your presentation. Sounds good. Um, so thank you. Um, this talk's gonna focus largely on uh, the, the monitoring efforts we've done over the past six, seven years and, and what we've learned about how drought comes into play when we're looking at these animals. Um, so just an overview of what I plan to talk about. Um, first off, just a brief introduction of what we do to monitor deer across the state. And when, and when I talk monitoring, I'm talking mainly our collaring efforts. COVID did a good job of talking about everything that we do. Um, also just a quick overview of, of drought over the past 10 years or so, and then trying to understand exactly how drought is influencing the different segments of the deer populations. So the, the adult females, the, the neonates, the, the fawns, bucks, and then also the vegetative component. Uh, and then lastly, finish up uh, with just basically where are we at currently in this drought and, and what are things looking like? And, and everything I'm gonna be talking about here is on a statewide level. Uh, the regional managers are going to give you a lot more detail about specific units, so I'm not going to touch on that a whole lot, but just give a broad overview of, of what things look like. So first, we'll, we'll start with the monitoring that we do. Um, this is a large-scale effort that we've really been doing since uh, 09. We started with VHF collars across the state, but then in 2014 is when we switched to, to our um, current efforts with GPS collars. So through this, uh, since 2014, we've captured more than 3,800 individual animals uh, in December and in March. Um, currently, we have almost 1,600 deer on air across the state. Most of those are does, uh, but then also we have over 200 uh, fawns across the state as well as 200 plus bucks. Um, so we have 30 management units throughout the state and we currently actually are monitoring animals on 26 of those units. So we've really uh, expanded these efforts uh, largely through the migration initiative. Uh, when we first started this process, we've just had seven core units uh, spread out across the state that represented the area. Uh, those were the Cache, South Slope, Oker Stansberry, um, Wasatch Manti, San Juan, Monroe, and then also in the Pine Valley. But with the, the the migration initiative, we've been able to get collars out largely on the adults, not as much of the fawns, but gives us an understanding of what's going on with the adult segment on those areas. And even though the primary purpose of that was to look at movements, uh, we're also able to get other metrics to understand uh, demographic information about those animals. So what do we do with all this data? Um, as I've mentioned first, the, the primary reason for doing this was to get survival. We initially uh, were using survival from other states and trying to use that to help understand what was going on in Utah. And we decided that wasn't good enough. We needed our own local information. And, and that really was a huge component to help understand whether these populations were growing, decreasing, uh, what were our population estimates. And the survival is crucial for that. Uh, we also, um, get body condition and we do this both in December which is primarily what we get but we also do it in March and so the December is a metric of how these animals are coming into winter are they in good shape uh, does it look like um, they'll have good survival over winter and March is a, is a measure of how they're coming out which um, as I'll go into more detail is a will they live the rest of the winter but then also how does that translate into uh, production of the herd uh, we get cause-specific mortality, so we understand uh, overall what, how many animals are dying and what is killing them, uh, so then we can direct management action to see uh, what that problem is. We did a lot of information on habitat use and movement patterns. These animals are all equipped with GPS collars that are taking 12 points a day uh, currently, so we get tons of information on how they're using the landscape, um, and we can identify migrations, uh, barriers to movement, as well as what habitat types they're using and, and, uh, and how we can better uh, manage habitats to, to help out the deer herds. Uh, we also kind of combine all that to identify the limiting factors of these populations, understand, again, where do we put the management? What is, why is this population not growing? What can we do from a management perspective to make it grow? Uh, and then lastly, what we've been starting to do with it is 
we can now look at where we're currently at from these data, what, where we're at with survival, what conditions do we have, and we can actually start projecting these populations forward with a lot more confidence and understand what things will be like six months in the future. Um, still, there's a lot of variation in that and a lot of uncertainty, so we're not always perfect, but we, we can take pretty good guesses at it at this point. So kind of transitioning over, uh, and just looking at where we've been in the drought with drought in the past 10 years. Um, so this graph shows uh, drought throughout Utah over the past 10 years from 20, January 2011 through the present. Um, yellow is dry, but, but the tans and oranges and reds, are, they indicate at least some level of drought with the deeper reds being the worst. Um, and, and what it shows is that, I mean, no surprise, Utah is a desert. It, more often than not, we are in drought. Uh, or some level of drought. And the severity just varies between years. I and mean, we had a pretty good drought in the early 2012 area, uh, but then what most of our data is gonna focus on is the drought that we had in 2018. Then also, if you look at the current levels that we're seeing, uh, we have, I mean, 60 plus percent of the state is listed as exceptional drought, which is an incredible number. Um, so this is one of the worst droughts we've had in quite some time. Uh, and the data, uh, we'll, I'll present data throughout here that just shows what is that doing to these animals. Um, so I'll start with, with where we have our most data and that's looking at the adult female segment of the population. And, and this is really what drives populations. So this is probably the most important data that we get. Um, to mention, uh, this graph here shows what our December body condition looks like from 2014 to the present. Uh, what you can see is uh, animals overall came in at about 8.8% uh, this past year, which certainly isn't good, um, but it's also not the worst we've ever seen. Uh, the worst we had was back in uh, December of 18, where animals were really poor. Um, and, um, yeah, so I guess the, the next question becomes, well, how, what does this condition actually mean? If we look at it compared with survival, which is this red line, um, we see a pretty strong relationship. It, it's in its simplest sense, the fatter animals come into winter, uh, the better they survive. Um, so whatever we can do to make uh, habitat better so these animals are coming in in the best shape possible, that's gonna be the best thing we can do for our deer herds. Um, another reason that condition is important is it actually influences what, what kills these animals. So the green here shows um, all the deer that we've captured over the years. It shows how much fat they typically have. Uh, and you see most of these animals come in with about 7.5% fat, and then it varies throughout. Some of them extremely fat, some of them extremely skinny. But what we see is that when we look at why these animals are dying, the animals that come in the skinniest in December are the ones most likely to die during that winter time period. And the reason they're dying largely is malnutrition. Um, and this, so the skinnier you are, the more likely you are to succumb to malnutrition over that winter. Similarly, when we look at those animals that are being killed by coyotes, uh, those are the skinnier, weaker animals that we catch. And this is just focusing on the adult population at this point. But it's actually really interesting when we look at specific units, the San Juan um, and the Book Cliffs, for example, when they were in uh, San Juan at the height of its uh, major drought in 2017-18, uh, we had twice as many adults being killed by coyotes than we had on the years uh, of non-drought. So it, it almost doubled their uh, susceptibility to coyote predation. And we saw a very similar result on the book cliffs uh, during the 18-19 winter. Um, so it, it can actually have an influence on the probability of survival um, through, through just different types of predation they're exposed to. Uh, and then just to finish this slide off, um, with lion predation, it doesn't seem to matter nearly as much. They're pretty much killing animals, whether they're skinny, whether they're healthy, in proportion to availability. Uh, and it doesn't seem to have much of a signature, uh, whether it's dry or whether it's wet. So moving on from the, the adult 
goes to uh, neonates, um, first thing I want to look at here is pregnancy rates. We often uh, have questions about, you know, it's so dry, are, are deer even getting pregnant? And the answer is typically yes. I, most of our uh, studies when we assess pregnancy in March, most of these animals are pregnant, typically 95, 98%, just depends on the year. Uh, this is in contrast to what we see in some other species, elk, moose, bison. Uh, we've seen pregnancy rates down in the 50, 60% in dry years. They, they certainly seem to behave a little differently than what we see in deer. Uh, for some recent data, we just actually caught deer only one unit this year, so we can't say a ton, but we did catch on the book cliffs. And even though it's extremely dry, 30 of the 31 individuals that we caught were pregnant. So it seems like pregnancy, at least in that area, is still really good. The one example where we may have actually seen uh, some effects of drought on deer pregnancy is on the San Juan. Um, we caught them in March of 18. They were in very poor condition and only 13 of 19 animals were pregnant. Uh, small sample size, a lot of variation around there. So we can't say for sure um, how, what the actual rate was and how much influence the drought had, but it, it is a potential, um, a potential thing uh, where we actually observed an influence of drought on deer pregnancy. Beyond pregnancy, uh, there does seem to be an influence of drought on twinning rates. Um, these data here in the orange are from the cache of our neonate study that we did the last three years, uh, and then two years from the book cliffs. And with the cache, the, a lot drier in um, 2019, we did see a, a dip in twinning rates by about 10% the previous year, and then we saw a giant spike up uh, by about 25%. And we saw that same pattern uh, on the book cliffs where it was drier in 19 and then in the wetter year, twinning rate um, increased quite a bit. So although it might not influence pregnancy, it, it does seem like it can influence the amount of fawns that are being born. Uh, and then one other area that we get a lot of questions on is, is you know, how about the timing of birth? When are these fawns being born? Um, and the answer on this is, is it, it may have an influence. We're still not quite sure. Uh, in 2018, fawns were born really early on the cache, um, but then it, it did actually show six days later was the mean in the drought when it was a lot drier in 2019. Um, however, on the book cliffs, we didn't see that pattern. We actually saw the reverse pattern where it was actually born earlier when it was drier um, than in 2020. So um, one thing we will do, we, we need a little more um, data on this and a little more analysis. Uh, one thing we can do now though is with the GPS data, we can actually look at, use the, the movement patterns of the does since we're taking enough points in, uh, in frequently enough to do so. We, we can uh, actually determine when that animal gave birth and if it gave birth based on its movement pattern. And so we can actually do this without having to catch the animals and, under, and uh, actually have a bit that tells us when they gave birth, we can do it just on the doe's GPS collar. And we can start looking at this on a statewide perspective uh, and see do, how much is the uh, birthing period change over time and is it influenced by the weather conditions. Um, one other thing I'd like to bring up here is we often hear um, statements like, well, their does are going through multiple estrus cycles or, or something like that could be happening because either there's not enough bucks to breed them or uh, maybe the, just the drought and dryness makes them uh, come into estrus a lot later. And through these studies, we just have zero evidence to support that. Everything has always had a, a singular peak of being born. Uh, and when the dates are shifted, it does seem to be you know, upwards of a week at tops uh, and most times less than that. Um, so getting into back into the how condition of the doe um, relates to neonate, well, it, it's actually one of the biggest driving factors. So what we're looking at here on the x-axis is the, the condition of the doe in March. So the fatter she is in March, um, the heavier they give birth to, um, they give birth to heavier fawns uh, or heavier neonates. Um, additionally, when you look at the growth of that neonate, the heavier that doe is in March, the better that animal is going to grow. Uh, and that, that whole um, 
positive influence carries through to March. Um, the fatter that doe is in March when it gave, uh, when we caught it, the, the heavier that fawn at this point in December is going to be. So what this all breaks down to is heavier does give birth to heavier neonites, which then grow better and become heavier fawns in December. And all this translates into higher survival uh, of those animals. Um, moving on to how they're influencing those fawns. And so uh, just as a reminder, this is the animals that we call it six months. We transition from a neonite to a fawn for our terminology, just to keep it straight, uh, at six months. And then we consider it a fawn until it reaches uh, 18 months of age. Overall, we can look at our fawn doe ratios uh, throughout the state. And, and some of this certainly picks up the influence of drought. You see the, the major drop in fawn production and fawn doe ratio in, in 2002. And then the last few years, we've certainly had uh, low production. And, and some of that is drought related. However, last year uh, wasn't really that dry and we still had low production. So it does seem like there's other factors influencing it, uh, potentially carryover effects from hard winters or from drought. Um, so it doesn't tell the whole story, uh, but it does give you an indication of, of potential factors at play with drought. Um, one way we can look at this is through some satellite imagery. Uh, it's, a, it's a measure of greenness and it does a really good job of picking up on drought. It, it, it's a, I won't go into the details, but it's called NDVI. Um, but it does show quite clearly that when you have low values of NDVI, which indicate drought, um, it does have a pretty negative effect on, um, on farm production uh, versus when you have more wet years, when you get higher values of NDVI, it, it will improve your production. So it, it does show pretty well that that's the case. Um, another uh, Thing that we look at is um, fawn weight in December. Uh, so when we catch these animals, we weigh each one of them and um, it shows pretty clearly that when we have our driest years, these fawn weights are down. Um, and overall, we have our second lowest weights this past, uh, that we've observed this past year, only lower was in 2018. And so what this means is, is basically heavier fawns live better. Um, these graphs here show each year that we've been measuring fawns and there, every year there's a relationship um, indicating light fawns uh, when the probability of survival versus uh, heavy fawns. And it's as simple as that. The heavier we can get those fawns, the, the better they're gonna survive. And that does translate back into the doe as well. Uh, Moving on to bucks, we don't have a ton of data on bucks, so we can't say as much. We, we do assume that a lot of what we see with the does in terms of uh, how drought affects their survival will apply to bucks, but we just don't have a whole lot of data to say it. Um, one thing we can say is drought certainly affects the amount of antler growth, uh, and it affects it in two ways. First, if we look at this black line, um, that's the influence of when that fawn is in utero before it's even born, if that doe's not in good shape, the the potential of that buck is reduced. Um, so even if you have optimal conditions where it can grow antlers, if it was born in a period that was really dry, its its maximum potential will never be re never be reached. Um, that said, the larger driving factor is actually the the condition of that animal or the growing conditions for antlers during the year. So if it has good spring moisture uh, and it can put on fat and grow, um, it's gonna make a huge difference in its antler size versus if it's having to grow antlers under dry air. It just won't put those energy resources into antler growth, which is a, a secondary trait instead of its primary trait of just putting on fat and growing. Uh, then lastly here, in terms of impact of drought, um, we'll look at the impacts on vegetation. Um, drought has a huge impact on the vegetation, uh, on nutritional quality and the amount of growth it has. This graph again goes back to that NDVI metric and it just shows what the growing season looks like in a wet year, which is the green line versus a, a yellow 
average year or a, a red drought year. Um, when we have drought years, the, the amount of growth that this vegetation is putting on and the, and the amount of time it takes to do it is much less and much shorter than if we have a wet uh, spring where it, it, it can be really elongated. So these animals just don't have time to get optimal nutrition out of the forage and they just can't um, utilize, utilize it as much as they could in a, in a good year. Uh, you know, kind of looking at that same graph, but in terms of uh, nutritional quality of these plants, you see the, the black line here shows uh, how grass grows in, the, in June and how it puts off great growth and great nutritional value and it spikes really quickly. Um, but then it also goes down very quickly over the summer months. In a drought year, this is definitely going to be reduced. Um, when we get, if it, if it, if it really dry you just don't get much value out of these grasses um, come fall and, and definitely into winter. Uh, shrubs although more impacted or um, still impacted by drought are much more consistent. They're not going to grow as much. You do maintain a lot of nutritional quality to rely on over those winter months. Um, so that, that kind of just demonstrates the importance of these shrubs uh, during drought and there's during winter as a whole. But unfortunately, when we do look at some of this, we actually can get such severe droughts that it causes these vegetative die-offs. Um, these pictures here from a range trend study down on Black Mesa on the San Juan, uh, just shows pretty good sagebrush throughout this site uh, come 2009, but that drought in 2017, 18 down there, uh, we had a large scale sagebrush die-off um, which undoubtedly will impact the winter range of these animals. Uh, so this is where we have to rely on our WRI treatments and our, our hopefully we can restore this vegetation and get some brush back uh, so that we're not relying on just a grass and forb ecosystem. So I, that was kind of a lot of information and, and I hope I didn't overwhelm anybody, but um, I just wanted to end with where we currently are with deer in the state and, and how the droughts affect them. If you look at the current drought monitor map, it looks horrible. Um, we have some, uh, as I said, 60, 50, 60% 60 of the state is in exceptional or, or drought. Uh, we're up to upwards of 80% plus in extreme or exceptional. Uh, and virtually everything was considered in drought until recently where a, a small corner just came out up in Rich County. So it, it is pretty bad. Um, and we look at, at fawn survival the, over the years here, the, the fuchsia line is current year and you can see that it's certainly tracking um, the survival that we've seen in the other two drought years uh, in 1617 as well as 1819. Um, hopefully, since we've had a pretty light winter, we'll start seeing that level off and, and stay uh, up towards the 16 line rather than the 18 line, but, but ultimately time will tell. However, interestingly enough, um, with adult survival, things are, are much better than we would have initially expected. Uh, our survival's tracking what we typically see in good years and, and we're actually staying quite a bit above um, what we've seen in previous drought years. Uh, right now we're running statewide survival rate around 95%, which is pretty good, uh, especially given that, that the winter is essentially over uh, for most of these animals. So as I mentioned overall, uh, I guess we went into December expecting uh, pretty much disaster. We, we thought we would see bad condition across the state. However, we were, we were pleasantly surprised. Some animals, we certainly saw it in some places, uh, but some places we actually did, we, we, we had a lot of fat on these animals and they did pretty well. Um, so it got us to thinking as to why things weren't worse. Uh, one big reason was, was potentially drought timing. Uh, when we saw the effects of that 2018 drought, it was more of a spring drought. Um, so those animals never had good moisture in the spring to, to grow good vegetation. Um, however, this one, it, we actually had decent snowpack last year, good spring moisture, uh, and the drought really didn't start until summer. It was extremely dry, but it, it seems like maybe um, they already got some pretty good nutrition out of, out of the vegetation that was there before things got horrible. Uh, we also saw a pretty good acorn crop, um, which 
when you look at some of the literature, it's not really influenced by current year drought. It's influenced by last year's conditions more. And it seemed like over across the state, acorns were, were plentiful and that could have helped the animals. Um, thirdly, we, we had a pretty mild winter. We still had a decent amount of moisture. It, it definitely is dry, but we had 80% of snowpack in a lot of places. So we're, we're pretty good there. Versus in 18, we had horrible winters up in North. So those animals came in in poor shape and then they got hammered with a really hard snowpack. Um, and that, that just, that caused survival to be pretty poor. Uh, and then lastly, we do have lower deer densities right now. So if density dependence was an issue in some of these areas that, that may have been relieved and, and animals weren't competing with each other as much. So, um, but that said, Certainly, we still have several units across the state that are really struggling, uh, largely due to these drought conditions. And, and I'll, I'm sure you'll hear more about those as uh, the managers give their updates. Um, so with that, uh, I will end it. And um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Kat. That was very informational. Board, you have any questions for Kent? This is Randy. I've got I've got a question. <clears throat> Just make sure I understand what you said, Kent. Uh, our, our relationship between the the health of the um, of of the doe at at the time of the neonate is born is a relationship with the neonate basically throughout its life. And the um, the healthier that neonate is, the uh, basically down the road the the bigger its antlers are going to grow. And so in three or four years down the road, he's, he's liable to be a little bit bigger, stronger uh, uh, looking buck, I guess, health wise than one in a, that was born in a, in a weaker state. Is that, is that right? That is correct. Yeah. It, it, it's just, you, you, and you say, if you think about it with humans, you know, when, when uh, you know, your, your own prenatal vitamins, they want to get that, Feed is optimal nutrition and optimal everything. And if you're in a, a, a strong drought environment, they're clearly not getting that. And that just stunts your potential for your whole life that you can never get back. <laughs> so optimal buck hunting will be wait for a good wet year where those does are in good shape and then give it four or five years and uh, things will be prime. <laughs> Especially if it's a wet year in four or five years. <laughs> Thank, thank you. I, I, I thought that's what I heard. I want to make sure. Thank you. Yep. Byron, this is Carl. I've got a question. Yes, sir. Can I, I the, the two questions that we get asked are, do we have enough bucks to breed the does? And I think you answered that. The other question we get is that if we had bigger bucks, they would breed at a different time and the fawns would survive better. I, I don't know if we have that. I guess that would be a comparison of a limited entry unit versus our general season units where we generally have larger bucks. Is the, is the breeding and the fawn drop different on our limited entry versus our general season units? Okay, so we've, when we do these bit studies, um, vaginal implant transmitter, and it tells us exactly when these birds are occurring. Uh, we've, we've done them on the Monroe as a, a low, uh, buck doe ratio, they were down, I believe, at 11 or 12 when we started it. We've done it on the cash uh, when they were running about 15 to 17. And then we've done it on the book cliffs when they're running 30 to 35. And we just don't see a difference. Um, we've also done comparisons to some uh, places in Colorado where they were running upper 20s buck doe ratio. Uh, and no difference uh, between the two. If anything, the data actually would show that the Colorado had a more drawn out uh, fawning period than what we saw in the Monroe when they were down really low. So um, it it doesn't seem to matter uh, whether they're running high buck doe ratio or low, as long as you're above that minimum threshold of around eight or so, it seems like everything's getting bred in a very short period of time and um, they're being born in a relatively synchronous period. Thank you. Kent, do you think we could add to that that possibly if there is any asynchrony in birth period, it's it's more related to the body condition of that doe than it would be to the number of bucks in the landscape? It's something we can certainly 
continue to look at over time. I don't know if we can say that at this point, um, but it's certainly worth noting that it, it's possible. And we certainly saw, I guess, an interesting thing, this is we're going to elk again, but we had a, in the drought year on the book cliffs where we had very low pregnancy, it was a very uh, drawn out calving period for those elk. Last year, things got a lot better uh, condition wise and pregnancy wise, and we had a more succinct calving period. So it, we see it in other species where condition does influence it. We haven't really seen it in deer, but it's possible. Mr. Chair, this is Justin. Can I speak uh, to Carl's question as well? Yes, Justin. Um, earlier, Carl asked Kobe a question. He, he talked about how, how do we grow deer, and Kobe talked about how cutting permits, um, it, it's a lot more complicated than that. One thing that I would like to, to point out is um, at, the, at a really basic level, when it comes to deer management, you have top-down pressures is what the literature calls it. And that's where predators are suppressing deer populations. And then the other factor, again, this is overly simplistic, but it's a it's it's something called bottom-up pressures, which is essentially you don't have the vegetation or the nutrients on the landscape to, to support the deer you have or to grow more deer. And in Ken's presentation, drought really impacts both of those things. Um, it, there, there's a relationship between drought and predation, and there's a relationship between drought and adequate nutrition. And when we were doing research on Antelope Island years ago, looking at coyote diets and what they ate in, in relation to what was available. During the wet years, like 2006, coyotes never touched deer because they had rodents running around like crazy. And um, they would just, you looked at, at the contents of their diet, it was all deer mice and voles and kangaroo uh, rats and things like that. Um, but they, they weren't going to go chase deer because they had biomass running around everywhere. But then a year later in the drought year, we, we trapped 10% of the rodents that we trapped previous during the wet years. And then the impacts of coyote predation on deer really increased. And they, they were taking several, a lot more fawns and different things like that. And also during these drought years, you have less hiding cover. Um, fawns are hiders. As soon as they're born, they hit the ground, they go look for vegetation to stay in. There's just not as much cover on the landscape. And so, you know, Ken's presentation is, I think he did a fantastic job talking about nutrition and all the things that go into that. And it also spills over into other portions of deer management. And Wade mentioned it earlier that this is complex. And, and the more you dig into it and the more you learn, um, you realize how there's all these unintended consequences associated with drought and um, Ken, I just want to say great job on that presentation. And Carl, I, I also just wanted to provide a little more context that at a basic level, deer are suppressed either from predators driving them down or just not enough nutrients um, to allow them to grow more, which is why our WRI projects and our predator control measures are, are just so vital. So. Justin? To add to that, uh, coyote predation seems to be the number one cause of you know, loss of fawns. I mean, and the question is, are we doing enough to remove coyotes from the landscape? You know, but I think I think Darren's got a presentation on our predator control measures, and, and maybe we could say that to the end. But I would say this: we're we're pretty aggressive compared to a lot of Western states. Um, we, we really are in our relationship with wildlife services and the bounty program and a lot of the things that we do in Utah to target um, coyotes is, is um, certainly aggressive when you look at others. Um, but with that said, I think if we can improve, we should. Bye, Rick. Can, Go ahead, can Wade. I make a quick statement? This is Wade. I, I recognize we're talking about wildlife but uh there's certainly a lot of crossover between wildlife and livestock and and to carl's question uh or point you know i <clears throat> certainly age is a factor on stuff like this but i know with uh with cattle uh the, the really the key factor is um just nutrients just absolute nutrients you can a calf born late that has got an enormous amount to eat is always going to outproduce a calf that is older that doesn't have as much to eat 
and certainly, ideally, you have an old calf that has a lot to eat, and, and an older calf, and certainly that's gonna, uh, you, you're gonna have a, you know, a bigger calf when you go into the winter. But you know, if you could only pick one, I would certainly say it's got to be nutrients, which really just boils back to habitat. So if we can, if we can have something for these does and fawns to eat uh, during the summer, that's really, to me, that's really key, not necessarily when they're born. Thanks, Wade. I just want to recognize Brett Selman just showed up. Brett? Yeah, I, I've been on for a while, but um, I just had a comment, too. Uh, and I've told this story before, so if I'm redundant, then forgive me. But uh, one summer in Wyoming, we had two herds of sheep across the river from each other on com comparable sheep, comparable feed. The one herd was depredated heavily by wolves for quite a while that summer. And uh, when we shipped the lambs within days of each other, the herd that had been depredated heavily by wolves was nine pounds lighter than the, than the other herd. So the lambs were basically 10% lighter from that herd that had been uh, harassed in the summer on the same exact feed. So my take-home point is that when these predators are are harassing these summering uh, ungulates, then they don't, they don't, they're not able to uh, build the body condition that they could if they were unharassed. They, they displace them to, to porter vegetative types and they, and they're stressed. They're all the time stressed by the worry of these predators. So, so that's a factor too, I think on this, on this body score of these females and and the fawns um, to be able to come into winter heavy and fat. So, um, Brad, I, I want to add to that. I, I do think that uh, um, Kent's um, presentation was awesome. I appreciate it. A lot of energy went into to, uh, showing us the drought and, and everything that's going on. And, one of the huge concerns I have is is looking at the drought index that we have right now compared to even like 18. That that's real eye opener, and hopefully we get some spring rains and maybe the timing that you talked about will will be really beneficial. But one of the things that I'm concerned about is with with that drought, just like Brett talked about, those lamb weights is um, energy expenditure. Um, if you'll Give me just a minute. I growing up on a small ranch, um, when we would have um, cattle or cows get out, we we would go fix a fence. We'd solve the problems. When we had predators get the calves, we would we would solve that problem. When when all the cows weren't bred, you'd get a new bull. And so you were always trying to to find that solution. The hardest part for me is to see that there's more en energy expenditure um, than than just predators. We, we as humans got to realize that we too can cause a um, mule deer to, to um, expend energy with, with the pandemic. There's more people in the outdoors than there ever has been. Increase in UTVs, ATVs, increase in shed hunters, pushing deer, um, less feeding time for those animals. And, and just like I give that example, that's really hard for me to sit by and know that we're, we're asking our animals to be in poorer shape than they've ever been, but to expend more energy possibly than they ever have. And so from that mentality as a, as a rancher, when there's a problem, you try to go fix it. The hardest part for me is to sit aside and just say, hey, man, I, I hope for rain, but not do anything. Um, logically, I, I want to say, man, can is there any way we can reduce energy spent on those animals? What, what are those solutions we can do? And I know it's not this year because we're in March, but if this drought continues next year, what are those things that we can do to reduce energy expenditure? Maybe a little bit of it's in predators, but I, I really think that uh, we ought to look at what things we can make sure those animals are in better shape if this drought continues. Thanks, Kevin. Wade, did you have something you wanted to? No, sir. Byron, I've got a, I've got another question. Okay. 
Um, I like the comparison of livestock on this, and and I am I am not a rancher, and I'm really a lousy farmer. So um, I'm asking a question: if if the range is bad, as as a rancher, are you going to decrease the number of animals on the on the the range or increase? And and the reason I ask that is is I mean, we're, we're in a drought condition and, and I believe we're going to recommend killing fewer bucks. Is, is that exactly opposite of what you would do as a rancher? Did I lose you? Hey, waiter. Sorry, do you want to answer that just to uh, respond? Off? No, Carl, I, I think, uh, no, I, I think where you're headed is exactly right. I mean, our family just sold 30% of our mother cows uh, five months ago, which is obviously devastating to an operation, but we didn't have a choice because we didn't have the habitat. Um, <clears throat> and so certainly when, when the habitat and the drought conditions persist and require it, you have to reduce numbers. <clears throat> There's no question about it. Um, but <clears throat> I think with our current deer situation, it's a little different to me, the way I'm looking at it and some of the units down here. And the reason why is because the deer took such a hit 18 months ago. Nature already limited uh, those numbers. Nature already removed that 30% uh, 18 months ago and so now when you when you get into another drought or that drought continues to persist you don't have to coal like you would have you know if if uh if we had had this situation down here in, in 30 18 months ago we had reduced 30 percent of our cattle herd we probably wouldn't have done it this past fall so to me i think that that's kind of the way i'm looking at it why there's a little difference no, I appreciate I, I appreciate that it, and it and 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 I'm not going to recommend raising tags, but I I just it just seems from a business side that would be what you would do. But timing is a big issue. Another another thing, Carl. Can I speak, Byron? This bread. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Brett. Another thing, Carl, is one thing we can do with the livestock that's not quite as handy with the wildlife is we can supplement them. We've been supplementing our sheep all winter, something that we've never done before. And uh, we're still continuing to do that, to, to hold that that flesh on them, to hold that body score on them so they can have a healthy lamb. So it's been expensive and, uh, and it's been time consuming, but it's something that we can do is we can supplement them. And that's a lot harder to do with um, wildlife. No, I, you know, I, both you, I really appreciate that input. That's answered a lot of questions for me. Thank you. You know, Carl, I think too is, you know, certainly from our standpoint, our family ranch, uh, we're, as soon as we got rid of those 30%, we're automatically in rebuild mode. And the intent is that we're trying to be optimistic that uh, things are going to improve. So we're automatically in rebuild mode. We're trying, we're going to start keeping replacement heifers. We're going to try to replace that 30% as quick as we can. And so I, I kind of feel like, you know, with the wildlife, nature took that 30 or 40 or 70% in some cases. And, and to me, we're kind of in rebuild mode right now. Yeah, yeah I was going to add to that, way too, that when, when you sent that 30% uh, off, my guess would be that you went through that herd and it was those older animals that, that you sent off. It was, you keep those younger replacements, those ones that are going to be able to, to breed the best. And it's, it's not that you would pick like in mule deer, you wouldn't send those 30% off wouldn't all be bulls. They're, they're going to be those mother cows that are of, of the older that you, um, that you replace. And so um, I just think that's important to, to keep that in mind also. Byron, can I can I say something here? Is that okay? Go ahead, Cody. I I think though, as I watch the board talk back and forth and struggle through this conversation, this is exactly what the agency struggles with. You know, um, do we have the appropriate number? If we come in skinny again, what should we look at? And we continue to monitor this, 
and and luckily Wade pointed out deer do self-regulate, right? Um, if if they're in too poor a condition, they just won't make it through. Fawns won't survive, and wildlife has the ability to self-regulate a little bit. Um, but you know, it's it's always the question of if you have the right at, right amount of animals on the landscape, can you increase productivity? Uh, we know we can. You know, there's there's data in wildlife management for over 100 years that says that if you're below carrying capacity, right, below what you can handle on the landscape, you'll increase fat and you'll increase productivity. You'll increase your twinning rates, you'll increase your survival rates, you'll increase all of that. And what we're hoping for is for that, that Mother Nature knocked us back and we're hoping for climatic, climatic events that then will allow us to grow again. We know we can handle more deer on the landscape than what we currently have. We know we can. As recently as four or five years ago, we had a lot more deer. Um, and, but it's a, it's a question that wildlife biologists struggle with every day. Where do we want to be coming into this with all these other factors? And how do we best regulate to have productive herds that are healthier moving forward? That is wildlife management. And it's very similar to ranching in a lot of aspects. Uh, just we can't control as much. There's there's less in our, in our control. Thanks, Coley. Big camp. One one thing that I'd be really interested. I I really like the data that shows that that doe that's healthier and heavier weight that she has a a fawn um, a buck fawn that uh, later goes on and and has bigger antlers four or five years down the road. I'd be really interested in seeing on that collar data that you have on those if how many of those does that were heavier weight come from an area that had like a burn where you changed the um, so it had more years of good vegetation. It wasn't only drought related. I'd be interested to see if if that that uh, or that what was on later went on to have really good n nutrition those four or five years down the road as well. It'd be interesting. Yeah, that's a good point, Kevin. That is something we're actually in the works on now, looking at basically the animals that use those treatment areas, uh, whether it be through mechanical treatments or through through burns. Uh, how does that relate to their condition? Uh, we got a couple projects starting up on that and uh, hopefully some of the stuff I've been working on the last few years will come to fruition here eventually. Um, but absolutely, understanding exactly how these increased uh, treatment areas influence animals and, and translate that back into survival and production. Awesome, awesome. So, so with that work you're talking about, are we gonna have to start calling you doctor? <laughs> no, <Okay>. never. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting behind on our schedule. Are there any other questions for Kent? Uh, we can do that in our question and answers period later on at the end of this uh, discussion. If not, uh, we'll go to Jim Christensen, the unit by unit updates, herd health, population trends, survival rates, population dynamics, permit recommendations, and addressing limiting factors. Makes it simple for you, Jim. I just a lot of items there, so go ahead and start. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for as good a job as Kobe and Kent did. Uh, I could let them do mine as well. Okay, let's see. I apologize, I must have clicked on the wrong button. And we will have biologists from all these different regions can answer questions in addition to uh, Jim's presentation. Okay. Uh, so for the northern region, I, I appreciate this opportunity to be able to, to go over our different units. I just recently met with a university class over at Utah State last week and, and talked to them about how at the, the beginning of my career, I never really looked forward to these opportunities. But at this point, 
I I look look forward to these chances to to educate on on what is happening with our wildlife resources. Um, I I have kind of simplified my my presentation. I will I will go through unit by unit. Uh, a lot of the like limiting factors are going to be the same, the same across the units. Um, I, I do have some other, some other visual um, graphical representations of, of what's going on with our population sizes and survival and, and buck to doe. Um, so at, at the end during the question period, if you'd like to see those, I um, I'd be more than happy to to show them. I'm more of a visual learner. I I like those a little better, but I, I've tried to to keep this as concise as possible because there is a lot to, to go through. With the box elder unit, uh, we have a population objective of 20,000 on that unit. Currently, we are down around 10,000. Uh, over the last 10 years, we have been trending down. Part of that is uh, drought related. Again, I will be, be addressing that in, in the limiting factors. Um, but it's no surprise to, to anyone that uh, populations are trending down. Um, talk about population in context of antlerless harvest. Um, out in the Box Elder District, the, the only antlerless harvest that we do have is to address depredation concerns in, in agricultural situations. And, and even with that, uh, on average, we're only around 175 does harvested per year across the unit. For, for buck to doe, or excuse me, buck hunting, uh, we, for this year, we are going, going to recommend maintaining our buck permits at 3,700, uh, similar to where we were last year. And there's several reasons for this. If you remember last year, uh, Kobe presented with, with our recommendations a projection sheet where we can input the different data that we look into when coming up with, with these hunt permit recommendations. Uh, and so as, as we put in our, our buck to doe ratios over the last 10 years, we have seen a, a long-term decline in, in those ratios. But the last three years or two years anyway, we've seen a, an increase getting us back in. We are currently at objective right now. Um, our our three-year average is, is almost 16 bucks per 100 does this year where we are trending up. Uh, we feel like maintaining those permits will keep that trend going up. And also going into that and going into the projection sheet, we had a really good fawn crop this year. We, we had 74 fawns per 100 does that, that we saw postseason. Uh, on average, over these last 10 or so years, we've been down around 61 fawns per 100 does. And so with that increased fawn crop, uh, and then also this year, our survival, as, as you saw in Kent's um, drought index map, the northern region has been sitting better than the rest of the state with, with our drought conditions. And so we, we actually have really good adult fawn or adult doe survival as well as fawn survival. Our adults this year on the box elder unit are sitting around 90% survival. Our fawns are at 68%. So adding all that data into our projection sheet, we, we anticipate that we will end the, the 2021 hunt season uh, at 18 bucks per 100 does on a one year buck to doe ratio. Um, and that, that will be with, with average harvest. And average harvest would for, for the box elder unit would be right around 30% uh, harvest on the buck hunt. So limiting factors in, in box elder unit. And again, these are, are largely gonna be similar across every unit in the Northern region. Uh, so I'll, I'll go a little more in depth with this one um, and then just just pick some significant outliers in, in the other units. So we are a, a summer limited population out in the Box Elder District. 
uh, it gets really hot, really dry. We have ample winter range out in the, the western part of the, the county, uh, not as much in the eastern part of the county. Uh, what's happened with the extended summer drought, vegetation dries out sooner. Uh, we've been getting some, some significant fires out in the winter range, uh, which is helping to, to change uh, habitat type. We're seeing an increase in the cheatgrass out in, in that part of the, the state. And with the increases of cheatgrass, we get increasing fire potential. Um, and so as, as we change that habitat type, it, uh, as has been mentioned previously today, uh, it increases our, our body conditions on our, on our adults and our fawns. So with that, when we do get any kind of winter conditions, uh, when we have lower IFBF levels, we have decreased survival. Um, we did end up feeding in this unit back in 2017. Um, and so that is a possibility. We do go through, as Kobe mentioned, we, we monitor those conditions very closely for every one of our units up in the Northern region because winter is, is a main factor in, in our population sizes uh, of our deer. Other limiting factors, uh, predation. As, as we have seen again already today, uh, we, we have predation on mainly our, on our fawns. Uh, our, our fawn mortality, uh, as we go in and check those collars out, we have quite a few of those that are due to predation. And, and it's kind of an equal mix between cougars, uh, coyotes, and bobcats. Uh, and then with deer, it, it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts. There, there's several other limiting factors that, that add to the mortality uh, of deer. This increases highways, um, disease, fences, and um, we also have illegal kills that, that could go into those other factors. So what are we doing about it? Uh, out in the, the Box Elder District, we have been fortunate enough to, to be doing a lot of habitat work out there over the last, since, since um, 2010. Uh, I, I know we're gonna have a, a, a presentation on WRI projects, but I just went into the Watershed Restoration Initiative website to, to actually look at what has been happening out there. So we've completed 77 projects on over 90,000 acres out there. And that includes 100, over 140 miles of stream. Uh, that on a summer limited population, it's the water factor. And so as we can improve the stream miles and we can improve the vegetation around those streams, uh, that results in better vegetation and healthier deer. So a lot of those projects, they've been in conjunction with our federal partners as well as private landowners. Um, we have, we feel like we have some great relationships with, with our partners and we're excited about the work that has been able to happen out there. Uh, to address the, the highway mortality, uh, we've had highway fencing installed on I-15 and I-84. We've done other water development projects, including guzzlers and pipelines. And then we've been going more, more natural and doing, uh, we've released beavers out in the area and we've been able to install over a hundred beaver dam analogs, like what you can see in the picture, which just mimics a beaver dam and, and allows the, the moisture to increase into the soil and, and improve the vegetation on the on the edges of those riparian areas. To address the predator removal, uh, last winter, so winter of 2019-2020, we had an increase of our our cougar harvest out on the Box Elder Desert unit, uh, and so we've been able to to meet that objective that last year and again this year. And with the, the three different cougar units combined, 
uh, with the desert, the Raft River, and the Pilot Mountain unit. Uh, we're up to 23 cougars removed this this hunting season by sportsmen, and there have also been additional cougars harvested through depredation situations to uh, privately owned livestock. Uh, part of the box elder unit is also in a coyote removal priority area. Uh, where we can go in with wildlife services or with private contractors to remove coyotes off spawning grounds. Another big aspect of, of helping deer out in the box elder unit is the CWMU program. Out there, um, we have, let's see, we have 28 CWMUs. Uh, if it weren't for these CWMUs providing an incentive for private landowners, we would see much higher levels of, of antlerless harvest take in these depredation situations. And so as, as, as we can incentivize landowners to have deer on their property, uh, we can have an overall higher population. Uh, and so the, the CWMU program ha has been great uh, we, we have great partners with those private landowners. Uh, we work closely with them to, to help the deer populations. And then again, as, as was mentioned earlier, GPS collar work uh, in the winter of 2019, 2020, we started uh, applying more collars in the Box Elder District. We did it again this year. It, it's helping with our survival estimates uh, as well as migrations and cause specific mortality. On the cache, uh, similar to the box elder, the 10 year population is trending down on the cache, uh, but it, it has been a little more stable. It has not fluctuated as much as the box elder unit. Our objective over there is 25,000 total deer currently sitting just over 14,000. And again, uh, we only have antlerless harvest in depredation situations. And that one is, is right there again, similar to box elder around 180 to 185 antlers deer harvested uh, per year. The cash unit buck permits, we're recommending to stay the same at 5,000 permits this year. And again, the, seeing a long-term decline in the buck to doe ratios, but a, uh, short-term increase over the last couple of years. Again, really good uh, fawn production this year on the cash um, at 67 fawns per 100 does. And then our survival is even better than, than what Box Elder's doing. We're sitting at a 95% adult doe survival and 79% fawn survival. So, so with that good survival, the increased fawn production, uh, as we put that into our projection sheet, we, we project to end 2021 at 19 bucks per hundred does and continue to get us up towards the upper end of our three year, year buck to doe ratio uh, to, to carry us through and, and maintain our, our population there at objective. Many factors. Again, uh, can't stress enough the the importance of of um, the the drought and the important the importance of moisture. The one good thing with with the cash unit is we have a lot of summer range uh, where where the deer can go uh, that gets plenty of moisture throughout the winter time, which results in higher fat levels. Um, if you're able to go through and look at the percent fat levels from across the state, you can notice that the, the cash unit is always higher than, than anywhere else in the state. We have the potential to grow really fat deer on, on the cash, and we have the potential to also increase populations really quickly. Um, the, the year after we fed deer, which was in 2017, uh, we had all that moisture. We we were able to to increase and grow upwards of uh, 4,000 deer in one year, 
And so this year, I anticipate the same on the cash unit that we should increase population significantly as long as the, the survival rates continue to hold out like they are. Um, with, with the cash unit, we are seeing some impacts due to urban sprawl. Um, these are mainly uh, on the Box Elder County side of the cash unit um, along Highway 38, as well as um, over in the Cache Valley itself on the northern end towards the Idaho border, up around Smithfield, Richmond, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of uh, development that, that's going up the foothills, increasing onto traditional winter ranges, uh, where when we do get those deep snow years, the deer need to push down lower. Uh, we are now getting more and more homes in those areas. Um, and so that that is an area of concern for us. Also on the cache, uh, significant amount of predation on our fawns and as well as some of our does over there um, and then our highway mortality disease and fences. Currently uh, since 2010 we've been able to complete 50 projects on the cash unit on over 30,000 acres. Uh, the picture uh, that's shown is of the Red Rider project that happens in the the higher elevations in, in coordination with the Forest Service. This has been an ongoing this is project. It's been a great project to improve those summer ranges to enable those deer to, to grow that fat as, as much as possible. Uh, we've done the highway fencing along I-15 uh, over there in conjunction with the Box Elder District uh, from the Idaho line um, south. Um, and then we've also got the, the highway fence in Sardine Canyon where we've been able to complete some underpass improvements. Uh, had water development projects. We put some guzzlers on some of our WMAs, our wildlife management areas, as well as some pipelines across the forest and some private landowners. For, for predation, uh, we are under currently under the predator management plan. So it is... There, there's no objective for the number of cougars harvested on the unit. Currently to date, the sportsmen have, have removed 34 cougars in, in the cache district. And again, we've also had some, some depredation issues with privately owned livestock where some additional cougars have been removed uh, due to those predation events. Um, the cache unit is also our other priority removal districts where we target coyotes on on fawning grounds and, and removing those so we can improve the, the survival as much as possible. Uh, this is one of those areas where we have had VHF and GPS callers for a long time, been one of our reference units, so we can get better survival numbers and estimates so that we can keep better track over there, uh, been part of the newborn fawn survival study, uh, helping us learn of the, the cause specific mortalities of those fawns and, and to learn that uh, from birth until December, we, we lose approximately half of our fawns year in and year out due to a variety of factors. And that includes predation, it includes starvation and abandonment, uh, as well as uh, Fallen in badger holes. Uh, again, that death by a thousand cuts. Uh, also on the cash unit, we've had a conservation e conservation easement secured on 8,500 acres. Ogden unit is one of our su surprise units population wise, as it has been trending upwards over the last 10 years. Uh, has not been a, a very significant in increase, but it, it's been an increase nevertheless. Uh, we have an objective of 11,000. Currently, we are at 8,600 deer. Um, the, the, the increase has not happened every single year. Over that time, we have seen decreases these last couple of years, and so that's why we are below objective. Um, but, but that long-term trend, we are, we are trending upwards towards objective. 
Uh, and again, antlerless harvest is only for depredation concerns. And, and this one is only about 40 does per year. For bucks, we're recommend, recommending a, a permit increase on this unit by 200 permits. Uh, our, our buck to doe ratios are increasing both long-term and short-term on this unit. And as you can see, the, the fawn, fawn to doe ratio was extremely good again this, this last year. And we're seeing that extremely good fawn survival this winter. Uh, so with that, uh, our projection for this year, we should end up right at the top end of our objective at, at 20 bucks per 100 does. Uh, besides habitat and, and drought related conditions for limiting factors, we're, we're seeing more urban sprawl on, on this district. Uh, up in the, the Ogden Valley, as well as along the Wasatch Front, from Brigham City through North Ogden um, and, and Ogden itself, uh, more and more development creeping up to the hillside. Uh, taking out those those critical winter ranges that that we need we we need them on on the deepest snow years. Um, those, those are the times where those locations uh, we we see the impact the most. Uh, and then predation and highway mortality. We see a significant amount of highway mortality along Highway 89 through the Perry area uh, and some. We had some increased agricultural depredation concerns through there, uh, where the, the majority of our um, agricultural take happens. So currently, uh, we we've completed 14 projects on 1,200 acres and 23 st stream miles. Uh, the underpass improvements through Sardine Canyon uh, connect the cache and and the Ogden unit. Uh, so, so we can have some migrations between those two units. We are also under predator management plan for cougars uh, in, in the Ogden unit. And so, so far, uh, sportsmen have removed 22 and additional depredation removals as well to go on top of that. The GPS collars and newborn fawn survival studies have have occurred on the Ogden unit as well, since we have collared a lot of our cash deer up at Hardware Ranch. And so as we go and, and catch deer down like Ant Flat Road, that's the dividing line between the cash and the Ogden units. And so we've been able to, to use a lot of the survival data and the cost specific mortalities on, on the Ogden unit as well. There's been a conservation easement of, Long Blackson Fork Canyon for 5,600 acres, and the Middle Fork Wildlife Management Area had an additional 2,000 acres added to it during that since 2010. Um, on on our WMAs, we've been able to partner with sportsmen's groups over there to to do some shrub plantings on both the Middle Fork and the Brigham Face WMAs. Uh, our habitat crew has been super busy on, on all of our units, uh, running a, a, a dozer with a scalper on it and reseeding on all these units. Uh, the challenge that's related with, with the, the drought concerns is we put all these hundreds of miles of, of seeded rows in. And if, if we cannot get the moisture to help those plants grow, uh, then, then we, we just don't have that vegetation for the deer. And so hopefully, you know, as we put all the seed in the ground, it, it can sit there dormant until we get all the appropriate conditions. And then uh, we'll be set up to, to have that vegetation grow and again, help our, our populations grow as well. As Kobe mentioned, we are set up to grow deer really quickly when we get those those environmental conditions to allow it. Um, and again, we have several CWMUs that, that we're working with to, to manage these populations. 
Morgan South Ridge. Uh, this is a unit where the five of the, the last 10 years, we saw a tremendous increase in population, which led us to some, some density concerns to where we, we reached about 18,000 or, or we, we just recently adjusted our population objective or, or the, the wildlife board uh, approved an adjustment to that objective. We, we used to be at 18,000, we're now down to 16,000. Uh, what we saw with that, that increase in populations up to 18,000 is we have been decreasing just as fast since that time. Uh, and so that, that was an area of concern for us, which is, which is why we recommended a decrease in the objective. So currently we're at 10,000 deer and only issuing antlerless harvest to address depredation concerns. Uh, buck permit wise, uh, this unit is combined with the East Canyon and Chalk Creek units with our, our buck permits and our hunting opportunities. Uh, and so we're recommending all three of those combined stay at 8,100 8, uh, buck permits. There have been long-term and short-term term declines in the buck to doe ratios. And this is because these three units are consistently high on the buck to doe ratios due to the amount of private lands in them. This Morgan South Rich unit is 85% privately owned. Um, and then uh, with that, um, private landowners can, can pick and choose how, how many deer they want to see harvested off their, their property. Um, so again, we're, we're consistently high uh, on, on this unit. Uh, our, our population, or our survivals, excuse me, our survival is, is right there with the cash unit of 95% adult survival, 79% fawn survival. Um, and our three year buck to doe ratio is at 30 bucks per 100 does. So with our objective of 18 to 20, Again, we're, we're high um, as we put all that information into our projection sheet, uh, we should end up at 25 bucks per hundred does. So one of, one of the things that, that we've been seeing over here, like I mentioned too, with, with density related issues and the steep decline in the overall population over these last five years is our elk population has, has been on that steep increase to where uh, we, we just surveyed that population two years ago and um, we have an, an a objective of 3,800 elk, but our estimate is right around 7,000. So our, our elk numbers have been increasing um, and not necessarily has it been direct competition with the elk, but with, with the amount of elk as well as the amount of deer where, where we got to, uh, we figure that that has caused or, or helped cause that significant decline over the last five years. Um, we are seeing some urban sprawl in, in this unit as well. Uh, not as much as, as like the Ogden unit or the East Canyon unit that, that I'll talk about coming up. But, but we do have uh, more and more development uh, where it's mainly private lands. Uh, predation, same as all the other units, uh, as well as the other factors uh, attributing to, to the deer decline or deer mortality. To address this, uh, we've had 22 projects on 3,700 acres and 24 stream miles. These projects have mainly been focused on the Hennifer Echo WMA. Uh, our, our habitat crew, again, uh, They've been doing a lot, a tremendous amount of work up on, on the WMA on their bulldozers, scalping in the, the shrub lines. We did have a fire out on, on this unit uh, during the deer hunt last year, had to, had to close the, the WMA down for a time uh, so we could keep the, the firefighters safe up, up on, that, on that fire. Um, and again, as soon as we can get those 
that that adequate moisture we we've got the seed in the ground uh, that should be able to grow uh we we started putting and deploying more gps collars on this unit uh this is one of those units where we've the the fat levels have been seeing that the those density concerns uh just where we we have the cash unit right across the the monte cristo highway from the this morgan south rich unit um our cash deer fat levels were significantly higher than our morgan south rich fat levels and so um we'll we'll be continuing to to watch that and um, you know monitoring the, the overall population sizes um, and working with with C, our CWMU partners on addressing the elk or our elk density issues, as well as the deer density issues. Our, our biologist Eric Anderson has been working very closely with with those CWMUs um, to to come up with strategies and ideas on on how to improve the deer numbers and, and be able to to get our elk numbers down to objective. Um, with, with those CWMUs, 75% of the entire unit is enrolled in the CWMU program. So, so we do have the tools and we do have the ability to work with those private landowners to, to address those concerns that we do have. Uh, our impact analysis biologist, as, as well as our, our district biologist has been um, in coordination with UDOT on on looking at the possibility of putting some fencing up around the I-84, I-80 echo interchange. Um, we get we see a significant amount of, of roadkill in that area. And so uh, in, increasing the amount of, of eight foot tall fencing there should help reduce uh, that amount of, of roadkill. Then we've also had a conservation easement of 2,200 acres on that unit. East Canyon, uh, this is similar to the Ogden unit. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, generally we've been trending upwards in our population. Again, the last couple of years, uh, we, we have trended down. Uh, we have some years trending down. Uh, we are on our way back up, especially with, with the survival year that we are having. Um, our objective is 13,500, an estimate of 12,800. This is a, a unit where we have had antlerless doe harvest to address depredation or uh, density concerns. Uh, we we have been above objective on this this unit, and we also get a significant amount of uh, urban deer concerns and, and issues uh, around the Centerville and, and Bountiful areas, North Salt Lake. Um, and so we've we've had some some antlerless hunts to address those those situations as well as in depredation situations. Uh, similar to the Morgan South Rich, recommending to to maintain at eighty one hundred as as those units are combined. And again, our buck to doe ratios are consistently above objective, so we've been working towards bringing that buck to doe ratio down. Uh, and we are trending in the right direction to, to get us towards objective. Um, fawn production, not as, not quite as good as like the box elder or the cash units, but still uh, really good fawn to doe ratios going into the winter and um, very good fawn survival with the mild winter that we have had. Um, and so we should end up around um, or we're projecting to end up around 2,500 or 25 bucks per hundred does post season. Limiting factors, I already mentioned the, the concerns that we have with, with urban deer problems. Um, uh, we, we have been working closely with cities on these areas. We are currently working with Bountiful City on drafting a new uh, urban deer plan to, to help them with their concerns with deer in town. Uh, so we can address those resident deer that, that stay there year round, uh, but maintain that the, the migratory deer that, that move off the, the public land 
um, during the winter can have their their traditional winter range to to be able to to come in and and make it through the winter. Um, we're we're seeing an increasing amount of of urban sprawl and, and challenges associated with that in in not only the Seas Canyon unit but but I'll talk about it as well in the Chalk Creek and the the Camas units to where we're getting uh, multi million dollar developments um, following I eighty through through Jeremy Ranch and around towards Colville as well as on the Morgan County side. Um, to where, uh, rightfully so, people are attracted to these these wild areas uh, that have wildlife and and all the other beauties that that go with it. Um, but at the same time, it limits the tools that we can use to manage these populations. And and what we're concerned about with this unit is increasing elk numbers here as well due to how, how it was mentioned that the elk behave differently than deer. Uh, as we increase the pressure on, on the public lands to address our overpopulation of elk, uh, we tend to push those elk more into those safe havens, if you will, where, where we have homes and there is um, resources to, to support elk in those areas, but we're not able to hunt them. And so as, as we get these developments moving across this unit, um, it, it's more and more of a concern for us. And so uh, we, we go in, we, we try to work with the developments. Um, we, we've been talking about meeting with, with commissioners so th uh, um, of the county so that we can go in and, 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 and discuss ways that we can manage these populations because as as the populations increase um, our amount of, of human wildlife interactions increase as well and uh, we tend to congregate the animals more which increases the, the risk of disease transmission uh, it also increases the risk of, of of highway mortalities here as well so um, uh, to help with these these situations, um, we have completed some, four projects in this this area. Um, our, our predator removal, we we've harvested had sportsmen harvest ten cougars. Um, the I eighty four I eighty echo interchange will help with with highway mortalities and, and the movements that we see in between the 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 three units there, um, because that's the corner of the Chalk Creek, this East Canyon, and the Morgan South Rich units. There currently is fencing along I-80 through Summit County that, that's helped with roadkill there. And the, the, the CWMUs that we do have on this, this unit, we've been able to work closely with them for management of, of, of the deer as well as the elk. Uh, this is one where I mean, it would be great to see more CWMUs and more opportunities that, that we would be able to, to maintain hunting pressure on, on populations. And then, like I mentioned, we are, are working with, with municipalities to formulate and implement urban deer programs. Dot Creek, um, this population um, is one where similar to the Morgan South Ridge, where we saw some 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 density concerns. A couple of years ago, we we grew significantly, got to about eighteen thousand deer, and then we've crashed pretty significantly. Um, with the the increased number of of deer over there, we were able to deploy some GPS collars so that we could see that the fat levels were extremely low. And then because of that, we, we've been seeing the, the die-offs that year that we ended up feeding deer in 2017. And then 2019 was another poor survival year. Uh, we, we saw significant declines in, in our, our populations there. This is one, though, as we were looking at the data uh, last fall, if you remember, we recommended an increase to the overall population objective from 10,500 to 12,000. As we plotted the, the population out on a graph, 
we saw where there was kind of a sweet spot of where we might be able to end up <coughs> population wise and not run into the, the same density related concerns that would in turn negatively impact our population. And so, so we were approved to, to increase that to 12,000 uh, and currently we're, we're sitting around 9,000 deer. Uh, this unit, similar to, to East Canyon, uh, we have recommended antlerless harvest to address those depredation concerns with, or with the, the density concerns, as well as depredation. Um, with, with populations down, we have recommended a decrease in those numbers of, of antlerless deer to be harvested, uh, but to also maintain that uh, we can keep those populations at or slightly below objective. Buckwise, uh, the Chalk Creek unit, we are again consistently high on our buck to doe ratios. Uh, so we'll maintain or recommend maintaining permits at 8,100. Uh, our, our adult survival this year, we're sitting at 94%. Uh, fawn survival, um, this one, we, we don't have any fawn callers. And so we look at both the South Slope unit as well as the cash unit. So we, we're gonna be right around that 65% um, uh, fawn survival up to this point is, is even as high as the 79 percent that, that we're currently seeing on the cash. Um, the, the mild winter has has um, been good for the survival. Uh, hopefully we can get some springtime moisture though to help our deer build the fat levels back up. Um, our fawn production similar to East Canyon 57 fawns per 100 does. Um, so we, with that, we're projecting to end up at 25 bucks per hundred does. Uh, for, for Chalk Creek, um, we, so back with the, the declines and the, the density related issues a couple of years ago, we were significantly above our elk objective that time as well. Since that time, we have been decrease, decreasing uh, our, our elk population. We've been hunting them a little harder, been getting better harvest from our sportsmen. Um, and so with that, as well as the decreased amount of deer on the landscape, um, as, as we've gone in and, and deployed GPS collars and, and checked out the condition of the deer, our fat levels have been increasing across this unit. Uh, and so as we're able to, to better survive the, the summer and, and the winter conditions, uh, our, our, our survival has, or our populations are anticipated to continue to, to increase. Um, but again, urban sprawl, uh, again, we're into the, the multimillion dollar developments uh, that, that limit the the tools that we can use for wildlife management. This Chalk Creek unit uh, is 96% privately owned property. Um, so the, the ability for us to do work on public land, land is limited in this unit. So the majority of these completed projects have been on private lands. Uh, so again, this is in cooperation with with federal landowners and uh, our federal agencies, excuse me, as well as private landowners. These have mainly been in the form of um, water lines and water troughs and tanks across the landscape um, to to provide more water resources for the deer. Uh, I mean, you know, the the overall goal of those is for uh, for the for the livestock, uh, but but deer are helped by that as well in the fencing and working closely with CWMUs. Camas, uh, 
I, I'm kind of sounding like a broken record, so I'm just going to kind of zoom through Camas, uh, similar to, to East Canyon and Chalk Creek. Uh, populations are trending up here. Antlerless harvest only to address depredation. Uh, we are recommending a decrease uh, of 2,800 or of 500 to, to 2,800 permits here because we have been seeing a, a decrease in the buck to doe to where we are currently at objective and uh, the production along with the survival the projection will, will end us at, at 23 bucks per 100 does. Limiting factors, uh, again, the same. Uh, so, Benton projects across 2,400 acres and six tree miles, um, predator removal and fence repair. Again, this, this population is, is heading upwards to, to where we want it to be and trending in the right direction. So with that, I, I apologize, I took so long there. Um, if you have any questions, or again, if you would like to, to see some of the graphs, um, I, I'm more than happy to share them uh, at any time. Uh, it doesn't need to be during this board session. Feel free to, to reach out to me. Thanks, Jim. That was very informational. Uh, any questions from the board? Uh, seeing none, uh, we're going to take a short break for five minutes. Uh, everybody can be back here at uh, 11, 17, and then we'll start with the next presentations. Thanks again, Jim. That was very informational. You're welcome.
We have all of our regional biologists uh, standing by. So at the end, if you've got questions, we can go into more depth. Um, I feel a little um, like I'm less prepared than Jim. He was very thorough. So if you've got questions, we can certainly go into uh, more depth at the end. Okay, so um, I, in, instead of um, the bullets, I just have graphs because I want you to kind of see the, the trend over time of both the deer population and uh, buck permits. So that's kind of how we're set up for, for, our, um, for the Southern region. All right, so we'll start with the Southwest desert. Uh, the population objective is 3,500. And we currently estimate that we've got 2,900 animals um, on each slide, I will also down at the bottom, I uh, have last year's survival of uh, adult and fawn. So Kobe went over kind of the time frame. Kobe or Kent, one of the two went over the time frame that we measure that survival. So this was the 19 through 20. And currently we're in the 20 through 21, which we don't have that complete set of data yet. So um, for the Southwest desert, uh, if we don't have a, a migration or survival uh, set up for that unit, we, we extrapolate off an adjacent similar unit. So this is taken off the Pine Valley unit, I believe. Um, the 2020 uh, for our classification, we only were counting 36 bonds per 100 does this last fall. So that is a lot lower than we would like to see. Um, this graph, so the, the left side shows the number of buck permits. This is just so you see that for scale. And then um, the, the numbers on the right side going up and down, uh, that, that's just more the scale for the buck to doe ratio. So for 2021, our, we will be recommending 650 buck permits, so that's a decrease from last year. The buck to doe average, the three-year average, is 20 bucks per 100 does, but uh, with the classification of only 35 last year, we've got a, a lot less bucks coming into the fawns graduating into that next cohort, so we probably won't see as many uh, young bucks on the landscape this year. Uh, with this recommendation, we hope to be at 19 bucks per 100 does in 2022. So limiting factors on the unit. Um, we've got limited summer range or fawning habitat there on the Southwest Desert. Uh, will be a broken record. The continued drought is hurting us. We've got PJ encroachment both into summer and winter habitat. This is our only unit in the southern region that really has the problem with uh, wild horses, but it is quite significant out there on the southwest desert. Uh, we've had some wildfires and um, coyote predation. In addition to that, uh, the cougar, um, we have some cougar predation, uh, but oh, I'll cover that bullet. So um, I think we've also got Daniel Eddington later in, in the um, meeting here today, he will cover a lot of the WRI uh, projects. So I really scaled back all the habitat work that I'm going to present to you just for the interest of time. So uh, currently we've got over 14,000 acres and one water development uh, and proposed in the WRI, we've got almost 12,000 acres and then one additional water development. Uh, for wild horses, the BLM estimates that in the last year, uh, wild horse numbers have decreased by a thousand, and some of that is attributed to some capture work that they've been doing. Cougar management on the unit, it is uh, unlimited harvest objective strategy, and so far this year, uh, seven cougars have been removed. We also work with USDA Wildlife Services for targeted aerial coyote control during the winter. Um, and then we, we would, you know, if we have our wishes, we'd love to add this unit to monitor, do monitoring uh, survival and migration. We've had some pretty cool um, migration from the Pine Valley unit that go clear up onto the Southwest Desert. Um, moving on, the Fillmore Oak Creek. So this is a limited entry unit. 
Uh, the population objective is 2,000, and uh, the population, our estimates, it has been declining, and we currently estimate we're at 14,000 or 1,480. Adult survival, we have for 0.76 and fawns, 0.53. Uh, the classification of fawns last fall, we had, we're counting 47 fawns per 100 does. Uh, I don't have a graph for, for bucks on this unit because it's very stable since it is a limited entry unit. Uh, the buck to doe ratio, we manage for 25 to 35 bucks per 100 does on the limited entry unit, and it's been a little bit high. We've been at 38.8. So we are recommending to increase permits from 36 to 40 permits on this unit this year. And, and our goal for 2022 is just to have a slight decrease to be within the parameters of the plan. Limiting factors on the unit, it is both summer and winter range. Um, it's you know, limited by summer and winter habitat. Uh, we had the Clay Springs fire a couple of years ago. Um, we're still doing some, the restoration work is still developing from that. It was over 100,000 acres. Um, and, and the drought, the quality of the habitat, um, the animals just aren't, um, like Covey and Kent both, both talked about, they're just not getting the adequate nutrition to pack on weight that they need. Um, we have currently over 35,000 acres and one water development in habitat projects and proposed one more water development. Uh, we're working with private landowners to kind of investigate um, ways to increase winter range on, on private lands. And cougar management, it is a uh, unlimited harvest objective and we have so far moved two cougars on this unit. We've hit this unit quite hard with lions. Uh, since we also have bighorn sheep on the unit, so we have hit this one quite hard over the last several years. Okay, moving on to the Fillmore Pavant. Um, we, um, the population objective is 7,600, and we currently estimate our population at 6,500. Again, it has declined since about 2016. Uh, adult survival at 0.76, fawn survival 0.31, and Poor classification on this unit also, we were only counting 44 fawns per 100 does. Um, this is a graph of the buck permits. Uh, we're decreasing. We're, this year, we um, are, are maintaining at 1,200. We're recommending to maintain at 1,200. We did a pretty drastic cut last year. So we did see some response in the buck to doe ratio. And, and just to mention, all of the southern region general season units are in the 18 to 20 uh, buck to doe ratio um, category. So that's what our management goal is. So the three year average is 17 bucks per 100 does. So by maintaining at 1200 buck permits, we're hoping that we'll be right there in that 19 to 20 bucks per 100 doe window by next year. Um, limiting factors, uh, habitat availability, um, and the habitat quality, mostly to do with the drought. And, and then um, I think it was Kent spoke about, you know, then they have the subsequent uh, worse body condition and they are more susceptible to predation. Current work, we've got almost 14,000 acres in habitat work and three water developments. And next year, over 21,000 acres of habitat work. For cougar management on um, the Pavant, it is an unlimited harvest objective strategy. And so far we have removed um, 26 lions. Beaver unit uh, population objective is 14,000. Uh, it has been decreasing over the last couple of years and we currently estimate that it's at 10,300. Um, adult survival, again, we extrapolate that if we don't have a survival, uh, unit. I, this one does though, so it's off the beaver unit, sorry. So we're at 0.76 for adults, 0.31 for fawns, um, and very poor fawn classification. Last fall we were counting 37 fawns per 100 does. This is the graph of buck permits that have been declining over the last several years. Our recommendation for 2021 is 1,400 permits. Um, our buck to doe ratio has been pretty poor. The three-year average is 15, but if you notice last year, 
uh, we were actually seeing 13 bucks per hundred dose. Um, we we hope um, our goal by 2022, we hope that we will be back up closer to within our objective at 17 bucks per hundred dose. Limiting factors on the unit, um, the habitat availability and quality, uh, the poor body condition. And um, just for an example, we have both coyote and cougar predation. But in 2021, since we collared the fawns this year, we, we had 20 fawns collared. Uh, some of those collars have failed, but currently 11 of those 20 have died. Seven due to coyotes, three to cougars, and one to malnutrition. But the biologist, he did document that all of them were in poor body condition. So even if we don't attribute the death to malnutrition, oftentimes that predation is related to their body condition. Current work, we've got over 21,000 acres um, of habitat work and one water development. And next year, almost 15,000 acres are proposed. Um, we also are considering an increase to the cougar, cougar harvest. So the west side is an unlimited strategy, but the east side is still on a split. That being said, we have removed um, 10 lions on the west side and 18 on the east side. So depending on what our data says, when we come back in June with Cougar recommendations, we may be considering an increase. Moving on to the Monroe, the population objective is 7,000. Again, population uh, you can see has been declining for several years. We currently estimate it at 5,200. Uh, survival at 0.76 and fawn survival at 0.31. Um, the uh, classification was a little bit better for fawns. We, we were seeing 52 fawns per 100 doves this last year. Our buck permit recommendation for this year is 750 permits. Three-year average buck to doe ratio is at 17. And with this recommendation, we hope that we will be right there at 18 bucks per 100 doves next year. Limiting factors on the unit, uh, the forage, availability and and then the you know subsequent body condition is, is worsening the continued drought winter range quality issues uh, predators both cougars and coyotes and, and on this unit they're um, on 89 on the west side and on the east side with highway 24 we have some highway mortality um, we've got uh, currently 25,000 acres of habitat work and one water development, and next year, almost 10,000 acres and one water development proposed. So, so something specific kind of to the Monroe and the Fish Lake, um, those units probably were at carrying capacity for a few years. So we had a lot of deer mouths on the landscape. And, and so there was kind of that intraspecific um, competition. So, so with a little bit lower deer population, I know that um, some of the BYU research and some of the presentation we've done over the last few years, we probably want to be a little bit below carrying capacity because once we get at or above, you may be, you know, kind of damaging the, ha the habitat. And so, so just being a little bit below uh, the carrying capacity is probably a good thing because there's less deer mouths on the landscape for them to compete with. Um, predator control, we have increased the number of cougar permits and on the Monroe so far, we have uh, removed 11 lions. Um, and then we've also worked with our UDOT partners and installed some flashing deer signs, both on Highway 89 and on 24. Okay, Mount Bethany. The population objective is 3,500, and we currently estimate the population to be at 2,200. Survival of adults point at 0.76 and fawns 0.31. Uh, classification again, not a lot of fawns. We were counting, we we're counting about 40 fawns per 100 does last year. And this is a pretty significant downward trend of our buck permits. We've been slashing and cutting permits for the last several years. Uh, and the buck to doe ratio is still pretty poor. So this year we recommend 225 permits. The three-year average buck to doe ratio is at 15. 
And um, with this recommendation, we hope that we're back up to 18 bucks per 100 does next year. Um, again, broken record, drought, habitat issues with PJ encroachment. We do have some depredation issues on this unit, um, some around uh, Circleville. When we do antlerless removal, we always target those resident animals that are like the, living year round in, in the fields. And we always avoid migratory deer that are going up to the mountain and then down to the field. So we time that. So we're targeting just those resident animals, um, competition with other mouths and predators. Current work, um, and this is, these are just the projects in WRI, but we have 169 acres currently and proposed 4,600 acres in one water development. Um, we are targeting non-migratory deer when we do removals on agricultural or antlerless permits. Predator control, we have increased cougar permits and then we will be switching next year to year-round harvest objective. So, so far this year we have removed um, six uh, lions, plus some for depredation issues on livestock. This is another unit that we, we would like to one day add GPS colors to this unit. Moving on to the Chris Lake, the population objective is 7,000, and we're a little bit below. We're currently at 40, estimate the population at 4,900, adult survival at 0.76, and fawns at 0.31. And classification was quite a bit better um, at point, or excuse me, 58 fawns per 100 does last fall. Here's the graph of buck permits. Um, this year, our recommendation is 800 permits. Uh, our three-year average buck to doe ratio is at 18. And next year, we hope to be right there in the 18 to 20 bucks per 100 does window. Eliminating factors on the unit continued drought, and then that competition with, with other species and with additional deer. So it may help the population that we're a little bit low, below carrying capacity right now. Uh, winter range, quality issues, predators, and highway mortality. So some of the current work that we've got going on, almost 19,000 acres that are currently happening, and we've got over 10,000 acres and one water development proposed. So. Again, that lower deer population, um, that, that should help a little bit, having less mouths on, the, on the mountain. We will evaluate the cougar data this year and possibly increase uh, cougar permits this year. It is currently on a split unit and we've removed um, 10 cougars. And we've also installed flashing deer crossing signs there on um, state, state Route 24. The Plateau Thousand Lakes. So the population objective is 1,400, and we currently estimate the population at 850. Um, adult survival, we estimate at 0.81, and fawn survival at 0.68. And classification, last year we were seeing 49 fawns per 100 does. Here's a graph of the buck permits. This year we are decreasing, recommending a decrease to 225 permits, and the three-year buck to doe uh, ratio is at 18 bucks. So uh, with this perm this recommendation, we do hope to be right within the 18 to 20 bucks per hundred does. We have continued drought, winter and summer range, the quality and condition due to the drought, uh, predator issues. Uh, it's hard to get lion removal on, on the Thousand Lakes. It's a hard unit. We have uh, some years, some years we have only um, it, it, we've been lucky to get one or two. We're up to three lions removed so far. And the Thousand Lakes is a pretty dry unit, some limited water sources. So uh, cougars, are they are on an unlimited um, harvest strategy. We've got almost 10,000 acres of habitat work and 1,400 more for next year. The two exciting things here, like on the Thousand Lakes, and, and this carries on to the Boulder also, is the Forest Service, they are working on NEPA to do uh, PJ removal in some of these lower elevation, and they have also started NEPA for uh, some of the higher elevation conifers. And I think Kent hit on this just a little while ago, uh, that, that, you know, they're not packing on, the fawns are not packing on adequate nutrients and we're kind of 
which is surprising on the Boulder, kind of summer range limited, even though you've got all of that beautiful high country, a lot of it is deep, dark uh, conifers, which doesn't have a lot of nutrients. So uh, they're currently doing 2,000 acres of PJ removal on the Thousand Lakes and an additional almost 1,000 uh, proposed for next year and some restoration of some pond lining. Um, moving on to the, the Plateau Boulder, the population objective is 8,500. And we currently estimate the population at 6,350. Uh, we do have collars on this unit and last year's survival was 0.81 and fawn survival was 0.68. I don't think it's gonna be that great this year. Fawns were, were I, I think it was Kent said, uh, fawns were in really poor body condition this last uh, winter. Classification, we saw 50 fawn, 55 fawns per 100 does. We are recommending a decrease on the boulder unit for buck permits down to 825 permits. The three-year average buck to doe ratio is at 14 bucks per 100 does, so we don't like to see that. Um, with this uh, decrease, we hope by next year we'll be up into the 18 to 20 bucks per 100 does. Limiting factors, um, we have drought, we've got winter and summer range issues and those subsequent low fawn weights because they're not getting adequate nutrients as well as predators. So I think it was Jim Christensen said, death by a thousand cuts. There's just so many issues that we're trying to overcome. If mother nature would just cut us a break here. But current work, uh, we do have uh, the boulder on an unlimited cougar harvest strategy. And we have had a lot higher harvest this last year. So we have so far, uh, had 33 cougars harvested. Habitat work, here we've got the current almost 12,000 acres in one water project. And next year, uh, over 6,000 acres in one water projects are proposed. And, and then we do have those two NEPA assistance projects that the Forest Service are working on for PJ and conifers, which is really exciting. And hopefully if, if mother nature can, you know, cooperates with us with these projects, we can really start turning the tides on these units. Okay, for the pond scum, it is a premium limited entry unit. So it has managed, um, the population objective is 6,500 and we currently estimate the population to be at 5,400. Survival for adults is at, is at 0.84 and fawn survival 0.53. Um, so, so the permits, the buck permits are outlined in the plan. So trophy permits will be at 135 and, and we are recommending to decrease management permits. I think last year we were at 31 and we're uh, recommending management permits to be at 15 for this year. Uh, the buck to doe ratio has been decreasing just a little bit and we've had some poor fawn survival. So we, we would like to back off at least a little bit on the management permits. And our goal for 2022 is uh, to increase our buck to doe ratio a little bit. Limiting factors on the Pontagant drought. Um, we've got limited water down there on the water on the winter range and the summer range availability. There's a fair amount of animals on the Pontagant that with our migration study, they'll go to the Zion unit, they go to the Pinguich Lake, um, you know, they really spread up out and, and try to find better summer range. But this is where we have the doe that spends her winters down on the buckskin, and then she travels up to Summit Mountain, you know, just outside of Cedar City and Summit to spend the winter. Um, we've got PJ encroachment in the winter range, predators, and highway mortality. Um, current work, we've got almost 20,000 acres and two water developments. And next year, we hope to have 5,600 acres. Um, we have had an incredibly successful highway uh, fencing east of Kanab along Highway 89. One of our biologists was just down there a few weeks ago camping with his family and, and was able to watch from a distance as like 100 deer would come through. And they... It's just exciting to see how well they have learned to use those um, under under crossings. So, what a success story! Um, we we did recently change the cougar strategy. It used to be a split, and now it is a harvest objective. And this year, 
Uh, 14, harvest, 14 cougars have been harvested and actually shut that down. So we will be evaluating that this next June to increase or change the strategy for uh, cougar permits. Hey, Population objective is 11,000, and we currently estimate that we're slightly below that at 10,100. Survival, we estimate at 0.8, and fawn survival, 0.49. And um, last fall, we were seeing 51 fawns per 100 does. Uh, here's a graph of buck permits. We have been cutting steadily for years. Um, the buck to doe ratio is only at 15 bucks per 100 does. So with this decrease, um, we, we hope to be at 18 bucks per 100 does. So we're only recommending 1,200 permits for, net, for 2021. Limiting factors, uh, drought, uh, PJ encroachment, winter range quality and quantity. The brine head fire is still in recovery phase. We've got predator issues. Um, this is one unit that we, we do have some urban deer conflict here on, on the west side, kind of from Cedar City up to Paraguna and some highway mortality. Um, here we've got a, over 5,000 acres currently um, being worked on and uh, over 5,000 acres proposed for next year. Uh, we've increased cooker permits and so far this year, um, 20 cougars were harvested. Uh, and, and being a little bit below that 11,000 population objective, um, we have less mouths on, on the mountain. So we are maintaining, we'd like to maintain at or below carrying capacity. And then we've been working with our UDOT partners on highway crossing signs. The design unit, um, the population, Objective is 19,000, and we currently estimate the population at 18,000. Adult survival, we estimate at 0.75 and fawns at 0.63. Last year, we were sitting 50 fawns per 100 does. For 2021, we recommend uh, 3,100 permits, and the bug to doe ratio, the three year average, is at 20. Um, but, but you know, even at that last year for the Zion unit, 50 fawns per 100 does isn't, you know, quite as good as we'd like to see. But our goal for next year, uh, we'd like to be right there in the 18 to 20 bucks per 100 does. Limiting factors on the Zion unit, we've got some habitat loss. We've got uh, development on both winter range and summer range. And, and I think this is probably all throughout the state, especially this last year, everybody has seen increased recreation and continued drought, PJ encroachment, uh, the quality of the summer range due to the drought, a fair amount of highway mortality and cougar predation. On the Zion unit so far, uh, 25 uh, cougars have been um, harvested. So habitat work, we're currently working on over 5,000 acres and ne next year we've got almost 7,000 acres proposed. Uh, we're uh, communicating with the Forest Service and we'd like to find ways to minimize the recreation disturbance. There is a lot of, um, there, there really is just, you know, whether it's ATVs or hikers or, you know, so many re reasons that the, there's people pushing the deer all the time. And we have installed flashing deer signs. All right, the Pine Valley unit uh, population objective is at 19,500, and we currently estimate the population to be right there at 19,500. Uh, survival uh, for adults, 0.8, and fawns, 0.63. And last year classification, we were seeing 45 fawns per 100 does. Uh, for 2021, we are recommending a decrease to 4,100 permits. Uh, the three year average buck to doe ratio it is over at 22 bucks per 100 does. Um, and our goal with this recommendation is 19 bucks per 100 does. But it, our uh, fawn classification, we probably are not recruiting the number of fawns into the population, um, a spike that, that we'd like to see. Limiting factors on the Pine Valley uh, drought, highway mortality habitat loss on winter range and, and development 
uh, PJ encroachment on the summer range. And then we do have some agricultural and urban deer issues. Uh, we've got a lot. We've got 18, over 18,000 acres currently being worked on and proposed almost 2,000 acres. We're working uh, with UDOT. We've installed some flashing deer signs. Uh, we would like to investigate securing some critical ranges from development. And then again, um, on any of the agricultural or urban issues, we always like to target residential deer that are living in the farms or in the cities year round rather than those that migrate. So uh, the common themes, you know, we, we really have, we've got to get out of this cycle. We've had um, multiple years of drought and subsequent habitat issues. We've had decreased survival and recruitment, increased recreation and disturbance. Um, we have been implementing aggressive predator control where we can, and then you know, always using the most recent data to make our recommendation for all species so we can be reactive as fast as we can to help out um, the deer. All right, and that concludes. So if you've got any question, again, uh, we've got all our biologists on here, so go ahead. Thanks, Teresa. The board got any questions? Hey, Teresa, this is Kevin. Um, really, really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that really um, stuck out to me was the, the Boulder Mountain, showing the, the, the efforts that you've done with the collar data. Um, really looks to me like the, the Boulder Mountain needs like a Monroe Mountain type of effort to really go in there and do a lot of work. Uh, just wondering how the Wildlife Board can help with that. And and uh, wonder if this data has been presented to the local forest service, county commissioners, and those people at hand over there to kind of show them what, what's going on. Yeah, we really want to focus uh, on habitat work there. And um, Levi is the biologist for the unit. Um, previously, it was Jim Lamb, and Jim is now a habitat restoration biologist. And so he's doing a lot of work um, closely with the Forest Service. And, and those NEPA projects, you know what a big deal those are to get those done so we can really start doing some projects up there. But we've got Levi on board too. Do you want to add anything, Levi? Yeah, and it, we, we have been working really closely with the Forest Supervisor. Um, and the, I just wanted to comment on, on those NEPA projects. It's a forest-wide NEPA approval, and that's already been approved for pinion juniper removal. And so for pinion juniper removal, it's mostly coming up with funding at this point in order to do those. Um, but we're still working on the, the forest-wide NEPA approval for, for conifers in the higher elevations because we, we want to do it at a scale that it will have an impact. We're, we're concerned if we do it in the thousands of acres that as, as those aspens try to regenerate, they'll just be overwhelmed by, by everything trying to get in there and, and eat everything. And so we want to do it on a scale that's large enough that it won't just be swarmed by everything trying to eat it. But we're definitely working really closely with the Forest Service to try to get that moving forward. I definitely appreciate that. And I think that, um, I, I know that uh, the Manti and the, the Dixie, the Fish Lake, are working on a um, on a national scale of prescribed fire that would allow them um, to be able to do prescribed fire, but also manage fire better if there's natural strikes. But I think uh, if we can show this data that you have to really sit down with those that make those decisions, um, you know, sometimes there, there are... Um, working in this industry you know there's few county commissioners or a few that that complain of smoke and a lot of times that takes um, precedence and so if we can really show the need to to convert this at a large scale like you're say, saying not just thousands of acres but on a large large scale um, that our efforts here could really help kevin this is this is kevin bundle just to add what to what levi said um, Gary Besant and myself met with the four supervisors from the from the Dixie and the Fish Lake last week um, in a continuing effort to, to to see what we can do 
to help get the NEPA completed. We're looking at maybe la the landscape uh, forecasting tools that PNC uses, but but that's that's the number one priority within our habitat section in the southern region right now is getting the the NEPA completed so that we can do large scale habitat treatments on that bold region. Kevin, thanks for those those efforts. I I think that uh, with the data we have, really really help us to to show strong that there, there's a need there. And so thanks for everything you've done, and look forward to if we can help in any way to help you with that it would be awesome. Yeah, Teresa, this is Donnie. Glad to hear you mention that we've we're working on some conservation easements for our critical near winter range. That's a big deal here. In southern Utah, you look at the problems they're having in northern Utah, and they haven't got a lot of a lot of ground for their deer. So we need to conserve and try to take care of all, everything we can because we're growing down here too. And before long, we'll be in the same shape. So thank you for your your work and your all your help. Rita, this is Carl. Do you by chance have a a I mean, we saw the re reduction for individual units, but a total number of tags reduced in the southern region. I bet Kent or Coe can tally that up really fast for me. <laughs> and I just, just anybody else is watching. I just, uh, we are getting so much more information. We've now seen two regions and we're getting so much more information and I think better information to manage mule deer. So I just really appreciate everybody's effort. Well, I appreciate the, the this ability to, to discuss all of these with you. And the biologists, all of them gave me over three pages of really detailed information. So I I couldn't condense that into a presentation fast enough. So so much is cut out. But you know, on, on your point, we, we don't want to, we hate taking away opportunity. But these decreases, we feel like we've got to do some pretty severe decreases on units in order to get us back up and, and bump us back up into the 18 to 20 where we need to be, so. And Teresa and I have that number. Um, the proposed reduction is almost 4,000 permits. It's 3,975 permits. And it's a, a proposed reduction of 22% of the total permits that were issued last year. And last year, there was a significant reduction as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Teresa, one question. When you presented on the, the Oak Creek and the Fillmore Pavant, um, even the Beaver, those um, bonds were, uh, really stuck out as being low. Can you talk about how that compares historically? what normally those numbers are. Yeah, and Mike Wordle, are you on? Yeah, I'm on here. Do you want to um, hear that? Yep, I can talk to that. So on the beaver, um, you look at fondo ratios. So, you know, historically we've we've been as high as the mid 60s to the higher 60s. Um, whereas this year we were down to 37 on the Pavant. We've uh, been similar so we've been in the mid 60s you know you look at like 2014 we hit 65 fonts per 100 does which at that point we were growing our population thank you and most of that just uh, related to drought so it seems like um you know Teresa touched on the collars that we have on the beaver uh, we've had a significant mortality there in the past few months uh, with our fawns and, and she, like she mentioned all of them have been really in poor condition and we look at the bone marrow and look at uh, the color and the texture of the bone marrow and that can give us an idea of what type of condition they were in and whether they were killed by a lion or coyotes uh, we did have one malnutrition they've all been in pretty rough shapes Teresa one one question this is way you had mentioned survivability on adults and fawns on each one of those units. Is that a three-year average or was that uh, kind of this last 12 month picture? That is from, correct me if I'm wrong, it's from uh, December of 
2019 through 2020. So in some cases in Southern Utah, because our drought is so much worse, I think we're gonna be, uh, Randy or one of the, the other presentations, I think we're gonna be less, not, not as good this next year. So uh, it, it's pretty scary. I When they, um, whether it's Randy Larson or Kent, they get the email if a radio caller has stopped to function. So they send an email to the biologists that say we have a possible mortality on a deer. I mean, it's just been kind of disheartening to see all of those mortalities just flying in several emails a day sometimes, and especially the beaver and the boulder. It, it's been pretty rough, so. Thanks. Teresa, can I add one more thing to my comment for Kevin? Sure. Um, I was just going to say, when you look at the beaver on the Pavant, we've done a lot of projects on those units, and we've treated a lot of acres. And But a lot of that, a lot of those projects have been lower elevation and winter habitat, winter range. Um, and I think that there's they're starting to be a more renewed focus on summer range projects as we've seen these body condition scores come in lower. Um, last year, the beaver was really low. I think that that's going to start helping too with our mule deer. Mike, yesterday I, I had the opportunity to drive down um, through Coalport and, and on I-15 to St. George. And I was so impressed to see all of the projects that you guys have done over time. It's it's amazing the work there. And and you've had some large scale fires on the on the beaver. Um, and, and I think that, uh, like you say, that that'll start to, to pay dividends. But uh, I think the droughts got us in, in a cycle, but uh, w it'll help there. There's definitely a lot of work been going on. I think that uh, it shows like on the on the boulder, I think there's been a lot less work done up high in the summer range. And so I think that that's an area that uh, we definitely, if we can write a letter from the wildlife board or have anyone um, that would he help, we definitely would lend our hand. I think that you guys are, are doing a lot. And so if we, if we can do anything to help with that, I think uh, we definitely will. Kevin, this is Kevin Bunno. We would, we would welcome a letter from the wildlife board to support um, probably specifically um, a effort to get the NEPA done on, on the, the, the boulder and plateau units so that we can, can start large scale habitat treatments. If, if the board would supply us with a letter um, along those lines, um, we would certainly make use of it. Thank, thank you. And we, uh, at the appropriate time, I also make the motion and then uh, we'll, we'll work on that on our end. So thank you. Any other questions? We're right on time right now at uh, 12 p.m. Uh, we're scheduled for a 30 minute lunch break. I think we just break that down into a 15 minute lunch break, uh, whatever the board would like to do. If you're good with the 15 minute lunch break, we can come back at 12.15 and start again. The next presentation, uh, Southeast region. Works for me, Byron. Yeah, that's fine. That'll work. Okay, we have a majority of, we'll reconvene or reconvene at 12.15. Thank you.
anybody there? <laughs> Adam Mike, you're speaking. Oh, there we go. Uh, Byron, I just wanted to give you a heads up. We are back from break. And you are muted, Byron. Guy Wallace, you're up. You hear me? Yep, I'm just... Getting going here. Okay. All right. Does everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Well, Byron, that 15 minutes made it hard to get through uh, Monticello traffic, get home, get something, <laughs> get back. I bet they did. It. You must have hit a red light. <laughs> Um, so hello everyone, um, uh, now that you've all got your, uh, your bellies full and, uh, ready to take a nap, I hope you, uh, have your Coca-Cola or your, uh, Red Bull or whatever the first stimulant you use and, uh, on board because for my presentation, away with that. We're ready, locked and loaded. Here we go. In the southeast region, we have uh, eight mule deer units, and I kind of wanted to go through these just a little bit to show that we have two units with 15 to 17 objectives, two units with 18 to 20, three units with 20 to 25, and one unit with 40 to 50. So we have quite a bit of uh, mature buck quality units in the region. Uh, some of those don't have a lot of permits involved, uh, luckily, we have the Manti as a part of the southeast region that has a large unit, large population, and it's a 15 to 17, so it has uh, quite a few permits, and it actually has more permits than the rest of the region combined in the Manti unit. So with that, we'll, we'll go to the Manti unit. Uh, the current population trend on the Manti is stable to declining. Uh, we've had low fawn survival three of the last five years, and it was adult survival was lowest in 2020. Uh, our body fat condition is usually good uh, on that unit, and this is going to be important when I talk about recommendations or, or what we're doing. Uh, it was high in 2019, but a little bit lower this year. Our past permits are trending down during the past five years. If you look at the graph, um, first of all, you can see where our population is. The dotted line is our objective. And the top orange line is where our population has been, and it shows a slight trend down the last few years. The bottom line shows the permits that we've issued. Um, we have decreased permits over the three times over the last five years. Uh, and we've reduced permits by 1,100 since 2016. Uh, I'll show you the, on the next graph, it shows uh, what's been happening with our fondo and our buck doe ratios. You see our fondo ratio took quite a dip in 2019, uh, but it's come back up this past year, 2020, and our Buck doe ratio has been kind of right within. We were above objective for a while. The dotted line is the objective. We were down in 2017, but we're we're back up and we're at objective. Uh, our current 
facto ratio, including the central region, is at uh, 16. So, so we're going to recommend the same number of permits that we had last year, which is 8,100 permits. Uh, the learning factors on this unit is, as I had mentioned about the uh, adult survival, we on the south portion of this unit, we've seen uh, a high level of predation, lion predation on adult mortality on this unit. It's 60% of the adult mortality uh, compared to 33% statewide. Uh, also on that unit, it's adult survival has is below 73% or 72% three of the last four years. Um, we, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Our uh, body condition scores are usually pretty good on the, the Manti, but we have lower adult survival. So it kind of goes back to what Justin referred to earlier, what we believe anyway, is that it's, it's being affected more by top-down pressure on this unit. Um, this unit is has uh, some winter range concerns. Some of the winter ranges on this unit are, are in poor condition um, for the reasons we've been talking about in terms of drought and some over utilization. Our, uh, this unit is also positive for chronic wasting disease. Some of the current work we've done uh, in terms of the what's happening with the predators on this unit, we we implemented uh, a predator management plan with an unlimited cougar quota, and so far we've had 75 lions removed this year compared to the previous five-year average of 43. Uh, we also collared some additional deer on the west side of the unit to get a, a better picture of what's going on on the whole south unit there. Um, and as you can see there, there's been quite a few habitat projects uh, conducted on this unit, over 90,000 acres in the past 10 years, and we have another 3,600 proposed. We had some wildfires on that unit recently, and we're hoping that that will improve deer habitat. The next unit I want to talk about is the Nine Mile. The Nine Mile unit is pre predominantly private land. Uh, the recent population trend has been declining there. We use the book cliffs uh, for survival data, and I, I probably wait till uh, they talk about survival data on the book cliffs, but uh, bond survival is generally higher than statewide. Uh, but it's been a little bit lower so far this year. Our adult survival has been lower than statewide, and we had our lowest adult survival on that unit, on the book list anyway, in 2018. This shows the population trend, again, for the nine mile. Um, you can see we were, we've been increasing deer until the last couple of years. Uh, we're uh, currently at uh, 68 or 6,800 deer, and our objective is 7,400. Uh, we've increased permits on this unit twice in the in the last four years, um, and we increased well, about a, by about 350 permits. There, you can see one of the issues with this uh, unit is is that because mm -hmm. it has so much private land, it's hard to uh, raise permits by very much because it basically just increases our public pressure on on uh, public lands rather than on the private lands this shows our this graph shows our buck doe ratios over the past 10 years you see it kind of jumps up and down and it was down in 2018 uh, you know we talked about uh, Kent talked about 2018 and what it did it really had some effects in this region uh, but we've seen it actually our fond ratios come back up a little bit. We're right within objective on this unit, on the nine mile unit. Uh, our buck though, our three year average is 21. Uh, and the, the objective on this unit is an 18 to 20. And so we're, we're recommending the same permits as, as last year, which would be the 1650. The limiting factors on this unit is it has similar issues to the book list, and we'll hear more about that, but it has low adult survival. 
or lower adult survival, which is likely due to high Ryan predation. It has a limited summer range, um, and we've seen effects on this unit from long-term drought. We have private lands issues, like I mentioned, which is uh, primarily that it's hard to increase permits when we do have an increased population on this unit. And there is, has a, a, does have a pretty robust wild horse population on this unit. Current work is we also have a, a predator management plan on this unit. Uh, we've removed 12 lions so far this year. We have quite a few uh, WRI projects on this unit. We have 24,000 that's been completed and another 4,500 that's proposed. And we've also been working on easements uh, to try and improve access across the private land to get into some public lands that are uh, landlocked by private land. Next, I'll talk about the LaSalle Mountains unit. That's our other 15 to 17 uh, Buckdo objective unit. Uh, we've seen the population increase slightly this year after a three year decline. Uh, we use the San Juan for survival data and I'll talk more about the survival data um, on the San Juan when we get to that unit. But uh, we did radio collar 70 deer in 2019 uh, and adult survival was uh, was good in that year, uh, and uh, it was actually uh, 0.78, uh, or it was down a little bit, sorry, and fawn production, or fawn survival was quite high on that year. This kind of shows what I was talking about in terms of what's happened with the population. You can see there was a, on the orange line, there was quite a decline in 2017 is down and then we've seen a slight increase back up. It's uh, currently estimated at 6,500 deer there. And uh, our objective is 8,000. We've reduced permits on this unit over the past five years. We've reduced them twice. We took uh, quite a significant reduction last year from 1,600 to 1,200. And kind of what we saw as a result of that, we did see our buck doe ratio jump back up uh, quite a bit. You see, we had some low years, those 17, 18 fawn years on the orange line from the drought that year, that bad drought. But we've seen the, we've seen our fawn doe ratios jump back up fairly good, 50. It's not compared to the rest of the state, but uh, for that unit, that's back up better than what we've seen. Um, our buck doe ratio is quite a bit above objective. Uh, we're currently at 22. The three-year uh, average is also above at seven or 19. And so what we'd like to recommend this year is a 200 permit increase uh, to go back to, uh, or to go to 1400 permits. And I'll go back one slide to show that um, on permits, that's still lower than what we had in 2019. But we feel like with the, with the increased buck doe ratio that we're above objective, that there's some opportunity to have some more permits on that unit. Our limiting factors on the LaSalle's is, uh, like I showed, the consecutive years of low fawn production and survival. Uh, we've seen the effects of long-term drought down here. The LaSalle also has the highest prevalence of chronic wasting disease in the state. We've seen it increase over the years. Um, and so we're quite concerned about that unit in terms of chronic wasting disease. We did also see uh, some high line predation on the radio collars that we put on adults last year. So some of the work we're gonna be doing is, is we wanna monitor these new radios to, to look at that more closely, look at adult survival and see what's happening with adult survival on this unit. This has a predator management plan implemented with an unlimited cougar quota. Uh, and we've got, we've done quite a bit in, of intensive monitoring for chronic wasting disease uh, to see that unit and watch track that unit, see what's happening with that unit. 
We've completed some WRI projects uh, on 18,000 acres, and we're currently proposed on about 53,000 acres on that unit. So the next unit is the San Juan of Ajo Mountains, and this is one our other survival unit, uh, the Mantide being one, and this one's the other survival unit for the region. Uh, we've seen the population increase after a two-year decline, um, and it, 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 we've had the study on this unit actually since 2010 with our VHF callers, and then we put GPS callers on uh, 2015. Uh, we have we had extremely low fawn production in 2018 and 19, and our adult survival was high in 19, uh, 1920 and good so far this year. And we had a pretty good year in 2019. We saw a lot of things come back up. And so it makes sense that we see, uh, we see the lowest percentage of body fat in 2017 and 18, which correlates with our low fawn production and survival. And it was highest, our body fat was highest in 19, and then we had high bond survival and production in 20. So the other thing about this unit is it was changed to an 18 to 20 unit buck to doe ratio in 2020. And this shows the population trend on this unit. It shows that in 2017, actually, before we, uh, before we got into really dry years, we were pretty close to our objective. Um, and this was one that we did not change the objective. We reduced some of the other objectives on, our, on some of our other units because we just had not reached those objectives for 10 to 20 years. And this one, we had been close, but then the drought hit and you see we dropped, our population dropped to back down. And we come back up this past year a little bit. Uh, we were increasing permits on this unit as our population increased. We also saw our buck doe ratio increase, and it was above objective. So we were had increased permits. Uh, but when we went to the 1820, we also reduced permits by 700 in 2020. And this shows the fawn doe ratios on the orange line, how they dropped in 2018, but they've come back up. And then if you can see the unit, you can see that uh, the dotted line is where we changed uh, our buck doe ratio and our buck doe ratio came up last year with our reduction in permits. Um, and with that better bond production, we actually project the, the uh, buck doe ratio to stay high. Uh, we feel like it's actually gonna be higher and that we can actually have a permit increase of 150 permits on this unit. Uh, which was our recommendation last year in 2020. And I'll go back to that one to show a little better. We went from 2750 down to 2050, and we're just asking uh, for an increase of 150 on that unit just to give a little more opportunity with that higher buck doe ratio and higher fawn production. On this unit, the limiting factors are those consecutive years of low pond production and survival. Uh, you know, we have been in long-term droughts. So we've seen that as well. We do have some winter ranges and Kent presented or uh, showed some of those that are in poor condition. Uh, it's been a long-term uh, process of these some of these winter ranges. And then all of a sudden you see uh, one blink out or you see a large die off of sagebrush. And we have seen that on some of our winter ranges down here. And I primarily related to drought. Uh, one of the other issues we've had is this unit has a has had a high amount of highway mortality, especially on a migration route between Monticello and Blanding. And, and uh, we've done some work there. We do have some private land depredation on this unit. Uh, it varies when it's when it's dry. We see a lot more of it. Uh, also, this unit is adjacent to the LaSalle, so we are concerned about uh, chronic wasting disease. It is positive, but not does not have the high prevalence that the LaSalle has at this time. Uh, the current work I mentioned on the on the uh, migration route is that we 
done they've done quite a bit of highway fencing. UDOT has uh, and fenced a good portion of the the, uh, the road between Monticello and Blanding. It has cut down on quite a bit of uh, of highway mortality. We didn't see it at first because it took a while for the end for the deer to learn to use the tunnels. They were finding their ways through the some of the crossings or the open gates, and so it took a while, but but now it seems to have decreased uh, our highway mortality on that unit. I don't have any numbers. We haven't got those uh, yet, but uh, but I have been told that it has decreased highway mortality significantly. Um, we have quite a few WRI projects. Uh, we implemented on 14,000 acres, and we have proposed projects on 53,000 acres on this unit. Uh, and they, and I think that may include Elk Ridge portion of the unit as well. Uh, one of the other things we've done working with USU is they've worked on a winter range soil study uh, to look at uh, sagebrush and you know how it how well it does in different soil types uh, because we we tried implementing uh, when we lost some winter range in Deep Basin several years ago some uh, uh, sagebrush planting projects. And we had varied amounts of success. Uh, some of them, they looked pretty good initially, but then the drought hit and they, there was very low survival of some of those. And so we've been kind of anticipating the results of this soil study to uh, hopefully when we do some of these projects and go out on these winter ranges and try and uh, reestablish sagebrush that we'll pick the best sites for that. Uh, rehab work and, and have better success. Uh, and we do, along with the LaSalle's, we do monitor this unit for chronic wasting disease. The other unit, which is part of the San Juan unit is, uh, but it's a limited entry unit and it's managed for uh, 25 to 35 bucks for hundred dollars. Um, it's deer population is stable after a long-term decline. It has it's declined for quite a bit up until uh, a few years ago, but it's primarily from long-term low fawn production on this unit. It's part of the survival study unit, but we have, because the deer population is so much smaller, we have a lot fewer callers on that unit. Um, so, it, but we do, we do try and monitor that unit the best we can. And this shows our decline in population. Uh, it shows where we've been over the past 10 years with our population. Uh, the permits on the bottom line have been stable since it's a limited, uh, limited entry unit. It's, we've had about 60 permits over the last, 50 to 60 permits over the last 10 years. Um, and one thing I, I kind of want to point out with this slide is, is that in 2013, you know, we, is basically when we started getting a, a lot better information on these units in terms of survival uh, data. And we also switched models. We used a better model that we could use that had better data. And, and I don't know how much of that was attributed to that, that change in that population. It wasn't all just a population decline that severe. I think some of it was just a change in the model that we use. And I think this is a much better model. So we now have better data going into it. We have a better idea of what our population is there and the trend on that unit. And this shows what's happening uh, with buck doe ratios and fawn doe ratios. And you can see our fawn doe ratios are quite low on that unit. When we get up to 50, that's a that's a high and we, we all celebrate. Um, but we, we did get up to 50 this past year, but it has been in the 30s and even in the 20s in some years on our fawn doe ratios, and that's terribly low. Um, and so our buck doe ratios kind of go up and down, but they're, they're, gen, they're above objective currently. Uh, the three-year average is uh, also above objective. So we, um, I guess the other thing I ought to say about this is a little bit of caution is that you see this variability when we have lower density units in our sample sizes when we classify are smaller. The bigger units with a lot more deer, these lines are a lot more smoothed out because we have lar larger sample sizes. And on these limited entry units with, with 
lower numbers of deer, you see this variation in that. But but basically, the trend has been above our buck doe ratio objective. So for this next year, we're going to recommend an increase of five permits on that unit. We also monitor the age of the bucks on this unit. Uh, the three-year average has stayed pretty good at 4.7 years old of the harvested bucks on this unit. The limiting factors on Elk Ridge are similar to the other units all these years, and it's been probably more so on this unit in terms of low fawn production and survival uh, and related to the drought. It does have limited summer range and it's generally drier on the summer range on the Elk Ridge Plateau. And as I mentioned, we had some, uh, some significant loss of winter range in that beef basin area on this unit. The work that we've tried to do with it is uh, we actually, with the limited summer range, the Forest Service has done quite a few aspen exclosures up on the mountain to try and reach, get aspen stands back in part of the picture up there. Uh, this picture is actually on the Dark Canyon Plateau area where they reached the BLM recently completed a project out there, which I think is going to be helpful. It's adjacent to Beef Basin. Uh, so, and it looks really good and hopefully that will help on that, on that unit. Uh, or we've completed about 7,300 acres of project. Uh, we've got proposed for 49,300 on that unit. So we're doing work both summer and winter range on that unit to see if we can help this deer herd when, when those conditions come about, that we'll be, we'll be in good shape for that. Um, and I mentioned the soil study on the Abajos, uh, and that will be very important on this unit as well. The next unit I want to talk about is the Henry Mountains, and it's the unit that managed at 40 to 50 bucks per hundred does. <clears throat> the deer population has been declining on that unit over the past five years. Um, we used survival data from the San Juan until 2016. Uh, and in 2016, we found fawn survival was higher and adult survival was slightly higher than the San Juan. Our permit numbers and harvest has remained the same for the past 10 years. And this shows the, what's happening with the population. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, we, uh, they're not 2000, uh, it's at 2000, sorry. The population objective is at 2000, was at 2000. And then the population peaked in 2015 and we raised the objective, uh, thinking that this was gonna continue. And as soon as we did that, things went the other way, it started to decline. And uh, so our current estimate there is now at 900 deer. And our, our permit numbers for that unit have been consistent. They're set by the management plan, uh, the statewide deer management plan. So we don't increase permits unless we reach one of these other objectives I'll talk about. Uh, this has another line added to it, but uh, you'll just see with the, the orange line is the fawn production. When we saw that population go down, of course, we see fawn production drop off, which probably is what, you know, why the population has declined. Um, and then the, uh, the gray line is the buck doe ratio. And we've seen that decline as well and to where it's below objective on our buck doe ratio. Our buck doe ratio uh, is 37 on our three year average. And I think it was 31 last year. So we've seen that decline. But that other line that I added to this graph, which is the blue line, shows okay. the percent of bucks harvested that are over older than five years old. And that dotted line also represents that objective. As long as it were above 40% on, uh, on our bucks older than five harvested, we're within the management plan objectives for that. So our recommend, well, and let me say first that our average age on that has stayed fairly stable. It's still at about 5.2 years on the age of the bucks harvested on that unit. So our recommendation for this next year is gonna be the same number of 
uh, premium limited entry tags, but we're we're going to recommend no tags for the uh, management hut. So that will be a decrease of, of permits on that unit with no management hut. Uh, same old story, declining pond production and range conditions due to long-term drought. It, the Henry's does have limited summer habitat and our adult survival has shown a slight declining trend in the past few years. Uh, there's been some work in water development on this. There's a couple projects, the Tarantula, Mesa Well, and there's a project designed to develop mud springs so we can develop some water, more water on the summer range. And, uh, and I believe Wade's on the line if we want to talk any more about the specifics of these projects, we can talk to Wade about that. We have completed projects on 1,900 acres and we, we have a current proposals to remove about 500 to 1,000 acres of pinion juniper. The next two units are units that we basically sh either share uh, or, or is just a sub uh, unit or a winter range portion. The, the Dolores Triangle is just the winter range portion of a unit in Colorado, the unit 40. Uh, it's not the whole winter range either, it's just a portion of the winter range. And our population numbers on that unit are based on Colorado's models. Uh, our current population estimates uh, 1,900 deer on that unit. The trends on these on this unit have been similar to the other southern units that we have. We have a small number of permits, and our harvest and our buck doe ratio is pretty stable. Uh, I didn't include the population graph because, like I said, it's based on the Colorado model, uh, but there has been a decline in that population. Um, and you can see the buck doe ratio has been, for the most part, above objective in recent years. Um, so it's it's fairly stable unit. The average age of the buck on that unit is four years old, and and our current objective is uh, our three year average anyway is at 31. So it's within the the buck doe ratio objective. So we're recommending the same number of permits that we had for the last however many years, 20 permits. Let me go back and say one thing about the triangle as well too. We have seen in the Utah portion of that unit, we did see several years ago, we saw a decline in the, the uh, die off, a sagebrush die off in that portion of the unit. And, uh, and basically lost the capacity to, uh, winter as many deer. And then more recently, there was a fire, a big fire in the triangle and it burned a bunch of sagebrush up as well. So the triangle doesn't have the capacity that it once had just because it doesn't have the amount of winter range that it had. Um, so that's probably uh, part of the reason for the decline. And, and we did lower our objective on this unit. The other unit we have is part of the the South Book Cliffs, and that's uh, the northeastern region. DAC. Any questions? The biologists are here and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Guy, Wade? Uh, guy, just curious, what are you? Uh, what do you attribute your adult mortality to out on the Henrys? I um, mean, we're losing fawns as well as, as uh, adults out there. What's your predator situation like? Um, I have to look here and see. Maybe Wade can answer that better than I can. Wade, you want to jump in? Yeah. Can uh, Can you hear me? You're good, Wade. Okay. So, uh, um, so it's, it's, I don't have the figures right now, but, um, um, but it's kind of a balance between cougars and, 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 and coyotes. Um, we're not seeing, um, you know, like on the South Manti, we're not, we're not seeing the, uh, the top down pressure 
um, there on the Henrys. So. Yeah, my it, just looking at it, I mean, the last five years we've lost 60, over 60 percent of the adults. And certainly a lot of that's going to be attributed to recruitment and, and uh, habitat drought. And we just don't have right. that placement from the fawns. But it seems like we're losing an enormous amount of adults at that same time. Uh, that's that's pretty significant. I knew those numbers were dropping. I didn't realize we'd gone from 2,400 to 900. That's, uh, that's, that's enormous. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and part of that is, um, is a change in the model. Uh, the model was had been overestimating um, the population and so um, that that is a lot of the uh, a lot of that so oh, that makes sense thanks for that you bet hey, um, on the south manti you know for several years we we've talked about it being um, a concern and, and maybe um, not representative of what's happening on the on the north manti and you talked a little bit about the color data in the study, but just wonder if you can talk about the South Manti as a whole, um, some of the things that we can do there um, to, to be able to address the issue of continuing to kind of be in the hole with our, our deer herds. Um, yeah, I, I can I can say there that, you know, uh, and maybe Brad can add more weight, either one to this, but, you know, we've seen over the years, we've seen high uh, body condition, uh, good levels of, of body fat. In fact, last year was the highest that we've had. It was down this past year, uh, but it generally has high body condition on that unit, which which means that, you know, we're, we're not at or above carrying capacity, uh, but yet we see that low adult survival and the, the specific causes of mortality have been largely lions, um, as I showed in one slide. In fact, this past year, uh, of the 11 adult mortalities that we had, uh, eight of them were attributed to lions. So, so it's, it's one of those that we, it's, we're actually seeing, this data has, able, or has allowed us to see that what, what the real uh, pressure is going on or what's happening on that unit. And so we've been able to address that by going from uh, limited entry cougar status to, uh, to the uh, unlimited quota on that unit. And then you saw we had a, a quite higher, uh, higher harvest of cougars. Um, I don't know, Brad or Wade, either one of you would like to add anything to that, what you're seeing on the Manti? Well, they, if they jump on, I'll, I'll just um, do a second question. So you talked about the, as a whole on the unit, the 75 lions removed. Just wondering in that quick a time, if you're, if you're on the collar data, starting to see that uh, affect the um, adult survival. Um, but, uh, but kind of what you look that we need to do moving forward on this unit. Yeah, so uh, this is Wade again, and and um, yeah, we're seeing a, a definite uh, decline in in uh, um, adult mortality um, uh, so far um, this this winter. Um, you know, we have a hundred percent survival so far on the South Manti, and you know, we'll we'll see if uh, if that trend continues next year. Um, with the uh, with the cougar harvest so um as far as you know looking ahead on on what we can do on the manta i mean so much has been done um as you know kevin uh with the uh all the extensive habitat work on the forest and then um uh, uh recent work on on the lower benches on the south manti to remove pinion juniper um it really uh um, I, I, I think if we get more uh, precipitation, um, we're going to see uh, deer numbers in, improve um, if our, uh, you know, predation levels continue and, and we, 
we uh, we hold down that that pressure, I think the, these deer will will respond. Um, I think you know we've we've talked about um, uh, repairing ponds um, on the uh, transitional ranges, uh, um, maybe providing some 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 water in those those areas, and that might help. Um, so I think uh, with the recent fires and 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 hopefully uh, more fires in areas that uh, it'll it'll uh, be productive to help the deer herds. So that that's kind of my thoughts. I don't know if Brad ha or Brad has anything on his end, but um, on the South Manti, that's what I would uh, look at. I. <laughs> But I was just going to say, I don't mean, go ahead, Brad, but I was going to say Rusty is on as well and can talk about the west side a little bit if you'd like. So go ahead, Brad. Yeah, that, that, that might be handy. Um, uh, yeah, just in, it, you know, the Manti is a weird unit where it's right in the middle of the state where we um, we, we tend to be kind of uh, right in the middle on all, all our uh, survival um, metrics and, and production metrics. We were not susceptible to the heavy winter losses that you are in Northern Utah, nor the extreme drought that you get in Southern Utah. So it, it just tends to go middle of the road on a lot of things um, with the exception of this uh, exceptional, exceptionally high cougar mortality, you know, on, on adults, particularly on the South end of the Manti. So uh, all this uh, increased cougar harvest yeah, should help. I hope we'll see. Rusty, you want to add anything? Yeah, thanks, Kai. Thanks, Brad. Uh, one interesting trend that we noticed actually a couple of years ago when we increased cougar permits on the south end was that we saw a market increase in adult adult doe survival for for one year, and then uh, the next year uh, it kind of dipped right back down. And the, the corresponding trend with the cougar population is that. Um, <clears throat> when we really increased permits, we saw a big jump in female harvest. And then the next year, uh, with the, with the tag still pretty high up, we saw, at least on the Southwest side, we saw 94% male harvest. And so it was kind of interesting to note that, that when we really got after the lions, um, there was this source sink dynamic where a bunch of young males kind of filtered back into those home ranges. And so I think, um, I think we're taking the right approach on the South Manti is pre being pretty aggressive with cougars, but I think it's got to be sustained over two or three years um, until those, those sinks stop filling up so quickly. But we fully expect uh, to see a, a, a jump in survival. And we've already been working with the forest service on the West side um, to try to take on a big high elevation summer range project, basically from Fairview Canyon to, to 12 mile. And I think at some point, if we can get those, those survival rates up high enough, then we're going to be like all these other units where we're then we're up against a nutritional carrying capacity. And so um, hopefully these these uh, summer habitat treatments will will help uh, when we get there eventually. Um, Rusty, I might I jump in real quick on, on the Manti. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, the Manti is a unit where we always struggled to get you know, we recommended higher quotas and, and and had those quotas reduced when they went through the public process. And now that we've been able to to put this under predator management, we've seen a couple of things. One is we're we're get we've exceeded the quotas that we've had in place last year by about five lions. But in the past we have the success rates have been lower. So uh so that's been good and, and we hope to see some response in the deer herd uh from those those changes. Rusty, I was just going to add that I appreciate you talking about what that looked like when you removed those lions and maybe that filling in the next year with the sink. And it'll be interesting as you guys analyze the, the 75 lions this year, what those age classes of lions are. And like you say, what that may look look like and, and what the need to sustain that in the next year or two will be. It'll be interesting to, to have you guys follow up with us and help us understand what Anything else for Guy?
Okay, well, thank you. No more questions for Guy, then we'll go right to Rusty Robinson. Are you there, Rusty? I'm here, just getting it pulled up. Okay. All right, you able to see and hear me there? Yes, sir. You look good, Rusty. Thanks. I got tired of people putting their spare change in my drink cup. They said I looked homeless, so cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, I'll be presenting on the central region deer units. I appreciate uh, the southeastern region tackling the Manti portion of it. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're we're doing a lot of work on the West Manti as well. And so if you have any specific questions at the end, we can answer those. Um, along with the other units, we've got our, our biologists on board that can answer those. Starting with the Central Mountains Nebo unit. Uh, last year, we, we lowered that population objective to 14,000 to a more realistic number. Uh, we're currently at 12,500 as an estimate which is a little bit down from previous years. We have a five-year average of 82% adult survival on that unit and an average of 58% fawn survival. Here's a look at the population trend over time. The orange line there is the, the population objective, uh, at least the current objective. And uh, the blue line is the, the current population estimate. Again, you can see it took a little, little dip this year, just, just under 14,000, but we, we tend to hover right around that line. <clears throat> we managed for 15 to 17 bucks per hundred does on this unit. And for the last five or six years, we've been right into that range. Uh, we, we took an, uh, a dip down to 12.2 this year. Uh, I think there's some, some reasons for that. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, because of that little dip, we're recommending a decrease of 300 permits from 4,100 to 3,800 this year. Uh, we generally have a very stable buck to doe ratio on that unit. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we came up with 12.2 this year. I think uh, that was a combination of, of a couple different things, but uh, the, the unit's kind of unique to where the north Nebo has the, the bulk of the deer uh, it typically has a higher buck to doe ratio. And then the south Nebo, the sand pitch, um, tends to have a, a lower buck to doe ratio and, and a lower population of deer. Uh, this year, we didn't really get the snow conditions to really count any concentrations of deer on the north Nebo. Um, and so a lot of our counts came from the, the sand pitch and uh, Fountain Green, Moroni Hills area where we typically see a lower buck to doe ratio anyway. Um, but we didn't have the numbers on the north to kind of average that out. So, but to be fair to the management plan and to be conservative, we're still recommending a, a cut. And we anticipate um, our, our projected buck to doe ratio for next year's hunt is, is projected to be right back in the range of 15 to 17. Uh, the Nebo geographically is kind of in a climatic sweet spot, so to speak. Uh, we don't see the, the wild swings in the population. We don't see the, the wild effects of drought like we do in the southern region, and we don't see the, the really bad winter effects like we do in the northern region. Um, it, it's kind of uh, steady as we go on these units, which really lends themselves to, to fit right in that general season unit model where they're, they're fairly predictable. They have relatively high populations of deer and, and hunters that, that bank on hunting those units every year are typically able to, or every other year, typically able to do so. We don't get the, the really wild swings in population or buck permits. Um, drought can be a factor a, a little bit. Um, I would say we're in fair body condition currently on the unit. Uh, we're typically not super high, but not super low. Again, we're kind of right in that sweet spot. If there's any kind of limiting factor, it's, it's uh, just a nutritional carrying capacity. And again, I don't think we're, we're right up against it. Uh, we maybe have a little bit of room to grow. Um, but when the, when the population does get higher, we tend to see those declines in body score. 
uh, we, we can get slightly low fond to dough ratios, uh, low, low to mid 50s, um, which is, again, not crazy low, but it, it, it indicates there's probably some sort of predator component going on where those fawns are being taken from zero to six months. Um, so when we count them in the fall, we typically get, uh, not typically, but some years we get 53, 54 fawns per hundred does. I should know that currently we're in a predator management plan on the Nebo West Face unit, and that's uh, uh, corresponding with bighorn sheep on that unit, but um, that predator management plan is in place. Current work, uh, we're doing a lot of work on the Nebo. Uh, it can be winter range limited a little bit in some places. We've, we've gone in Santaquin Bench and Mona Bench and planted a lot of shrubs over the last couple of years down by Levan as well. Um, so we've done over 10,000 shrubs in the past two years and we plan to do 10,000 per year moving forward. And that's to try to combat some of the, the cheap grass encroachment and really get some winter browse reestablished on some of those, those big winter ranges. Um, 2018, we had a big fire on the Nebo, which has been fantastic for deer and elk as far as um, putting some nutrition uh, back on the mountain. I also think that it creates a little bit of a buffer in drought years. It seems, to, it seems like when everything else is dry, you can go in those burns and there'll still be some, some green vegetation. Uh, but we went in after 2018 and did some large scale reseeding, both in high elevation summer and low elevation winter ranges to try to get that, that forage reestablished. We are proposing a, a GPS collar project on the Mona Bench as part of the migration initiative. And we're gonna try to collar 30 deer on both sides of, of I-15. There's some crossing over there where Nebo deer are going to that uh, long ridge and back and forth. So to try to get a, a better idea of those migration routes and while we're at it, collect some biological data. We've also done some water development. Uh, we had seven or eight guzzlers on top of Lofer Mountain that were in pretty poor shape. Uh, the last couple of years, we've got those back in uh, operational and we put out some new, some new guzzlers on Morona Hills and the east side of the Nebo, a couple other spots. Moving on to the Wasatch West unit. Again, this is another uh, general season deer unit with pretty, pretty stable population. Our objective is 22,600. We're currently at 20,600 with a five-year average of 82% for adult survival and 58 for fawn survival. See the population trend there. We, we tend to hover right around the objective uh, with a, a slight dip this past year. Again, we managed for 15 to 17 bucks per hundred does on this unit, and we've been right in that range for the last six years. This year, we're recommending no change in, in buck permits with a total of 8,100. Uh, again, very stable buck to doe ratio, 15.6 um, bucks per hundred does for this year. A three-year average is 15.9, and, and our projected ratio for, for next year would be uh, 15.3 with average success. Similar to the Nebo, this is kind of in that, that climatic sweet spot. Um, maybe maybe uh, have some summer range that, that could be treated and maybe expand that or raise that nutritional carrying capacity a little bit. Uh, like anywhere, we can see the effects of drought. We're kind of in fair body condition this, this year currently, but we've been... Um, kind of that way for a while. Slightly low fawn to doe ratios in the fall indicating a predator component similar to the Nebo. And, and development seems to always be an issue on the Wasatch as uh, we get a lot of urban sprawl and uh, looks like Wallsburg is starting to be developed a little more and, and things like that. So we're always mindful of that and, and uh, it's always an issue. Uh, current work, we've done some aspen regeneration near Strawberry Reservoir. We've been uh, working with the Forest Service and just kind of some preliminary conversations about some high elevation aspen regeneration work on Strawberry Ridge. And this will be several thousand acres over the next few years uh, if everything uh, goes accordingly. Uh, this is where our deer collar projects are, are invaluable, where we can look at individual deer and see where they go to summer 
and then we can we can hike up there with the forest service and and look at the area and say okay this is where this doe was hanging out but what does this look like why are they here let's try to make everything else look like this and we're planning on doing that this spring with the forest service um and really try to try to tackle some some high elevation conifers and things like that and and uh make it make the summer range uh better for for fawning and and all that other stuff we've done some stream restoration try to widen some of those stream banks create some better riparian zones uh some prescribed fires we've had some fires on some of our wmas uh temp wma and and wallsburg and we've gone on and we've gone in and planted shrubs done some some seeding and and fire rehabilitation and some invasive weed work in parley's canyon The Oker Stansbury unit, the population objective there is 11,600. We're currently at 10,000 uh, with an average of 74% adult survival and 50% fawn survival. There's a look at the population trend over time. You can see we took a, uh, a pretty big dip in 2019 and then it, it came back a little bit this, this current year. Buck to doe ratio is kind of all over the place in this unit. Um, like Guy mentioned, you get these units with kind of uh, low sample sizes and, and the wild uh, drought cycles and things like that. The buck to doe ratio can kind of go back and forth. We're typical, or right now we're actually above our objective at around 22 bucks per hundred does. We took a pretty big cut in permits uh, last year. And so we're actually recommending um, an increase of 300 this year and that's because of the 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 jump in bucks uh jump in buck ratio and the jump in the population again the buck deer ratio is pretty unstable um we have three-year average of 19.3 bucks per hundred does and our projected ratio for 2022 is 17.1 Limiting factors on this unit, um, different than what I've mentioned already. These are the Oker Stansburys and the next units I'll mention, the Vernon, the West Desert. They're, they're summer range limited. And yeah, the, the Oker Stansbury has some high peaks, but they're kind of just that. They're, 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 they're pretty steep. There's not a lot of, of summer range to really sustain these deer and really fatten them up coming into to winter. So as a result, they're, they're pretty sensitive to drought cycles. We see boom and bust years where uh, it, a couple of years ago, we went from 18% fawn survival one year to 81% uh, the next year. So we get pretty wild swings. And in those bust years, especially cougar predation can be additive. Uh, I think it's gotten better on the Stansbury with the reestablishment of bighorn sheep and, and some of the collaring work we've done with deer. We've really identified some of the cougar issues and, and gotten more aggressive with cougars. It's still an issue on the okers where we have different land ownership components that uh, don't lend itself to, to really uh, high cougar harvest. Current work, as I mentioned, aggressive cougar strategies, Stansbury Mountains is in predator management. The Oakers are a split unit. We've done a lot of shrub restoration. Um, we're, we're beginning a project on the, the west side of the Stansburys. Um, we've already removed thousands of acres on the east east side of the Stansburys. We removed 2,000 acres of PJ near Cedar Fort, and this has really kind of expanded um, where the deer can go, and we've had fewer vehicle collisions on the highway there. Uh, we've collared a lot of deer to identify migration routes and obtain biological data, especially uh, deer that go from that migrate from the Okers south to the Tinnock. And We've, we've worked with Eagle Mountain to identify and preserve migration corridors. That's kind of been a cool success story where now Eagle Mountain has uh, included the, the uh, migration corridors and open spaces into their city planning. We've had some initial conversations with the community of Fairfield as well, where they're, they want to jump on board and, and uh, start implementing those, those city plans as well. We've worked with UDOT on crossing sensors, and we've done quite a few water developments on those units. The Vernon unit, 
population objective there is, is 2,200. This is the only limited entry deer unit we have in the region. Our current estimate is, is 2,300. We have uh, average adult survival of 76% and 43% for fawn survival. We get uh, relatively wild swings over time on this unit as well, uh, and due to drought and other conditions. See, we were over objective for quite a few years. Um, we're, we're starting to get right at where we're, we're just above it, as we've seen these last last uh, last year of drought, especially. Buck to doe ratio for this unit is 25 to 35. We're currently slightly over that. We're recommending 230 buck permits, which is no change from last year. Um, the buck doe ratio is relatively stable. Um, and I say the population is relatively stable as well, but if you think of it as percentage-based, if you go from 2,000 to 2,500, that's that's kind of a big percentage. So, so relatively stable, but we do see some wild swings um, due to climatic events. Again, this unit summer range limited, it's sensitive to drought cycles. We get swings in fawn survival, kind of like the Oakers and Stansbury's. And we get occasional years with slightly low fawn to doe ratios in the fall, indicating a potential predator component. In this case, um, likely coyotes. One of the things we've done on this unit is we've added the Vernon to the, uh, the coyote control list for wildlife services to fly, and we've removed some, some coyotes up there. Again, we've we've done a lot of pinion juniper work to restore shrub land for big game winter range. Uh, we've we've really tried to enhance riparian areas to kind of slow water runoff and widen those those stream banks. Uh, we've done some cheat grass work and and shrub work in burned areas, and we've collared a lot of deer in that country to to identify migration routes and and other biological data. The next couple of units I I combined into in, into one because they're both really unique. Uh, the West Desert West and the West Desert, West Desert Tinnick units are really kind of strange units. Um, the population objective for the entire West Desert is 11,200, but the current estimate uh, is unknown. We, we have a better handle on the Vernon, but not the Tinnick and the, the West Desert West. There's some, some reasons for that that I'll get into. Uh, we're recommending 900 permits for the Tinnick, which is no change from last year, and 500 for the, the West unit, which is a decrease of 100. And as I mentioned, these are kind of, these are very migratory units and they're low density units. So when we go to classify in the, in the fall, we're really not classifying um, resident deer. We can't get any deer in any kind of real numbers until end of November, December, and then we're really counting deer from other units. We get a lot of migration, uh, particularly on the Tinnock unit. We'll get a lot of deer from the Oakers that migrate straight south, end up on the Tinnock. And so we can go up on Lake Mountain and count 150 deer in the morning and make ourselves feel good, but it's really not representative of what's available during the hunts on that unit. So, uh, Kind of what we do is we use hunter success. We use you know what we think is going on on surrounding units and and drought conditions as kind of a gauge. Um, and then we we typically keep permits relatively stable. And hunter success is 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 very low on these units. We we're not harvesting a lot of bucks, but they're just they're just kind of there and they're unique and they're low density. Um, but they really have kind of unlimited winter range, and so we see a lot of migration into these units. Again, summer range limited, they're sensitive to drought cycles. Uh, cougar predation is likely an issue on the deep creeks, similar to the um, Oker Stansberries. And I, and I don't want to speculate too much because we don't have a lot of data from the deep creeks, um, but probably something like drought knocked deer down initially on the deep creeks, and then um, cougars are probably knocking off the high peaks of those cycles where we don't see the deer numbers come back. Even on even on good years, and so moving forward, we'd like to get a little more data out there and really see what's going on and try to get a handle on that. We're beginning a, a multi-thousand-acre winter range project on the west side of the the Deep Creeks by Ibapaw. 
We've installed a lot of guzzlers on the Tinnick in recent years, and um, we're planning on doing eight more this year. Uh, we've worked extensively with the Migration Initiative to preserve the migration corridor from the Oakers through Eagle Mountain. Um, we've, we've built a highway fence this year, and now we're working with UDOT to install sensors to, uh, to help develop a safe crossing area there. And again, we've put out a lot of deer collars in the part of this work. That's all I have with that. I'll take any questions. Any questions from the board? Rusty, you, you talked about, uh, really appreciate, um, you reached out to the Forest Service on the Manti side and kind of was able with the data that you have with the callers to say, hey, these are some areas that we need to um, focus on. And I, I just want to highlight that, that, uh, you know, the, the federal biologists don't, don't see that data. And so I, the importance of each of the biologists to reach out throughout the state, um, reach out to those federal biologists and show what, what you're seeing and say, hey, these are the areas we'd like you to focus. The, um, I think statewide, there's going to be a um, prescribed fire NEPA that's going to allow them to go in and do prescribed fire. And I think that this data that you have will really help them to say, hey, we need to, to focus on those areas and, and do some work. And so just continue to encourage that and appreciate you doing that with us here. Well, we, we appreciate the partnership, Kevin, and the Forest Service has been great to work with. And and. It should be noted they actually initiated a lot of these high elevation projects and we've said awesome well we've got some data that can really zero in on on where to focus on and so that's been a, a good partnership thank you but rusty this is carl the unit i hear the most about is nebo um i mean it it, it didn't look like it was doing too bad i mean you're recommending a drop in permits and and the people that are talking to me are recommending a lot more, but at, at fourteen thousand and and then twelve five, we're not. It looks a lot better than some of the other units. It, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, and it, it should be noted, Carl, and and just to be totally transparent, that that we don't have we have some colors on the Nebo, but not a ton. Um, as Kent and others have mentioned, we have core units that we we uh, gather data on that are they're kind of serve as surrogate units. So a lot of our survival data comes off the Wasatch and the North Manti. Um, and, and I'll agree with you. I think there's been some localized issues on the Nebo. Um, I think in, in 2018, when we had that fire, I think the deer that lived in that, that fire and were kind of displaced, they didn't do as great in the winter. And it, we've had, I think, some, some winter mortality, specifically on that Northeast end. Um, but I think since then, the deer have, have, have done really well. Um, but deer aren't like elk as much where elk will flood into those burn zones and they'll really, really take advantage of it and do well. I think deer, it only matters to the deer that live in the burn. And so, so I think the deer that live in the burn are doing fantastic. The ones that don't are just kind of, um, par for the course. Uh, but, but. I, I hear the same things. I, I know there's there's been some um, some questions about decline in quality and things like that. And at the end of the day, you know, we'll see we'll see how this decrease in permit pans out. If we come back next year and we classify way high, we know it was an, an anomaly. And if we if we don't, then we'll know there's really something going on, and the buck to doe ratios are really are that low. I was going to say that's the scary part: the buck to doe ratio on that unit. So yeah. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Rusty? I see Dax, are you ready Dax? Thanks Rusty for your presentation. You. Are you loading up Dax? Dax, you need to turn on your microphone. Your microphone.
Can you hear me, Dax? Your microphone is blocked. He may have to sign off and back on to clear that up. Okay, can you can you hear me now? You're good to go, Dax. Thank you. I'm sorry, something happened. Tested it early and it worked, but it, it technology or something. So you're good. Okay. Can you see see my presentation? Yes, you're good. Okay. All right, we'll get going. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Dax Mangus. I'm the Wildlife Program Manager in the Northeastern region, and I'll be talking about our deer units up here in, in this corner of the state for a minute. Um, we have four units. We have more hunts that, than units here, but four general units that we manage, or uh, four units that we manage in our region. The North Slope of the Uinas, the South Slope of the Uinas, the Book Cliffs, and then the Eastern portion of the Wasatch Mountains. And I will uh, throw in just a little bit of information on the anthro subunit of the nine mile unit that, that we also uh, lies within their administrative boundary of our region. Um, what, what I've got are uh, basically some, some tables for each of the units with some key uh, data on them. And I've got one table focused on the population and then another table focused on the on bucks and buck hunting. Um, in this table, that top row is the population objective for the unit. Underneath that is the estimate for the unit. Then uh, below that, the fawn, fawn ratio, fawns per 100 does, adult doe survival, and fawn survival. And on that far column on the far right, those shaded boxes, those boxes are, are anticipated numbers based on you know our modeled modeled population um, with estimated survival data for this for this winter so those are not finalized those are estimates at this point and we took those fact those into consideration when we made recommendations so and I'll, I'll be showing tables like this for each of the units in our region um, on the north slope unit to the north slope of the UN is the objective there is 10,000 our population has been declining and uh, post 2020 estimate 5,800 and based on estimated survival rates um, that we're looking at right now, our fawn survival is fairly low. Um, you know, we're looking at the population is likely to decline again going into next year. Um, I, I've circled here some of the, of the really concerning numbers and this is a, a trend, a pattern that you'll see repeated through units in our region. We had a really uh, tough winter and uh, this unit it is often winter regulated. If we have a hard, hard winter, we have really low fawn survival. And you can see we had fawn survival 18% in 2017, 24% in 2019. And, and when you factor you know, numbers like that, really poor fawn survival, as well as pretty low uh, adult dose survival, you know, adult dose survival in you know, upper 60s, low 70s, th that's what's driving that population and what's pushing us down. Um, our buck to doe ratio, our objective on this unit is 18 to 20. Uh, the bucks per 100 does, we've been about where we're supposed to be right there in that 18 to 20 range for the last several years. But with our anticipated numbers, looking at survival rates and just kind of this trend of poor survival rate and population decline, uh, we're recommending a cut uh, from 2,800 permits to 2,400 permits. And even with that cut, um, it depends a little bit on what success rate might look like next year, but our buck to ratio will probably drop a little bit. Um, with lower deer densities, we usually see you know lower deer numbers. We see lower success, but on this unit, uh, the timing of the rifle season can be really significant as well, and we will have a later rifle hunt this year. So we're guessing a little bit on what kind of success rate we might have with low deer numbers, but better season dates as far as migration timing and success on, on this North Slope unit. The population is declining. Uh, several years of really poor fawn production, poor fawn survival, poor adult doe survival. 
And, uh, you know, it's concerning to us. We look at, you know, what's going on? Why are we having this? This is a unit where we seem to have uh, winter, wintering habitat and winter kill is a limiting factor. Um, winter range degradation has been a big one. We've got a lot of areas in that Brown, Browns Park area and Clay Basin where sagebrush communities have really declined. You know, we saw some photos in some of the other presentations where we had a lot of sagebrush die off. And we've seen that in places like Taylor Flat, which, which is a really important winter range in Browns Park area. Um, uh, predation can be part, can be can uh, contribute to this population decline as well. Um, we are working with the BLM, adjusting some livestock grazing practices in that Taylor Flat area. And then uh, the, there's some in the Clay Basin area, there's some pretty big fires. Last year, the Pigeon Canyon and the Richards Mountain Fire, that's about eight, 9,000 acres. And with the reseeding effort there, you know, we're, we're optimistic that that can do some good. Um, so definitely some challenges there, but you know, some of those larger, acre, larger acreage fire restoration projects and, and uh, could really pay off and, and be beneficial to that deer population. But it is one that's just seemed to have experienced three or four really bad years in a row in the last five or six years. Um, other notes on that unit, just that I meant, like I mentioned earlier, the buck harvest seems to be uh, a really a function of the timing of the rifle hunt a lot of years. So a later rifle hunt um, often means more deer migrated into areas where they're easily accessible by, by sportsmen. Um, that brings us to the south slope of the UNAs. And on the south slope of the UNAs, we've kind of got it divided up a, a few different ways. For a population management, we have it basically divided into two, two halves, kind of the western half of the UNS, which would be the South Slope Yellowstone unit, and then the eastern half of the South Slope of the UNS, which would be the South Slope um, Vernal and Diamond Mountain and Bonanza subunits. And we manage those populations separately. The, the White Rocks River drainage is in between those units and seems to be a pretty significant natural barrier. Um, they, they, the climate conditions, or vary a little bit year to year. So, so we really uh, look at those as two separate populations. And then when it comes to buck hunting in, in, on the South Slope, the South Slope Yellowstone is a standalone general season unit. Then we've got the South Slope Bonanza Vernal, which is also a general season unit. And then the South Slope Diamond Mountain subunit, which is managed as a limited entry uh, unit for deer. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about each of those. Um, from a population standpoint, the South Slope Yellowstone unit um, has been declining. Again, it's it's kind of that same pattern that I pointed out on the other slide, really poor winter survival and, uh, in 2017 and 2019, uh, really poor survival of fawns and, and very low survival on adult does as well in 2019, 47% or, uh, or sorry, very low um, fawn to doe ratios. Um, right now, our preliminary data our, uh, when we captured animals and looked at body conditions, body fat this last December, um, the south slope looked really poor again. So we have some drought related impacts and anticipate that again, we'll have quite low fawn survival on this unit. So um, this is one that's really largely driven by, by winter, uh, winter conditions, but I think um, there's some drought impacts that can complicate that too. Sometimes you kind of get like a one-two punch if we have really bad drought followed by a hard winter. Uh, luckily this year, although we had pretty severe drought conditions, the winter has been fairly mild. So it's not as bad as it could be. Like we had, you know, uh, fawn survival in the teens in 2017. We're anticipating a little better fawn survival, but still quite poor, 35%. Um, buck to doe ratio on the Yellowstone unit has stayed pretty stable. Uh, the objective on that unit is 18 to 20. Um, we've reduced permits a little bit over the last few years just to correspond with reductions in the population and to stay proactive on there so we stay within objective. Um, we anticipate uh, with, with a cut of about 175 permits that we will be right in there in, in that 18 to 20 um, buck to doe ratio. Uh, objective again next year. So that's, we're recommending a, a slight cut just to try to stay ahead of a declining population. Um, on this unit on the South Slope Yellowstone, like I mentioned, it's really been those two, two really bad years of fawn survival that have, that have hurt this and kind of pushed this population down. Um, it, 
it uh, it is a unit that's vulnerable to to severe winters and winter kill. Uh, a lot of the high elevation uh, uh, lands on this unit are thick conifer stands. There's not a lot of disturbance there. There's not a lot of new vegetation, not a lot of vegetative diversity. Um, and then a lot of the winter range is actually on Ute tribal lands, most the, the Ute Indian the Ute Indian tribe. And those reservation lands, they they don't do a lot of active predator management. So predators can can contribute as well. Um, one thing that that I do think is, is positive, a positive outlook for the Yellowstone unit was that East Fork fire that that burned um, in uh, last the summer of twenty. And uh, that fire was, I have it in my notes here, I think it was close to 90,000 acres. And uh, our habitat folks and biologists have been uh, really involved in working with the uh, Forest Service on the rehab there and some reseeding in some key areas. And uh, I think that fire will, will actually do a lot of good. Those higher elevation fires that disturb kind of that summer and transition range tend to do a lot of good. On some of the units, when we do get fires in the lower elevations on the winter ranges, that's a little more scary because there's the risk that that brush component doesn't come back well or that you end up with a lot of cheat grass. But the elevations of, of that uh, East Fork fire on, on the South Slope Yellowstone is something that's pretty positive. So, um, and then just another note, just, <coughs> excuse me, interesting factor on this unit is just that, you know, the bottom third of the unit is, is pretty much all tribal land or private land. And we've kind of got that narrow band um, of forest service where there's some access and where our sportsmen access these deer. And then a lot of the upper uh, elevations of this unit are wilderness and really high country that, that's not super productive and doesn't tend to hold a lot of deer. Um, it's a neat unit, but it's kind of challenging too, just because of uh, wilderness and then, uh, and then uh, land ownership issues in some of the lower elevations. Um, Moving to the South Slope Bonanza Vernal, um, which is also a general season unit. And uh, that's on the east side, uh, east of that White Rocks River, further east across the South Slope. And uh, it's kind of funny, we call it the Bonanza Vernal. Um, we do that because those are the two subunits and, and we do them in alphabetical order. But it's kind of funny, uh, the Bonanza holds very, very few deer. It's really desert country, kind of in between the, the white, where the White River and Green River come together. Uh, there's just a few deer on the Bonanza, but so a lot of times I'll just call it the Vernal unit. If I call it the Vernal unit, I mean the Bonanza Vernal. But um, this unit's pretty stable. It seems to be a little more productive on the South Slope. Uh, typically, we see higher fawn production and higher fawn recruitment on this unit. Uh, the population is declining a little bit. And again, that's that's being driven by, you know, those, those couple bad bad winter years that we had 2017 and 2019, where we had really low fawn production, uh, really low fawn production and survival. Um, again, we anticipate low fawn survival this winter, um, even though it's been a mild winter, but just because everything was in such poor condition due to drought conditions, we really had extreme drought in this part of the state last summer. Um, the population objective there is 13,000. We're currently right around 9,000 and anticipate that that will probably drop a little bit again this next coming year just due to drought conditions. Um, as far as buck hunting on this unit, it is managed um, as a, I'm sorry, I have this incorrect, it's a 15 to 17 unit. It's not an 18 to 20, it's a 15 to 17. And we have been, uh, I have this labeled incorrectly in the table. But our buck to doe ratio has been right there, but the last couple of years it really dropped. And uh, that was those poor years of fawn production catching up to us. Um, we're recommending a cut of about 300 permits. And we anticipate that with, with, even with the low survival, if we have that cut, it'll put us back there in that 15 to 17 range where we're supposed to be. Um, one interesting, interesting thing about this unit is that it has very high success for a general season deer unit. One, one is typically one of the highest uh, success rates in the state for a general season deer unit. Um, then I also have the buck hunting uh, uh, table with the buck hunting information for the South Slope Diamond Mountain Limited Entry Unit. On that unit, the buck to doe ratio is 25 to 35. Uh, we're typically right there. This tends to be more stable. Um, buck, buck to doe ratios, they're mid 30s. Um, uh, we're recommending keeping buck permits the same. Uh, one of the interesting things that you see is when you have a unit like the Vernal that has really high success rates, uh, but those are primarily yearling bucks, the buck to doe ratio can fluctuate a lot more than when you have a limited entry unit where you have 
more diversity in that buck age class. And uh, it tends to be a little more resilient to year to year changes when the majority of your bucks uh, being harvested every year are not yearlings. So Diamond Mountain seems to be pretty stable. On the South Slope Bonanza Diamond Mountain Vernal Complex for population management, as I mentioned, we, met, we manage uh, the population for those units altogether. It's stable, slightly decreasing. Uh, because of those couple poor winter years, but that's kind of normal on this unit. It's not something that's super concerning. Um, we do still have concerns about winter range habitat degradation and, and winter severity. That seems to be the driving factor, factor here. Uh, we're working, we have a lot of projects ongoing, uh, working with the BLM on pinion juniper thinning and treatments on winter ranges to try to address some of those you know, limiting factors. And as I mentioned earlier, lots of access on the vernal unit. It's one of the units where we recommend a slightly different split in permits just because success rate is so high in the rifle hunt. Even last year when we had relatively low success across the state, the vernal unit still had 50 plus percent success for general season hunt. A lot of years it's 70, 70 plus percent success. So we have a slightly different weapon split there to try to facilitate, um, give it a little bit more opportunity um, and then Diamond Mountain, as I mentioned, is performing fairly well. Average buck harvested on Diamond Mountain is a four and a half to five year old, 24 inch four point. So that, that unit seems to be more stable and seems to be performing well with regard to bucks. Um, bring it to the Book Cliffs unit. And Book Cliffs unit is one where we're, we're really facing some major challenges on this unit. Uh, we're seeing impacts across all species. You know, I'll talk pretty specifically to deer today, but it is, uh, it's a unit where we've seen a lot, of, a lot of things happening that are concerning. We've heard a lot of concern from sportsmen, from landowners, from permittees. It's a high priority for the division, for, for our hunters, and, and for our partners. Um, Book Cliffs, uh, the population objective on the unit, 15,000. Um, the... The, uh, we, we lowered that in 2020 after looking at, you know, a 20 plus year history of the unit and what we thought, thought could be a realistic achievable population objective. We lowered that from 15,000 to 9,000. Our current population estimate is about 4,500 deer. And we anticipate with super low fawn survival that we're looking at right now, that we're looking at 3,350 for a, a population next year is projected based on, on current number. Um, now, this unit, uh, you'll notice the pattern is a little bit different. It's not, the, the book cliffs tends to be more regulated by drought conditions than it is by winter conditions. It's a summer range limited unit. There's a lot of, a lot of winter range, but not nearly as much summer range. The book cliffs summer range is a fairly narrow band that kind of runs across the top from east to west. And in some places that summer range band where you have oak brush and, and maybe a few aspen, it is, is maybe only a mile or two wide in a lot of places. That summer range is fairly small, fairly narrow. And, uh, you know, and we see uh, pretty low fawn survival, low fawn production, low fawn survival. We had a couple of years with really low adult doe survival, 64% adult doe survival in 2018. I mean, that, that means we, you know, we lost 36%. We lost over a third of our adult does. And when you take hits like that on a population, it is really hard you know, to, to keep numbers up. And so we're just really seeing the numbers drop. Um, fawn survival right now in the book cliffs is right around 30%. And it's probably still going to go down a little bit before things are, are said and done. So not, not a real pretty picture. As far as buck hunting in the book cliffs, you know, where it's managed as a limited entry unit, 25 to 35 bucks per hundred does. That buck to doe ratio has been right in there in the in the mid 30s. Um, this last year, it came in down just a little bit at 29. Uh, we are recommending a pretty substantial cut in permits from, from 380 last year to 264 this year. And the reason we're doing that is just because that declining population is really starting to catch up with what's out there and what's available. And uh, with that cut, we recommend that we will probably still come in within that 25 to 35 bucks per hundred dollars, but likely we'll come in on the lower end of that. So that's that's the recommendation for, for next year for buck hunting in the book cliff. So I mentioned, you know, this unit tends to be in major decline from 2014 to 2020. The population has dropped from you know 8,600 deer to 4,500 deer. 
Um, and uh, the Wildlife Board in 2018 asked the division to, to form a committee and, and look at this and try to figure out what was going on. And so we formed a book cliffs working group that was comprised of, you know, a real diverse membership. And I'll talk a little bit about, about what's happening with that working group and what, what they've been looking at and doing. Um, we also have extensive GPS collar research going on in the book cliffs, looking at adult doe survival. We've looked at uh, fawn survival as well as neonate survival with the, with the vaginal implant transmitters and collaring brand newborn uh, deer fawns. And uh, in addition to looking at deer, we also have collared lions, collared bears, collared elk, collared bison, collared antelope, you know, pretty much everything out there. We can put a collar on, we put a collar on it, and we're really trying to learn what's going on, what are the limiting factors, and what can we do. Um, when I very first started working in wildlife, this is back in, I think, about 2003, I started working on uh, Deseret Land and Livestock Ranch up in, in northern Utah, Ridge County. And uh, Rick Danvier was my boss when I first started working there. And Rick had been around the block. He'd managed that large ranch for a long time, uh, been really involved in, in the public process, had served on the wildlife board. And Rick was joking around with me one day, and he said, I got to tell you the secret to success in wildlife management. Whenever things are going great, you know, going well, you claim that it's because of your management that they're going well. And if ever anything's not going well, you just blame it on the weather. And if you do that, you know, you're, you're golden. You've got it made for your career. And we, we laughed. It was a funny joke. And unfortunately, there's some truth to that, too. Um, you know, it, it's a funny joke. It's, it's a funny scapegoat to just blame everything on the weather. But, but the truth is that, you know, if we have consistently have, you know, periods of extreme drought and these bad weather patterns, it gets to a point where there really isn't a whole lot we can do. And, and uh, that's kind of the point we're at in the book. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. But I think we've tried to throw just about everything we can at that problem. And at this point, we just we need Mother Nature to chip in and help us out a little bit as well. So I mentioned that the Wildlife Board asked that working group to form to, to see what's going on with deer and elk populations in the book cliffs. That working group had uh, you know uh, representation from the different landowners and permittees, the BLM, uh, state institutional trust lands, the Division of Wildlife, MDF, RMEF, you know, SFW, diverse group of partners and stakeholders. They met and, uh, and, and pretty much went through and brainstormed every single thing they could think of that was going on in the book cliffs and what we could do to make, to make those things better. Um, they put together an action plan in the book cliffs, and I'll bring up a couple of the, of the highlights from the action plan. I guess I call them highlights, but some of them are pretty concerning. Um, we did a forage analysis and we really, we really focused on summer range because we felt like based on really poor body conditions and poor fawn weights, um, that summer range, you know, in that limited amount of summer range, that that was really where a lot of our, our problems were happening. And part of that analysis, we looked at the demand on that summer range versus the production of that summer range. We used a lot of uh, production data from the NRCS, from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. We looked at, you know, allotted grazing and then the numbers of animals. We did a survey and counted, uh, you know, feral horses, wild horses. And we looked at our current uh, wildlife populations in the area. And we found that um, the, the allocated demand for, for forage was over 12,000 AUMs annually off that summer range was what we had between all the different mouths, both domestic and wild and feral. And, and, um, and then we looked at production based on NRCS data and production on that unit varied anywhere from 9,000 to 12,000 AUMs. So 12,000 AUMs was during perfect conditions. If we had, you know, above average precipitation and the timing on it was perfect, you know, we'd produce 12,000 AUMs worth of forage. And that was the annual demand. And we have not had perfect years, hardly ever in there for a long time. So we realized we we're over allocated. The demand is exceeding the supply. We got too many mouths on the ground on the summer range specifically. And a lot of the data that we're collecting, you know, verified that. Um, like I mentioned, we have, you know, really, really uh, involved and, and expensive and time consuming GPS collar projects and uh, looking at everything from newborn fawns to adult does and bucks. And, uh, and, and the data was all adding up. That's what we we're seeing. We also documented a lot of predation. And when we're dealing with the resource limited population, predation is maybe not as 
significant. But if we ever do have good conditions, you know, we want to be able to have the opportunity to grow. And that is one thing that has been concerning that we've seen with, with predators in the book cliffs is that um, when we have had a little bit more favorable conditions in some of the years when the deer population could have grown a little bit, uh, because we had a surplus of predators, it, it wasn't growing. And, and we did document really high predation rates by both uh, cougars, bears, and coyotes. Uh, water availability was a huge one. Habitat improvement. If you go drive around in the book cliffs, you see a lot of, uh, you know, pinion juniper treatment projects and stuff. And we're starting to do more and more projects on that summer range as well to try to release more of the forb component and uh, get more of that uh, montane browse community and aspen to come back. Um, even we looked at everything, including, you know, deer vehicle collisions on that newly paved steep ridge road. Um, the action plan identified those issues and put together strategies to address them. And they've had some really good success, uh, kind of almost unheard of, unprecedented. We did work with the county and removed 200 plus stray horses. Now, these were stray horses that were under county jurisdiction. They weren't part of BLM uh, wild horse management areas. Uh, we continue to work with the BLM and are continuing to encourage them to work on managing their horses to their appropriate management levels and the AUMs that they have allocated to horses in their resource management plan. And I hope we can make some progress there, but there's definitely uh, still a lot of need. Um, just in the last year, tons of water development projects, 14 different ponds got cleaned out and salted or sealed. Um, so they can hold water. Uh, we put in 14 guzzlers and then our habitat guys are already getting going here just in the next few weeks, starting on some more guzzler projects. Um, predator management has been an intense focus in the book cliffs, uh, just so that we're poised to rebound when conditions are favorable. Uh, it's gone to harvest objective, uh, over the, over the counter harvest objective with no quota in predator management for cougars. Uh, we've harvested 20 cougars so far this winter out in the book cliffs. Uh, we increased bear tags, and it's also one of our um, targeted coyote removal units where we work with wildlife services to, to try to remove coyotes, especially on that summer range and those spawning habitats. We're continuing with our research projects and uh, with collared animals, you know, that, that big suite of animals. And we're working um, with our federal partners and, uh, and the livestock grazers out there. That's another one where I think there's room for improvement. Uh, some of the needs we've identified include need for you know a rest rotation grazing system um, that gives some of these areas uh, a rest and time to regrow with some contingency plans for drought conditions. Uh, the division has also gone ahead and we've been fairly aggressive with our bison harvest. We're harvesting some cow elk even though we're below objective and we've done you know some extra things on our part to try to reduce the number of mouths on that summer range to try to help with with some of the issues and, and problems that we're seeing there. Now we're going to continue to implement that action plan. I know I've sent a copy of it to, uh, to I think, to Byron and to uh, Randy. And if anyone else needs a copy of that action plan and kind of the, the checklist of, of uh, progress that's been made up to this point, I'm happy to send that out. Um, again, just that, that demand for that summer range and the shortage there of forage is really what's driving the system there. You know, I hear a lot from sportsmen like, oh, you need to close the book cliffs again or you're killing too many bucks. You know, we just need some management. And, and you look at our buck to doe ratio down there, it's been in the mid 30s. Uh, you look at the data on um, pregnancy rates and timing of parturition or birth. You know, we're, we're not having a spread out rut. We're not having second cycle does. You know, buck, buck numbers and the way we're hunting bucks isn't what's driving the population down there. And so, you know, it, the buck hunting is reflective of overall population declining but it's not what's driving the factor. It's not what's driving the situation there. So, uh, so that's, that's it for, for, for book cliffs. Um, we're just gonna keep working on it and uh, do everything we can to have that unit poised and ready to rebound when we have favorable conditions again. Um, I'll give a quick update on the Nine Mile Anthro subunit. It's the subunit, the northern portion of the, of the Nine Mile unit. The Range Creek is on the, sub, on the south. Uh, this unit is managed by the southeastern region primarily, but we do collect a lot of the data on the anthro and, and work there is within our administrative boundary for our region. Uh, population is stable to slightly declining. Um, limiting factor there, it's really similar to the book cliffs, summer range, lack of browse, uh, lower deer densities makes that population a little more vulnerable to predation. 
We have increased the take on cougars and bears, went to harvest object or, uh, to uh, predator management for cougars. And, uh, and then we're hoping to use some collars to identify some, some crucial habitats and migration corridors to target with upcoming habitat projects. Um, and again, most of the deer on this unit are actually in the southern portion on that range creek portion. Then the last unit in our region I'll talk a little bit about is the eastern half of the Wasatch, the Wasatch Mountains East, which is the current creek and Avinaquin sub subunits. And uh, I want to end with this unit because it's kind of a highlight. It's one of these units that is really resilient. It's a lot more stable. Uh, it's a very productive unit with great summer range habitat and a pretty good winter range. It seems to be a lot more drought resistant than a lot of the other units in our region. Um, and uh, here's the population objective on that unit. It was 25,000. That was adjusted uh, last year down to 21,000. Um, our current estimate is 17.5, and we project that this population will grow a little bit. So we'll be at 19.6 next year as projected. Adult doe and fawn survival is looking really good this winter. We've had a mild winter. This unit, like I mentioned, is really drought resistant, really drought tolerant. Um, and uh, it, it can be uh, subject to bad winters. We've had a couple of years with poor fawn survival here when we had the hard winters but it seems to bounce back quickly. It's, it's more productive. We usually have fire, higher fawn ratios on this unit. Um, the buck to doe ratio objective on this unit, 18 to 20. Uh, we've been right there the last several years, 19, 18, uh, with we are recommending keeping buck permits the same. It seems to be stable, seems to be working pretty well. Um, we anticipate a little bit higher success probably this coming fall on the rifle hunt with uh, later dates and migration timing and anticipate buck to doe ratio next year, right there in that 18 to 20 range. Um, uh, this, the limiting factors on this unit are winter range. When we have a, a, a hard winter that can be tough, uh, we do see quite a bit of roadkill on Highway 40. If you've driven Highway 40, you know, from Strawberry Reservoir to Duchesne, you know, a lot of times in the fall, and then again, this time of year, you, you will see a lot of winter kill. Uh, if you've driven that recently, you'll see up near Strawberry Reservoir, UDOT's been putting in a lot of uh, deer fencing, which is a great step um, and, uh, and, and will protect and save some deer. There's still a need for more, but along that Highway 40 corridor, we'll continue to work with UDOT. Um, one other note, and just one important thing on this unit, uh, there are there is quite a bit of private land on this unit. Some of our really important habitats are private or are owned by SITLA. And I know that's been something that the division has worked on for years and and, uh, and we want to see us continue to work with partners to permanently protect and preserve some of these critical wildlife habitats. Some of these properties like that um, Sitla Tabby Mountain Block is a really important one that provides a lot of important habitat. And there's some other large uh, private parcels down closer towards that winter range. When you drive through like that Fruitland to Duchesne area, you'll see a lot of those mini ranches and little 10 acre ranchettes with trailers on them. And that's not ideal deer habitat. So when there are opportunities to work with, you know, willing landowners to protect some of that habitat, whether it's easements or purchases, you know, we, we like we like seeing that and and protecting those deer habitats in perpetuity. And with that, that's that's it for northeastern region deer units. And, and uh, take any questions. Thanks, Dax. Uh, any questions from the board? <laughs> Uh, I don't have a question, Dex. This is Randy. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to to all those who worked on the the working group for the book cliff and for all those who are presently working on it to to get that um, to follow the the, uh, the the plan there. Uh, I see I see the objectives are being worked on and uh, there's a lot going on that we don't see and I really do appreciate what you guys are doing there. Uh, and I do appreciate you you you, you mentioning on the um, uh, on the uh, Given some of the uh, rest period for on some of those those areas, and instead of uh, like giving them time to rest, I guess and I don't know if that's a grazing the grazing issues or what it is, but but uh, some of those areas they just they just get beat up, and pretty soon there's nothing there. So I really appreciate everything that's going on there. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Randy. Yeah, that's that's an important one, and one that we need to still make some progress on is finding some ways to to have a good rest rotation system there and make contingency plans so that, you know, it works for everybody, even in extreme conditions. But the way we're doing it right now, there's, there's, there's definitely more demand on that forage resource than, than, than there is forage. Yes. And, and, and if we could put more pressure on, on maybe Sitla and BLM to help us with, 
with some of those wild horses again. I know there's no plans to do it, do it in 2021, but if we could get some plans going to 2022, because uh, it's, it's, you know, I've had the opportunity to be in out there quite a bit this past winter and there's just, they're just everywhere. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of horses left out there that, that, that need, need uh, attention. Any other questions? They actually did a great job. Keep up the good work out there with the restoration and everything else. Okay, thank, thanks guys. And be sure to reach out to me if you have any questions or anything anytime. Thank you. Okay, it's a, uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule right now. So uh, I'm gonna take another five minute break and then we'll come back at 2.08 and uh, Darren Du Bois will be up next. That works for everybody. Take a five minute break, be back at 2.08.
Darren, you ready? I'm ready. Go ahead and present your predator control. All right, thanks, Byron. Yeah, so uh, today I'd, I'd like to just take a, a few minutes and talk a little bit about some of the things we've been doing uh, recently to address um, concerns we have on, on units throughout the state where predators are exerting some downward pressure on some of our populations, specifically deer populations. So as the board, I'm sure remembers, um, we've done quite a few things, uh, including our our uh, coyote bounty program, uh, some, some uh, targeted coyote control, in addition to uh, some changes to cougar management to address some of these concerns that we've seen. So uh, I'll just kind of give a, an overview statewide uh, where we are. The only caveat I want to throw in is that uh, some of these numbers are still pretty fluid. As, as you know, the cougar season is still open. And, and so those numbers could change and, and you may see some changes to these numbers when we come around again for recommendations in the summer. But having said that, I just uh, thought I'd uh, go ahead and, and run through some of the numbers as they stand now. This first slide uh, is our cougar harvest uh, from 1990 uh, through this current season. Uh, the uh, x-axis is the, the years and of course on the y are the numbers, but um, there are two lines here. One, the blue line are the numbers of, of sport harvest and the uh, orange line includes all, all kinds of harvest, including uh, incidental things like roadkill. Um, but, but most of that represents wildlife services take. So when they're removing cougars that are, that are depredating uh, domestic livestock, uh, it also includes when those livestock producers uh, take animals that are they're depredating. So that's the biggest difference. Um, as you can see, uh, up until uh, this year, our, our high for sport harvest was back in uh, 1997. And, and we've actually exceeded that this year. Uh, one thing that we do know, um, one thing we've seen in Utah and throughout the West and in North America is uh, cougar populations have been growing over the last decade. Um, we certainly see that in our models, uh, a growing population. And so uh, our plan has responded to that growing population. And then of course we implemented uh, some changes to our predator management policy uh, last year that allows us to be more proactive when we start to see uh, predation impacting uh, the prey base that they rely on. Uh, one of the main things we look at uh, when we're looking at cougars specifically is what the percent females in the harvest are and uh, some of the work done in Utah in the past suggested that uh, if you're below 40%, you're probably uh, maintaining or, or growing cougar populations. And if you're above 40, you're, you're, you're at least stabilizing and maybe starting to see a reduction. So this is statewide. Uh, our estimate uh, so far with, the, with the, what we've seen harvest wise so far is uh, just a little bit above 40%. Um, this year. So obviously that's by design and, and because those predator management units, uh, that, that's the objective in those units is to reduce uh, cougar densities on those units. And in order to do that, you have to, uh, you have to take females, the ones who reproduce. So um, that's, we're, we're on track there. Um, and, and uh, we'll look at our population projections and, and models and we'll have more news or more information on that when we do cougar recommendations. But this is kind of where we're sitting now. Um, moving on to, to coyotes, um, we uh, work with the wildlife with wildlife services to do targeted removals. Uh, what we do is identify units where we have concerns about coyote predation and the impacts that the coyotes are having, usually primarily on fawns, neonates specifically and um and so we work with them and draw polygons on the map in order to uh, have them focus efforts so this would be aerial removal of coyotes and um, this is a summary of where they've worked 
and the number of, of coyotes that have been removed on those those core areas that we've uh, asked them to work on uh, from November last year through uh, February this year. We get a report at mid month for the for the preceding month, so um, we would expect to see March numbers uh, by mid April. So this is this is kind of where we are. They've been they've still been working, but. Um, but, but this is the latest information. So uh, you can see there, there's also one other thing. We've been working with a private contractor on some of these units. So the cash, um, Snowville, Park Valley, those are uh, those are a different company that, that we're working with on a private contract. The rest of these units are are done by uh, Wildlife Services. Uh, in addition to the the time and money they spend on the units that we designate. We also provide some funding uh, to counties throughout the state for counties to use to match uh, with private landowners or, or livestock producers funds for, for additional flying. And so uh, this graph shows the different counties and numbers of coyotes removed in those counties using those county match funds. This is still wildlife services uh, doing the flying, but they're working with livestock producers. And these aren't necessarily on our deer units, but they are on units where, where both wildlife and domestic livestock benefit from, from the management. Moving on to the, our incentive program. So this is the bounty program that was implemented in 2013. Uh, this graph shows the trend line of coyotes taken per year from the beginning of the program through uh, the current uh, season, current fiscal year. Uh, obviously, in 2021, we've still got a few months to go before the end of the fiscal year, so that number is likely to change a little bit. Um, you can see that we peaked on uh, coyote take on the bounty program in 2017. And we've seen a decline since then. It looks like um, we're probably going to be on track to, to be very similar to what we were last year on the uh, incentive program. This is just uh, the same thing, but in a table form. You can see the number of coyotes removed. You can see the amount of money that's been paid out uh, to, to folks who turn those uh, coyotes in in compensation. And then uh, what we thought we'd do just for the to kind of see where we are uh, compared to last year. So on this graph, you can see the amount of money spent on the Y axis on the X axis are the months and then the red bars represent where we were in that month, what we paid out in that month in 2020 and the blue lines are what we've paid out so far in 2021. Um, just to kind of compare last year to this year. So uh, overall, we've seen about a 2% decrease over last year, um, but we still got some time to go. So we'll see where we, where we come out. We'll probably be close to about $200,000 in uh, reimbursements for, the, for that program at the end of the, the year. And that's, that's really briefly what I have. Obviously, I'm willing to answer any questions people might have or go through some of these slides in more detail. Thanks, Darren. Are there any questions from the board? Byron. Go ahead. Go ahead, Wade. Uh, Darren, just I've got lots of questions, but the one <laughs> the last one on my mind is uh, so on the coyote bounty, it looked like um, we were well down in 2020, well down of what we've been in the past. Uh, and is there, what's, what's your reason for that? You, I think there's a couple of things that happen. One is that we, uh, we implement the bounty, uh, app that, that uh, made it a little bit more difficult to take coyotes out of state and then bounty them. I don't know. I don't know that a lot of that was going on, although we did make some cases on that in the past. I think, uh, I, I think people just are a little bit more careful about making sure that they're taking coyotes where they where they should. 
Um, other than that, Wade, it, it's hard to say. I don't know if it's a, a, a waning of interest. Um, you got kind of the hardcore guys that are still going that, that would go anyway. There may be some some number of people that, uh, you know, they they were they were excited about it at first, but maybe figured it was more trouble than it was worth. It, it'd probably be uh, a good idea to maybe do a survey, and, and we can certainly do that and see what's driving that decline. Um, I I'd like to say it's because our coyote densities are down. Um, but I don't know that that's the case. We have seen. Um, a lot of young coyotes consistently coming in. So when we ate them, most of the over 50% of the, the animals we've taken are between zero and one year old. So yeah. And they're I, basically picking off the reproduction and may not be hitting the, the adults as much. Yeah. And, and I yeah, I, I would love to think that our population was down too. And and, and maybe it is a little bit, but that I feel like that's wishful thinking too. Yeah, uh, because I we've I mean down here in our area, just in southern region, the, the people I've talked to, uh, kind of seeing the opposite with regard to bounty. Uh, yeah. Certainly, right here, even in our local area, our county and a few private bounty programs going on are seeing the opposite. They're seeing increase uh, over the last twenty four months, and uh, and so I don't think it's a lack of interest. I. I I have heard a lot of people complain about the new app and the new requirements in that it's too hard. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. There's a lot of, tr I mean, there is some truth to it, but I don't know that it's a deterrent. Uh, I know there is a small fraction of people that have quit, basically quit doing it because they felt like it was too hard, but I think that's a small group, but I mean, that's a significant, I mean, we're paying out half of what we used to and, and, yeah, I mean, 2020, COVID forced us all outdoors, and uh, I would have thought 2020 we would have seen a spike, not a decrease. That, that's what I was thinking too. Um, yeah, I, I I think maybe it's time to you know we're into the program several years now. It probably is time to do a, a broad survey and and get some answers to some of those questions. I'd be open to that for sure. <laughs> Aaron, we know how many coyotes is taken by trappers and, and uh we'll have that data but donnie but but not yet um that's something that we pull together right before uh we do fur bear recommendations in the summer so we can certainly uh report that in addition to what i showed um there there'd be additional take by wildlife services that, that aren't using county match and are, are just working for uh for landowners, um, and, and that usually figures in. But um, if, yeah, if, if a trapper takes a coyote and doesn't bounty it, uh, that'll come out in our fur bear data. So I could certainly come back with that. But that's not something we've compiled yet. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Darren, has the price of fur gone down? The last couple of years or just yeah I, my recollection last time i talked to to some of the trappers that yeah they did especially in bobcats and and we may see that that could be part of it i know i know some guys that are bounty in them are, are selling the fur too and i don't know how much that drives it it seems like for 50 bucks it'd be worth doing both but um but i don't know Byron, I, some of the people I talked to, uh, bobcats are definitely down, but coyotes have actually been at least uh, going into the 1920 winter. Coyotes are actually up a little bit, so there's a lot of shift onto coyotes, I think probably even into 2020. But, uh, but yeah, it doesn't reflect that drastic drop in, uh, in that bounty, probably. And I've heard similar comments with regards to the app, Wade. Um, I think I think if it was all the additional requirements, we probably would have seen a, a much faster decline, you know, from year to year, rather than more of a gradual leveling out. But um, it could it could be partly that people have done it for a couple of years and decided, you know, this is really just more trouble than than I want to take for a couple of coyotes for a hundred bucks or whatever. So anyway, Darren, I uh, <clears throat> this this winter I. I thought I want to see how hard it is to uh, to, to use that app. 
And so I, I being being uh, technically challenged, I went ahead and, and tried it. And uh, it's, 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 I, I was able to do it. I was able to get online and, it, and I've had it out there and, and found locations. It, it's, it's, it's not as hard as I thought it was going to be. We've tried to make it as easy as possible, but we have had some issues with certain models of phone. Uh, and, and what we've done is allow people to still use the paper system if they can't make the app work and um, it doesn't work on their phone. And so there's still that option, um, but most people are using the app and it really does help us on our end if, if people use it. Well, I think your uh, survey is a good idea, Darren, to find out what the what's going on out there with the public because I was surprised to see that decline coming down. Yes, yeah, it'd be a good time to, to look at that for sure. Darren, um, this is Brett. I just had a couple of numbers here I wanted to compare. Okay. Um, we started up a group in, in Cache and Box Elder counties. Um, we call it NUPA, the Northern Utah Protective Association. Mm -hmm. It's about a dozen sheep ranchers, and, and uh, we work together. Um, my son is also a gunner for wildlife services. Last year, they shot over 900 coyotes and out of the fixed wing. And this year, to date, right now, he's at 542. So that it's quite a reduction up here. And, our, and the NUPA helicopter work got about half of what it did last year. Last year, it was all around 250, and now we're at 191, so a little more than half. But the big difference we've had up here this year on our work is we're responsible for 53 lions killed in this area. And last year we was about half of that. Yeah. So we're still showing the same losses basically from last year on our sheep as from this summer before. But it just shows me that our losses are as much from mountain lion as they are from coyotes. And I think that mirrors on the mule deer. Uh, yeah, I, I think what we know is lions. Lions tend to take deer and sheep in the in the numbers that they're available. They don't, you know, they're ambush predators. If something comes along, they take it, they, whether it's a, a big buck or an elk or or a fawn or whatever. And, and that's certainly true for sheep too. So, um, you know, where the goal is to reduce dens densities. It's interesting. You know, we have seen some increased take in. Box Elder County cash has been high now for for four years and still we just keep on it's amazing to me that we can consistently kill over 30 lions off of that that unit year after year and well, I, it's not surprising I, given given that we've got Idaho and and, and yeah, a lot of country that doesn't get hunted to the south of that unit that that certainly is a, a thing that comes into it well I, I don't think Idaho is I think we're getting a lot of predators, coyotes and lions, out of Idaho. I think that uh, I don't think they're nearly as aggressive as we have been these last few years, and uh, and I think these lions, well, and coyotes are, are are coming in waves out of Idaho. So in this, and that might might be true for other areas too. You know, along border states, I don't know, but that's right. definitely the case here. And Idaho's commission just, just I think last week, passed a change uh, to their management strategy for, for lions. Uh, they're going to to non no quota. They used to have female sub quotas on some of those units that border us. And it'll be interesting to watch and see how that how that plays out. It's more similar to our management uh, in the northern part of the state uh, than it has been. So, so we may start seeing some stabilization there. We'll see. Thanks, Darren. Yep. Any other questions for Darren? Wade, you got another question? Yeah, I don't want to monopolize all the question time, but uh, but but I'll keep going if you let me. Um, so a year ago, Darren, we talked a lot about uh, when we were going through this similar process and talking predators and management plans. We talked a lot about bears and their effect on on fawn mortality and uh, certainly some of those units, some more than others, book cliffs. I mean, there were a few of those that are collared data. 
showed us that, you know, it was significant. And we haven't hardly talked much about bears in the last six months and hardly any today, as, as a lot of the management plans were talked about and predators were talked about. Uh, there was hardly no mention of bears. What's your feel on that? Where are we at? And what do you think? A couple of things. So we've got the, the USU study going where we're, where we're looking at, it seems like bears impact um, deer especially in a couple of ways one one uh, the most direct way is that they take neonate fawns and we've seen some of that on the book cliffs and uh and the management strategy on the book cliffs has re reflected that uh for a few years now and so that's something that the that the regions and i are looking at all the time um the other the other thing that we we weren't able to qualify quantify very well until hopefully the results of the usu research is how many how many more lion kills are we seeing because bears steal uh, their kills? And um, we don't know the answer. We know what happens. We've, we've captured bears doing that. I think I showed a video a couple of years ago uh, to that effect. So again, that's a sample size of one. Um, we're hoping to have more answers uh, in the near future on, on that. Uh, what we do, so bears are included in the new predator management policy, and that's something that, that our biologists will be looking at uh, on a unit by unit basis. This year is the third year of the, the bear cycle, so we'll be making uh, all of our permit recommendations and changes this, this coming year. It'll be, you know, winter, but um, we'll, uh, we'll certainly look at that. And if, if bears look like they're impacting those populations, you'll see recommendations. Uh, along those lines. And, and I guess, too, I appreciate that, Darren. I guess a comment to go along with it, too, is certainly this is, it's not a statewide problem. You know, it is isolated areas where bears are having significant impact. I, I think bear predation on those neonates, those brand new fawns, is a really hard thing to track. You know, I mean, we don't know if the doe aborted them. We don't know if, you know, we don't know what happened to them because they all get killed so quickly. And, and so that's a very hard thing to track, but it, as you compare some of these units, and beaver is a good example, you compare beaver, everything else seems to have stayed the same. Their mm -hmm. weather over the last 10 years seems to have stayed the same. Their buck to doe ratio seems to have stayed the same. Everything seems to have stayed the same, except the fact that uh, the bear numbers have probably tripled or, or quadrupled. Right. And you've seen that uh, that population, overall population of deer, really, really plummet. I mean, they're struggling, and and certainly that maybe that's a causal cause effect relationship. Maybe it's not, but I do think we need to take a strong look at that because, I as we talk predators, I think we need to keep all three of them on the tip of our tongue and make sure that we're uh, we're addressing all three and not letting one you know let one population uh, start to get its uh, you know, foot back in the door. Yeah, we uh, we we look at bear. We look at bears too, Wade. I I just didn't include it because we just the numbers haven't really changed since uh, last uh, December and January when we looked looked at everything uh, last time. So we'll have updates on that data here coming up this this next cycle, and and we will review it in the summer too. And if a unit needs to be changed, uh, management strategy wise, you'll see those changes. Mr. Chase, Justin um, Shannon. Yeah, um, just internally wanted to let you know as well. We're having some conversations about cougar management. We've made a lot of changes over the last couple of years with increasing bag limits and hunting in the fall and and uh, just having units under predator management and some of those types of things. And as we've been looking at our cougar management. Um, in some ways, I think it might be more complicated than it needs to be. And so just want to make the board aware of some conversations that we're having internally to look at ways that we can simplify and, and make our rules and our regulations just clearer and, and more easy for the public to understand. So really not for a discussion today or anything along those lines, just more than anything, wanted to give you a heads up that we're having some of those conversations internally. Thanks, Justin. Any other questions for Darren? Uh, this is Randy, just real quick. Uh, Darren, do we have any um, 
numbers on this the spot and stock if, if as, as far as that goes was there was there more than a half a dozen cats taken on the spot and stock permits I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked because I, I meant to bring that up and I forgot so we uh we sold the uh, uh, last count uh 1075 spot and stock permits last year for that fall season it looks like um they took about seven lions with those permits so that's that's not that's less than one percent success other states you know that's that's the only option i think people will probably get better at it but you know the first year pretty low success but but a lot of people were interested so i think that's good and and we'll see how that goes. We'll, we'll continue to track those numbers, but that's that's how things shook out this year. Turns out it's hard to hard to kill a lion without dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Darren, thank you for the information. Thank and you. And we'll Mark. look forward to what you come up with for this coming seasons. With that, Daniel Eddington, are you ready? I am, let me share my screen. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, my name is Daniel Eddington. I work in our habitat section for the Division of Wildlife. I'm the Habitat Conservation Coordinator. Just to, I want to give an update on the Utah's Watershed Restoration Initiative. Um, I know a lot of you are familiar about that, and you've heard a lot about it today uh, with some of the different presentations. Um, just to let you know that the Watershed Restoration Initiative, or WRI, is housed out of our Department of Natural Resources uh, with Tyler Thompson as our director. And then a lot of the administrative side of this initiative is out of the Division of Wildlife. Um, so WRI is a state-led partnership-driven effort meant to improve a lot of our high priority watersheds in Utah. And we're currently right now in our 15th year of this partnership. And we restored um, nearly 2 million acres. Um, after the close of this fiscal year, we'll be well over that 2 million mark, which is an impressive um, effort that we've seen for the last 15 years. Um, on the right there, I've, I've listed a few of the land ownership partner logos. Um, there are a lot more partners, um, NGOs, private citizens, private lands owners that are involved in this. On any given year, we have up to nearly 80 different funding partners that are part of, of these restoration projects. So it's a big effort. It's across land ownerships. Um, and it's been very successful in, in getting restoration work done out on the ground. So there's kind of three main uh, ecosystem values that the WRI focuses on. Uh, the first one is watershed health and biological diversity. Uh, the second is water quality and yield. And then third is opportunities for sustainable uses of natural resources. So here are just some of our performance measures uh, that we have for the WRI program. Um, on that top uh, table, you can see our target uh, is, is around 100,000 acres per year. Uh, we just increased that up to 120,000 this last for this uh, last year. Uh, those acres, actual acres that we uh, treat, it, it varies year to year. Um, we've been up in the 172,000 acres, 199,000. We did have a slight drop here in 2020 down to 110. Uh, likely that was due to some of the COVID stuff that we we hit with some of the contractors getting inside line. But I expect that number to actually jump up quite a bit in 2020 because a lot of those projects ended up getting carried over to the next fiscal year. So I anticipate we'll see a, a, a jump there um, this next fiscal year when we close out uh, in June 30th. Um, stream miles, there's a lot of work that gets done on the streams. Uh, our target there has been 50 
for a few years. We did jump that up to 175, and typically we're somewhere around that 150, 160 uh, miles of stream that are treated each year. And I just, I guess, want to mention that this is all proactive restoration. None of this is fire rehab. We do a lot of fire rehab, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that here as well. But um, the proactive restoration is just really awesome in our state. Um, we're on top of a lot of that restoration side, trying to get stuff treated, trying to to improve habitat for wildlife. And I think we're seeing a lot of those benefits as well throughout the state. So in fiscal 20, um, we completed 158 projects. We had 86 different funding partners on those projects. Uh, and there's about 130,000 acres that were completed. Um, about 20,000 of that was fire rehab. And then about 110,000, as I mentioned before, was the proactive restoration, which is just cool that we're doing more proactive restoration than a lot of times we're doing fire rehabilitation. And I think that just goes to show the benefit of the partnership. Um, once again, there's about 166 miles of stream and riparian areas that were treated. And we put roughly 850,000 pounds of seed out on the ground. So this is just kind of a breakdown of where in fiscal 20 those uh, treatments occurred on which land ownership. So kind of there on the left, uh, Bureau of Land Management Lands, you can see the proactive restoration acres was around 48,000 acres and fire restoration was around 14,000 acres. State lands, that includes, you know, any uh, Division of Wildlife Management units, any of the state school trust lands. There's about 7,500 acres that were treated in fiscal 20, and we did about 1,000 a, a acres of fire restoration. Uh, Forest Service, um, proactive restoration was around 45,000 acres. Um, fire restoration was around 1,200. This number has really been increased in the last couple of years uh, as we really try to focus a lot more effort on some of the summer range type projects, as we've seen, you know, from a lot of the data that Kent uh, shared this morning, you know, that the importance of that summer range and trying to get the fat uh, onto through the deer and, and those forest service uh, higher elevation projects uh, are really helping that. And so we've really seen that jump up in the last uh, few years. Private lands, uh, proactive was around 9,000 acres in fiscal 20 with about uh, 3,200 acres of fire restoration. Uh, this is just kind of a, a breakdown of those fiscal 20 projects um, by, by wildlife species. Um, so it's on the left hand column there of the graph, you see it's the number of projects and then on the bottom, you see the, the different wildlife species that, that benefited from those projects that were completed. And I'll just kind of point out, you know, that a, a lot of these projects benefit multiple species. It's just not one single species that, that get benefited. So something like a, an aspen enhancement project, you know, will benefit, you know, mule deer, elk, grouse, um, wild turkeys. So there's a lot of benefit to a single project to a lot of different wildlife species. And I'll just, you know, show there that, you know, of all the different, the number of projects that were funded, you know, 75% of them have a mule deer benefit to them. So right now we're in fiscal 20, uh, fiscal 21. Um, we have over 300 projects that are active right now. Um, they include seeding, shrub planting, stream restoration, fire rehabilitation, Scribe fires, um, tree removal of a lot of the pinion pine and junipers, uh, guzzlers and water improvements. And just on the map, you can see, I mean, they really uh, cover the entire state. Um, almost all of the management units, you know, have some type of project that is occurring within those units. Um, here's just kind of a, a a rundown of fire rehabilitation that we just completed this last fall in fiscal 20. So this last year was a much bigger fire uh, year than we had in uh, fiscal 20. Um, we have over 50 projects that received some type of rehabilitation uh, this last fall. Uh, some of these fires uh, are still receiving some 
active uh, restoration right now. Um, I listed up some of the just larger fires that occurred throughout the state this last year. The Canal Fire, which burned roughly 32,000 acres, is kind of there uh, north of Delta. The Rock Path Fire was around 20,000 acres uh, over by Milford. Turkey Farm, you know, just north of St. George, East Fork, um, uh, as Dax mentioned a little bit earlier. But there was about, like I say, 115,000 acres of restoration that occurred throughout the state this last fall, uh, costing almost $15 million to do that restoration. And just on fires alone um, this last year, which was one of our uh, higher years up in the third, fourth highest fire season we've done, we put about uh, 830,000 pounds of seed out on the ground just for fire uh, restoration. So right now we're in the process of uh, receiving new proposals for this fiscal 22. Um, right now we have 150 project proposals for 22. And as you can see on the map there on the right, they once again are, are scattered across all the units, um, across all of the state. Um, if we could fund all of those projects, it would be roughly 280,000 acres throughout the state of Utah. Um, we have about 65 million in funding requests for those projects. And on any given year, we're only really able to do about 30, maybe 35 million worth of projects. So um, about half of the projects that are proposed, we are not going to able to be able to fund with the monies that we have. Um, all these projects are essentially NEPA completed uh, in the process and they're shovel ready. Um, the only thing we're lacking is the money to fund all of the projects in the state. Um, this is our, our splash page for our, our database where all of the projects are kept. If you're looking for any information on any of the projects, um, you can really go to this wri.utah.gov. Um, there's an interactive map on there if you have a particular area you want to look at. Um, you can click on that, it'll bring up a, a map and you can zoom in to, to any area you're interested in. There's also an about us link here at the top that will send you over to our watershed.utah.gov. That gives a lot more information about the program, um, some of the upcoming events, uh, that type of stuff. But we, on this splash page, you can see the number of projects that are proposed. This is an, a running total that is just kept up on the database. You can see the number of current projects and then the completed projects. And this is where that running total of, you know, um, two, million, 2 million acres is at. And once we close out the fiscal year 21, we'll be well over, well over that mark. Um, I just kind of want to run through maybe some pictures real quick, just to kind of show you some of the work that actually happens out on the ground. Uh, sometimes we talk about habitat restoration and we don't always know what that entails, but uh, there's a lot of seeding projects that go on. We have our Great Basin Research Center down in Ephraim, which houses all of the seed for the state and all of the different agencies utilize uh, the services of the warehouse down there, which has been a huge benefit to a lot of our federal partners to be able to utilize that local resource for seed. But a lot of seed gets flown on airily. A lot of it gets put on with ranged land drills. Um, and a lot of this happens before some of the, the mechanical treatments that occurs out on the ground. There's a lot of shrub planting that goes on, especially in the northern and central region. Uh, a lot of it's done by hands, by volunteers. We do have some equipment out on the ground that is being run up in the northern region that's been very successful at getting some of the shrubs back on the landscape where um, predominantly a lot of those winter ranges just have uh, introduced grasses. And so they've been fairly successful. You can see on the right-hand picture there, a lot of their rows that they put out that uh, they're seeing a lot of that sagebrush uh, coming back into some of, some of those winter ranges, which is really good when we have some of those deeper snows that a lot of that forage is, is available to them uh, in the winter time. There's a lot of stream work that goes on. Um, we have a heavy equipment crew down in the southeast or in the Great Basin Research Center. Um, they do a lot of the work. There's a lot of plantings that go on. Uh, there's a lot of these uh, uh, beaver dam analog structures that get put in. And these, there's a lot of research that's shown that a lot of these things will, you know, when we do have these wildfires that come through, these are really creating uh, 
a refugia for a lot of wildlife species when we have those fires. Because a lot of times you'll see this green spot, spot right in the middle of the fire. And it's cool to see some of those type of projects creating some of those um, uh, benefits. Um, we hear a lot about wildfires, but we always don't hear about the prescribed fires that, that need to happen. But we do have a lot of projects that are utilizing prescribed fire. Um, this one up at the top is the Blacksmith Fork fire that occurred uh, the last couple of years, uh, trying to create some uh, better aspen habitat up on some of those conifer dominant um, ecosystems. There's a lot of ways that fire can be lit. Um, some of them are lit with helicopters with the helitorch that drips down fuels. A lot of it's lit, you know, by hand as well. Um, but prescribed fire definitely as we move up in elevation, it, it's a tool that we really need to be able to utilize a lot more. Uh, there's a lot of constraints sometimes with uh, burn windows and being able to get those off the ground. But um, as we move up in elevation, this is really the tool that will really benefit us the most um, in getting a lot of acres uh, done on one of our southern areas. Well, like Sam already mentioned, some of the fire rehabilitation that we've done. Um, a lot of fire rehab occurs with you know seeding, trying to give some jump starts to some of those ecosystems uh, after they. Uh, receive some of those hot fires. Uh, a lot of times we come in with a, a chain just to try to cover some of that seed, get it incorporated into the soil, uh, make sure it's successful. This is just a picture down on the uh, Brian Head fire where they did some straw bombing, uh, seeded it first, and then did some straw bombing, trying to hold some of the soils in place and had pretty good success with that. Um, but th this is one of our high priorities. We feel it's important when we do have these fires to try to to help them out as, as much as we can to come back to, to good vegetation and not back to, to weeds or cheatgrass or some of those other invasive uh, annuals. We do a lot of tree removal. Um, predominantly, we use a lot of hand crews with some of the pinion and juniper where we have you know good sagebrush understories. Um, we'll just come in and cut a lot of those trees out um, just with hand crews. When it gets a little thicker, we move to more of the equipment. Uh, this is a masticator or a bull hog, um, and that just helps uh, mulch and masticate those trees down. And typically before we do a lot of these type of projects, we'll put a lot of seed out on the ground uh, and just try to get more of that grass or shrub component, component to come back. There's a fair amount of uh, water developments that occur out on the landscape. Uh, whether they're guzzlers, uh, pond cleaning out, a lot of that occurs. Um, I looked up how many we've got throughout the state, and we've got over 700 um, guzzlers uh, throughout the state. So there's quite a few of that. And with that, you know, comes with repair and maintenance on a lot of those. And um, a lot of our guys put a lot of time and effort into making sure that there's water out on the ground for a lot of our wildlife. Um, I just kind of want to show some, you know, um, timeline pictures of some of the projects. Um, when we do a lot of these projects, sometimes we want that immediate benefit of, of you know, going from something like this, which is a pinion juniper uh, stand. This is the Greenfield Bench Bullhog. Obviously, you can see there's very little grass or shrub component. The shrub is obviously dying out. It's just kind of sticks there with the trees. Uh, they did a bull hog project there, 2004. And three years later, you can see a lot of the grass has come in. You can see some of the shrubs are starting to develop over here. And that's three years after the project. 2012, you can start to see the sagebrush starting to develop, becoming much more mature, starting to reach a height of, you know, if you had a deep snow, it would it would be above that snow line, and this is just kind of a photo of uh, 2012 where it's really re reached a mature stand. I guess I just kind of want to point out, you know, in order to to go from where a lot of our um, habitat is to to this point, you know, it takes 16 years. It's not an immediate thing. It, it does take some time to allow that vegetation to grow and mature um, over time. This is just one a uh, Kingston Canyon project. It's a riparian project, but kind of the same thing. They pulled back uh, a lot of the slopes here um, on the stream. 
Uh, and you can see that it, obviously it's not really connected to the floodplain much anymore. Uh, it's just kind of confined right to the stream channel. They did some restoration, pulled those banks back, planted some willows one year later. You can see that they're coming in, but nine years later, you know, you can just really see the change in habitat there. Uh, and, and obviously they're catching some, some big fish uh, out of those streams. And, and finally, I'll just kind of wrap up with this one. Uh, this is the Cold Springs Aspen Enhancement Project. Um, it was a prescribed fire uh, up on the West Cavaputs. Um, it was a pretty mature stand. This picture is kind of sometimes hard to see because of the shadows, but it's obviously a mature conifer with some aspen trees in there, but not a lot of uh, forage uh, in the under understory of this. There's a few uh, shrubs kind of poking up, but not a lot. We did a, a fire in there, and you see the aspens that, that get regenerated after a prescribed fire. And, you know, it just provides so much more forage uh, for a lot of our wildlife. It's a lot of the wildlife uh, will utilize these, these uh, treatment areas once, once they've been treated. And with that, I, I thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll entertain those. Daniel, could you do me a favor? Sure. Could you give us an update of uh, what's going to happen tomorrow with our conservation permit money and stuff like that, how that happens and that money comes back to the watershed initiative? Absolutely. So tomorrow we'll be holding our conservation permit funding meeting. Essentially, it's a meeting where uh, any of the funds that were created from the conservation permits or from the exponents, uh, all the groups come together, uh, you know, Mule Deer Foundation, Sportsman Fish and Wildlife, Safari Club, Rocky Mountain Elk, um, Utah Archery Association, and uh, uh, I want to say Fanaz, but it's not Fanaz anymore. Oh, <laughs> Northern Sheep Foundation. Um, they all come together with any of the funds they created from their banquets and, and put that money towards restoration projects. And uh, it's been an awesome meeting that we hold annually uh, where they come together. And typically on uh, any given year, we're, we're seeing almost $3 million worth of projects coming from those sportsman groups uh, onto to restoration projects. And, and it's a really cool meeting. Um, we're excited for that every single year. It really helps with a, a lot of our restoration work. Thanks, Daniel. Any questions from the board? Daniel, keep up the good work and just uh, Habitat looks great what you've done over the years. You've done a great job. Uh, Thank you. That's our last presenter, unless there's any questions, and I'll just uh, open it up to a wildlife board discussion going further. This, this Carl is. Can anybody give us a number of how many people may have watched this meeting today? It says fifty-two right now. Oh, I no, I'm I'm one. This was out somewhere else too, right? Yeah, Carl. We we stream this on YouTube, but at one point I heard there was at least one hundred and eighteen on. Maybe Mike Christensen could give us an update if he's got a count of that. Yeah, this is Mike, and we had over uh, 200 at one point for a good stretch of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I guess I got a question. I don't know who to ask it, but uh, we, we just recently, uh, I think we completed a, a survey on technology. I was wondering when when the board might be able to see some of the results off of that survey. Randy, I'll try to answer that for you. Yeah, we, we just completed a survey asking about some of the latest technologies. Uh, we'll have an informational item for the rack and boards in May and well, in the May and June cycle. So we'll, we'll bring an informational to you. And we also are expecting to probably have a trail cam recommendation for you at the same time. Okay, thank you. One thing I did skip over is I'd like to thank all of our presenters today. They all did an excellent job and uh, the information like always is just first class. 
you know, and Ashley and Justin, I hope everybody knows how much we appreciate all the time and effort that went into this meeting. We started our first work meeting last year and this just getting better this year. And I'd just like to see that continued on and thank all the presenters for all the hard work and time they put into it. This Carl, I, I, I echo that. I mean, this was, this was something we asked for and it was a lot of work and it kind of out of the, the timetable of what we've done. So I really appreciate it, but it is, it is very valuable for us to see this ahead of time and give us some, some, some opportunity and, and some time to, to answer people's questions. I hope there were a lot of people that looked at this, understanding that, that there's, there's a, a political component of this also, as well as science, but, but this, was, this was wonderful. This is Brett. I also lo love that fact, and I think that we could people could go on and watch portions or all of that on YouTube later on too. So that that's way informational, and it's good to me to know that that we're still keeping the heat up on these predators, and and that's that's important. This is Kevin. Um, one of the things that uh, um, I, I've been having concerns with, and, it, and pretty much with every region, um, you know, the drought cycle and kind of where we're at, and you look at uh, where we may be at this time next year, and it can be, it could be really scary if we don't get timely precipitation. And I, I worry about um, um, the amount of energy that the animals are going to spend with without um, great habitat resources right now. And so I, um, one of the things that uh, um, I've thought a lot about is, is what management decisions can we do that would reduce energy spent if it's um, reducing um, the amount of people on, on winter range, or if it's, um, you know, shortened seasons. And I think the way that we have our, um, management plan right now I had a really good conversation with Justin Shannon and um, we don't have it in the proclamation that we would advertise to people on years like this that we could shorten seasons and and so people have already put in for the draws and that might be really catch people off guard but I one of the things I think that should be a, a discussion when you have back to back to back um, years like we have what can the um, Division of Wildlife and the Wildlife Board do together to be able to um, limit the amount of energy spent when the intake that animals have is very limited? And so I, I think that that ought to be something that we look at very heavy to be able to, um, to help wildlife, especially if we are in the situation that we are next year. If, if we have the extreme drought that was presented by um, by Kent, um, we uh, it may be too late to make the decision. So I think that that's something we really need to look at. I appreciate that, Kevin. I guess uh, it's 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 taking more of a proactive role instead of a reactive role. And I think we just need to start doing that as much as we can on on what it, what in any way we can. So we're we're not having to react to things as much as 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 plan for them when we can. So thank you. I, I just want to echo a little bit what uh, Kevin's talking about. You know, we uh, talked a lot about deer today. Uh, didn't talk as much about elk and some of the other things because they are doing they are doing better. But we did talk a lot about deer today, and uh, obviously the consensus almost across the board is that the deer are struggling. And so I agree with Kevin. Anything that we can do that can help with that, that can impact that, I think we need to have a real discussion about it. Now, it's a given, you know, I think we all knew it before, but certainly a lot that was presented today is that we, we don't have a lot of control over the things that are impacting them. The things that are impacting them the most, we do not have control over unless someone's figured out how to control weather in the last little bit. 
because obviously that's the driving factor. Habitat, nutrition, uh, that is the thing. No matter what we do, we can control all other variables and be very aggressive, and we still are not going to have as much impact as Mother Nature and, and drought and big winters and all of these things. But that doesn't mean we don't have some control over some things that can affect these herds. And, and I guess I would just suggest that we take really serious the things that we can control, the things that we can, uh, you know, whether it's permit numbers, season dates, uh, and, and when I mean permit numbers, I'm not talking about buck permits, don't worry, Kobe. Uh, you know, the things that we really can get our hands on, I really think we need to be aggressive. I know you're all hearing it, uh, no different than what I am, but uh, there are some of our deer herds that are really, really struggling. Not just a little bit, they're really struggling. And, and I feel like we need to be really aggressive in those areas. Certainly, uh, Daniel, I believe Daniel's one that talked to us about, uh, you know, habitat work and all these projects. That is great, but that's not short term. That is very long term. And that is certainly where the majority of our eggs need to be, in baskets like that. But short term, we can't have an impact, you know, and, and certainly predators kept coming up over and over and over again. We've made a lot of headway with predators in the last 12 months. And I know it's something that we handle with kid gloves a little bit. We're, we, we're a little nervous and, and, uh, and probably for good reason. But I think we have got to stay with it. We have got to be probably even more aggressive than we have been the last 12 months on those units that really need it. Um, and, and I know the legislature has given us a few more tools that we can use. And, and I guess one question I had, I had a lot of people ask me about this this year. Why aren't we opening some of these units back up? And I guess I didn't fully understand the directive the legislature gave us with regard to that. What, what are those guardrails? What are the parameters? What are the limitations um, with our new predator plans from what the, what the legislature gave us? Aaron, do you and Justin want to tackle that one? Yeah, um, I can jump in. Uh, so Wade, the, the, um, Printer management policy that we that we brought around last summer uh, puts those guardrails up. So, uh, in a nutshell, what we're looking at there's a couple of reasons, um, a couple of circumstances under which predator control is warranted. One is when we can demonstrate that the predators are having a direct effect on those populations. It looks typically like we saw on the Manti, where we've got good, healthy deer. Um, uh, adult survival seems to be limited by by high, in the, in the case of the Manti, high lion predation. Um, it's not summer range. It's not a habitat thing because we can see that in the body scores. And so that'd be one circumstance where predator uh, management would be warranted under the under the policy, or we and we and we implemented it on the Manti for that reason. The other circumstance relates to, to what we've been talking about today, and that is we don't control the weather, but when we know that a, that a population is going to be um, significantly reduced below the carrying capacity, the, the long-term carrying capacity of that unit, um, just because the deer population drops uh, doesn't mean that the predator population drops immediately and typically that will that those numbers can can maintain and in some cases you know that could go out to seven years before you really see a reaction and so um the idea there is that if, if we see large reductions um predator management would then be warranted uh, to get get those densities of predators down and more in, in line with what the current population a prey is so that that population when circumstances allow can grow and so that's kind of what we're looking at we look at that twice a year we look at it um when after we get our body condition scores in december so we kind of know what we're looking at and and uh, most of the managers talked about how um, you know they're anticipating based on those scores what we're likely to see this year and so that predator management is part of that equation 
and then uh, we'll look at it again this summer. So once we've get uh, final numbers on overwinter survival and uh, what those right now they look pretty good for most of the state, but um, but but we'll take that into account too. And then if uh, if predator management is warranted, that's something the director will implement um, immediately uh, in either of those time periods. And so it's something that uh, the board will inform the board, but it's something the board won't won't. It, it's not something that'll go around through the the rack and board process. That's something that the director will implement, and and we'll let uh, everybody know. So uh, Darren, on, the, on that front kind of frame that up for me because i i kind of came on right about the same time hp 125 got passed yeah who put the guardrails up who who kind of who who said okay these two categories are going to fall into this new predator management plan what did we the uh, later what did the legislature tell us to do um i mean did they just say no holds barred do something or did they were they specific did we put the guardrails and the categories up or did they, they the legislation, uh, the law now requires the director to take immediate action if if we can demonstrate that predators are having a negative impact on uh, on prey or ungulate populations meeting their management objectives. So that that's those are the sideboards in the in the in the legislation in the law, and then we drafted a policy to try to figure out well how do we tell. When predators are an issue, right now, um, about sixty percent of our cougar management units are under predator management plans, and so you know we took that really seriously and, and took a, a good hard look at that. Um, obviously, predator management is is predators aren't always the driver, but when they are, we're definitely will take action and and make adjustments. Does that no, that, that, way? that no, it absolutely does, and I appreciate okay. that because that kind of gives uh, at least me a little better framework of how this thing works. I probably didn't quite, I didn't fully understand it, so that is good. And, and I guess just for input, I, I mean, the division has done. <laughs> Let's be honest, the game has changed a lot in the last 12 months with regard to predators, and I think the division has really stepped outside of their comfort zone and have certainly been a lot more aggressive than they have been in the past. And so I applaud that. I guess I would just say I think there's a third of our units that we could even take another step on and, and even be ultra aggressive on that, that, you know, that 30 or 40 percent of those units that really do, that really are in a bad spot. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, we're doing great, but I do think there's a little more out there we can do. I'd hate to see us, I'd hate to see us draw back for a little bit just to see how we did the last 12 months. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll look at how harvest went this year on 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 all of our units, and then uh, as some some of the managers mentioned that that they're already um, looking at their data and, and looking at. at potential changes. So you'll see something when we do Cougar recommendations this summer on some of those units, I'm sure. Hey, Darren, can I jump in for a second as well? Yeah. Wade, one thing that I really like about HB 125 is I think it gave us the ability to be a lot more proactive with predator management. And so I think for a long time, it was we would demonstrate that deer uh, survival rates had declined and, and you know, predation was a limiting factor in those types of things, and then we would implement it. And I think the way that Kobe and Darren worked through this and presented it to the racks and, and the way the, the wildlife board ultimately approved it last year, I love that there's a proactive approach. If we can see that cliff coming and we know we're gonna experience some of these losses, we can get aggressive ahead of time. And, um, and so I think that's one of the, the biggest take homes from this. So as Darren said, we'll, we'll be evaluating where we're at with it again in June, and and uh, it, it's certainly on our radar. Hey, uh, Justin, one one thought that I had um, listening to um, to Dax's presentation. One of the things I really liked was he, he really projected out maybe some of the conditions and and what they kind of thought numbers would be in the future. And one of the thoughts I had is if we continue to to have extreme drought like. Kent talked about the possibility in maybe our August meeting. What I think what the wildlife board maybe ought to look at is 
what controls that we have on energy spent by animals and and uh, maybe that's some season date shortening some season dates maybe that's not having um shed hunting season in, in the winter and and so i think we need to be prepared early if we know um through the summer that we're still in those extreme drought conditions we as a board ought to be prepared to be able to make some decisions to let the public hey if things continue we might have to do some things to protect wildlife, to protect deer. And so I think that we ought to be paying close attention to that. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin I agree. I, I like that. I like the idea of looking at our summer prior to our season date recommendations in November. Um, sorry, are you talking? Oh, um, what one thing I was going to say with it, though, Kevin, is... Uh, I think those dates, a lot of those dates are kind of set in the plan, um, the, the deer plan. And so I, I know we're not taking action items and some of that stuff today. It's just a work session, but it's probably one thing we need to get with Kobe on and the big game program and, and look at that and put a provision in there for drought conditions to be changed. Just because I don't want um, the board to approve a, a management plan that has dates set and then we, we vary from that. And so if, if, I think if we're looking for um, flexibility in there, we, we can certainly look at opening that up and adding a little flexibility for drought on season dates. I like that idea. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think look, looking out, we, we kind of gives us some time to prepare for it. So thank you. Any other discussion from the board? So Byron, I, I don't know how we want to do this. I, I I had anticipated we'd have a little longer time to uh, to visit as a you know just as a board and just kind of kick ideas around. We've already been meeting for six and a half hours now, and I know nobody wants to sit here any longer. But I I have a long list of things that I would love to chat about. What what's the rest of the board's feel? I mean, have we used up our bandwidth for today or do we want to keep discussing things? Our agenda goes through 4.30, Wade, so everybody got that. That's. But if everybody's done, doesn't want to talk or anymore, but uh, this is our opportunity as a board to, uh, you know, discuss important things concerning wildlife. I mean, I, I have a, this is Carl, I have a meeting at four, but until then, yeah, let's let's keep going, and then I'll I'll just have to leave. I'm good too. Yeah, I'm good. Let's get her done. This has been a great meeting. Wow, it's been. Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm totally fine. Yeah, you got plenty of time to get ready for Africa. So. <laughs> Go ahead, Wade. Right. So I, I guess. Uh, and, and certainly I don't want to belabor some of these things. Some of them aren't very important, but let's be honest, this is our only forum to talk. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard for us to really work, work through some of these little non agenda items during a regular board meeting. And so I, this really is our only, our only chance to chat unless we want to schedule another one of these and do nothing but just chat. Uh, and so I'll, I'll keep bringing up ideas and just try to get, you know, start some discussion amongst us. And when everybody gets tired, uh, just wave the white flag. But I just had a lot of people bring up some issues that I thought were worth discussing. Uh, one of them was, maybe I can start here. One of them was uh, limited entry season expectations. That's with regards to deer, elk, all of it. Uh, I've had a lot of private citizens as well as a lot of DWR employees ask about this, if there isn't a way to address it, and I know this is kind of a weird one, but uh, some of the suggestions were made, could we not put some data in the hunt planner? We've got a hunt planner that everyone has access to. I wonder if we couldn't put some of the data in there that would help them understand better exactly what they're getting into. Because let's be honest, everybody, you know, we wait 15 years to draw a limited entry season. And during those 15 years, we build it up in our mind far bigger than it is. 
And, and then when we get there, oftentimes we're disappointed or we realized our expectations were way out of line. Um, and I know our biologists hear a lot about this. Uh, you know, and, and these hunts shouldn't be disappointing to us. You know, this is something we look forward to for a long time. Is there a way we can put success rates? Uh, is there a way that we could put uh, just some of these little bits of information that might be helpful to someone not familiar with the unit or the hunt itself, just to, to align their expectations with reality? Wait, was that a, a question for the division or is that more of a discussion for the board? Uh, whoever's got a good idea, Justin, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I, I love it. When we came up with the, the hunt planner, that was, that was one of the driving reasons behind it was we wanted to be really transparent about when you apply for a unit, what is the buck to doe ratio currently? What was last year's success rate? How many permits were issued? Um, we have a whole section on notes from biologists, and I know, I know Dax, uh, if he's still on, he may want to speak to this. I know in his region, he, he's looked at some, um, including some of that stuff for their notes um, on if you draw this, you know, typically on this unit, you're going to harvest a 22 inch wide three by four. That's what the data say. And so we have a lot of that harvest data in our notes from biologist section. We get a, we get a lot of flexibility just based on the questions that biologists are getting. If they get three or four or 10, then we can insert all that information in there and say, all right, I'm getting enough questions on this. Let me um, include it here in the hump planner. And so I, yeah, it's top of mind for us. And Dax, I don't know if you're still on, I want to talk to you, but, but I think we're open to that way. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, one of the things I've found uh, is, I think hunters are optimists. Like a lot of hunters are optimists. And if it's like, oh, success rate for the late bull hunt in the book cliffs for elk is 60%. Well, I'm for sure going to be in that 60%. So 10 out of 10 guys are sure they're going to be in that 60%. And uh, I don't know, our hunters are, are just optimistic, you know. Um, but I do think that we, we you know, we want to share realistic information. And sometimes how many points it takes to draw a permit is more of a function of demand, supply and demand, than it is necessarily of quality on a unit. And, and uh, but that's a hard one is bridging that gap between expectations and reality. You know, we do put what last year's success was on, on units and like on elk units, we put, you know, what the age was last year, but we might be able to add a little more information and, maybe break it out by, you know, specific weapon types or maybe show success rate for the last three years or five years. I don't know. I, so I try to be really honest with folks. I don't want to be a, be a downer, but I want people to go into hunts with realistic expectations and it's tricky. And like I said, a lot of folks are, are optimists and they're sure they're, they're going to be the one that, that bucks the odds and, and, and is the exception to the rule. And that's part of why hunting's fun, but it also makes it tricky. They're, they're definitely optimists if uh, if they're applying for a unit that's going to take 15 years to draw. There's there's no doubt they're optimists. But but I just wonder, I mean, with our, with our limited entry surveys, we're collecting more information. We're collecting, like Justin said, we know um, average width. We know average number of points. We know some of this stuff that, that I really do think would help some of them. Uh, it's not going to change their mind. But I think there's a segment out there. I mean, let's be honest. Our diehards already know what they're getting into. But I think the vast majority, that 50% there in the middle, uh, that do care what they're getting into and, and they have unrealistic expectations, I do think we could provide a little more info that could kind of enrich their experience. They're not going to stop doing it. We're not going to talk them out of it. But uh, I do think it could help. Um, I, I've got something that I was going to bring up um, earlier. Um, it was brought up that I was asked to serve on the, the landowner committee. And um, I think that the division's done a really good job in, in having that committee put together. It's very diverse of um, both sportsmen and 
agricultural reps and, and landowners. And we had our first meeting, um, had a lot of discussion on, on whether or not to, to do a survey. Um, but very good discussion. I was very impressed with, with the group of how diverse it was. But one of the things that uh, was talked about in that is this, this is going to be um, talked about a lot in the public, but also in the wildlife board. And they discussed about um, the wildlife board with, with conflict of interest. And one of the questions I had that I've never fully understood, and maybe this is for Greg, is how do we fully address that to make sure that we as wildlife board are protected and that we show our, our interest up front and so that we, we protect ourselves too. Um, Cause it's easy for the public to say, hey, you have a conflict of interest, but not we don't always have that conflict of interest. So how do we show up front that we, that we don't? And the one, the one time when it come up that uh, Greg come up and had the wildlife board vote, whether we had a conflict of interest and so I didn't fully understand if we needed to always do that and have the vote or, or if it, we just uh, stated ourselves. And I thought maybe Greg could, could speak to that a little, knowing that in this uh, LOA committee, we're going to have a lot of those questions. Yeah, Kevin, thank you for that. Um, so we have given trainings on conflicts of interest in the past, and we're happy to um, go through that process again. But in general, if there's any uh, personal financial involvement, whether you are an immediate family member uh, or any type of involvement that would uh, affect your ability as a board member to remain impartial and fair in your analysis of uh, either a proposed rule or a, a motion, um, it's appropriate for a board member to disclose that on the record. Uh, other board members can discuss whether that conflict is a disqualifying conflict or whether you can your you as a board member are able to maintain your impartiality uh, and ultimately the board can make the decision whether that member recused themselves or not um, by all means uh, both myself and other folks within the division are uh, are happy to answer questions off the record from board members that feel uh, or have questions about conflicts of interest um, we're also happy to give trainings and, and a, a lot of these questions aren't super black and white. Um, we're all here uh, because we like wildlife. We participate in wildlife activities. Um, you know, we all at some level have an interest in, in wildlife matters. And so that, that line of, of whether it's a, a perceived conflict or a disqualifying conflict can sometimes be a, a difficult decision to make. Um, you know, as counsel to the board, I always urge extreme caution to try and protect uh, you know, the, the reliability and impartiality of a board vote. Um, but I'm also very, very risk averse as counsel. So, um, but please reach out to us if you have questions. So, so to follow up with that, Greg, so the question I have is, I've seen it both ways where, where as a board, we had this discussion about it and we ultimately voted. Um, but I've also just see where a wildlife board member state, states it, and we as a board um, di didn't dis discuss it. So are we better off, um, like on a situation, say a board member says there's potential interest, but I personally don't think it's um, to level that I cannot vote. Are we better off as a board to have that discussion to protect that board member e either way so, so that uh, it shows that we did discuss it as a board or, or is it just an individual state what, what those thoughts are? So when board members uh, personally recuse themselves, uh, as we've seen in, in previous board me meetings, I don't, I don't feel that it's necessary for the board to discuss and vote on that. If the board member doesn't feel comfortable voting on a matter, uh, they are able to make that decision individually. If a board member is disclosing a potential conflict on the record, but they prefer to continue and participate in motion making or voting, uh, at that point, if uh, I think it would be appropriate for the board to discuss and, and make it on the record uh, what the board's determination was as to the conflict. Thank you for that clarification. That helps. Kevin, 
one thing too that uh, I mean we all know I kind of went through this uh, just a few months ago and one thing that Greg had shared with me that I never understood I've had conflict of interest trainings a thousand times but uh, Greg's position was that when we're talking financial uh, implications for us or our immediate family uh, his position was that that also includes uh, fathers, mothers, grandfathers, aunts, uncles, that sort of thing as well. And and that's something I don't know that I'd fully understood before. Uh, so as we start talking and work through some of this, uh, I think that's something we ought to consider. Greg, is that still kind of your position? Yes, it is. And and I think a lot of that goes to the potential perceived conflict issue. Um, you know, board decisions that uh, provide some type of financial benefit or profit for family members have that same type of flavor that could make some people uncomfortable as to whether you the, that particular board member was able to remain impartial in their decision making. One, one thing I didn't think about, I think is important too, that if we, if we have a tag um, for, for something we're making a decision on, um, I think it's important that we we disclose that. And, and oftentimes we make decisions before we have a tag, but every once in a while we have to go with retroact retroactive. Uh, um, and I think it's important that we need to to uh, state that hey, I, I have I have drawn the tag for this, and and we need to state that up front so the board knows that. Kevin, I I also think that's a good idea. Certainly, I I do get a little weirded out by this perceived conflict of interest idea and not weirded out because it's obviously a good thing, but I think we can take it too far, Kevin. I mean, to your point, uh, what if Carl has 22 deer points or 22 sheep points? Uh, do, do we each need to disclose that? Do we, you know I mean? We all have, we all have perceived conflicts of interest on this. That's why we're, we're on the board because we care about wildlife and a lot of us, have the ability to hunt and and draw tags. So I, I do think, I, I'm glad you brought it up, Kevin, uh, but I'd hate to see us go so far to the point that Randy's got three elk points, so he doesn't dare discuss elk. Um, I think we can go too far. I, I think for sure. I, I, I think, and a, a good example would be, you know, we went in um, because of the pandemic and we extended um, the, the season, for, for tag holders for like the bear hunt and, and the turkey hunts had, had those draws already happened and we and we were making a vote on those that would probably be very appropriate to say hey just so you know um you know i i have a tag for this and what's the wildlife board's thought on on me voting on this issue yeah i think all of our perceptions are different but i think if there's any way that somebody could perceive me having a conflict of interest, I need to excuse myself. I mean, I, I think I, to me, that's, that, that would be the, the best thing for me to do. Um, so that, uh, you know, granted I might have a real interest in something, but if I do, I probably ought to talk to somebody ahead of time and let you know that this is, this is the way I feel, but I can't express my opinion that day because I don't have a, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that because of this, somebody could perceive me as having a conflict of interest in this, this particular way. That, that's just my gut feel. Where do we want to draw the line? That's a good point, Aunt Randy. Where do we want to draw the line? I mean, typically in meetings that I sit in, I see people declare a conflict of interest, recuse themselves from the voting and motion making, but not the discussion. Uh, to me, that goes one step further in something I had never actually heard of. A any advice on that, Greg? Yeah, participating in discussion is completely allowable. Um, driving discussion to one direction or another uh, to the detriment of uh, opposing viewpoints might cause a little bit of concern. But um, as long as you are not making the motion and are not voting on the matter, um, you're more than welcome to participate in discussion. Um, it's it's that level of 
uh, kind of influence and pressure one direction or another that's going to, again, lead to that perceived conflict and uh, uh, unallowed level of influence in the decision making process. I mean, I think there's somebody that can point a finger at us on every vote that, that that's impacting us some way. So I, I don't I think we can go too far. I mean, if we have a tag in hand and it's a unique season change or something that's changed since then, then I think we need to. But, but I don't care where all you guys are putting in for deer tags. I, I, I don't care if we're changing something after the draw and you've got a tag in hand then we probably should disclose it. But, you know, I, everything is so emotional these days that boy, people will accuse you of everything. And so I, I don't think we need to go overboard, but I mean, if we have something in hand or it affects us financially or our family or business partners or any of that, then, then we need to disclose that. And part of your job, Greg, is to advise us that during the meeting, something that comes up that you would come up and tell us that we are stepping on out of our bounds. Yeah, yeah, that, that is part of my role. Um, I will say I'm not uh, personally up to speed on every one of your uh you know, personal business dealings or family members or otherwise. So um, I, I, I will say there's a little bit of responsibility on each board member as well to, to think about um, their own personal dealings and how it might be impacting their vote. Uh, I would also request that do that ahead of time, do that ahead of the board meeting and, and contact us before we're not, in, you know, before the public session where we can have a frank discussion as board member and council and, and, you know, I, I'm your representative. I'm here to try and help you guys make sound decisions that are defensible. And um, I open door policy, call, email, anytime. I'm happy to help however I can. Thank you, Greg. Kevin, could we go back? Uh, you had started with that landowner committee. That, that was actually one on my list. If we're done with conflict of interest, I, I just had a couple of questions and comments for you. On, on that. Uh, and, and I think everybody understood that, that Kevin is kind of the wildlife board representative on this new landowner rule committee. Uh, this has obviously been organized at our behest from our direction uh, from this past fall. Um, and I think the intent, anybody feel free to correct me, but I think the intent is to, to look at the rule, potentially change it, you know, whatever there there have been a couple of committees that have been ongoing for the last two two and a half years donnie and i have sit on, sat in on a couple of those um that have kind of uh, started together on some ideas some direction felt like we we're making a lot of steam feel like the timing of all this is right obviously i was pretty vocal at the last meeting when we talked about this just saying that i really feel like the land of the rule needs to be revamped and uh so kevin as our representative i would love to give you just a little bit of input from my standpoint, obviously not the rest of the board, but, uh, and this is kind of a combination of that committee that Donnie and I sat on for the last two years. There's been hundreds, if not thousands hours of discussion that kind of went into this. And this was where we came to. Um, we really feel like it's important that the landowner rule incentivize landowners. We all heard today in each one of these regions, not each one, but a lot of the regions talked about the, uh, the private land component and that, uh, that it is a significant uh, aspect to each one of the management plans and certainly to the overall health of the herd. And Northern Utah, where you've got more private land, that's certainly going to play more of a role in it. But the overall concept I think we came up with, with with our little committee was we need to incentivize these landowners. We can't have healthy herds without these landowners on a lot of these units, whether it's winter range, summer range, we have to have them. And so we've got to have a rule and a program in place that 
that incentivizes them, that, that makes them care about wildlife. And that is not just general season. We've got, or not, sorry, limited entry. We've got limited entry things in place right now that are, that are pretty decent. I mean, there's some weird restrictions to it that uh, we felt like we probably ought to lose. But I think we need to wrap in general season landowners. Uh, we need to, to lose some of the requirements as far as maximums, minimums, those kinds of things, so that every landowner that is benefiting wildlife is incentivized. Every landowner not benefiting wildlife should not be. Uh, I really think there's a better way to do it than we're currently doing it. And, and again, landowners across the board, whether they have a 10-acre orchard or 100,000 acres of rangeland, I feel like we can come up with a rule that will help each one of them care about wildlife. Uh, and so I just encourage you, Kevin, as you go through that meeting, uh, just to kind of consider some of that. Wade, uh, thank you. And I, one of the things, you know, so we did not get into in, anything, the particulars yet, but one of the things I was really impressed with that committee is um, the experience that was on that committee. Kev, Kevin Bonnell, um is is kind of directing that or helping us focus our efforts and and he talked about some of the efforts you talked about with donnie and and yourself and, and a lot of those committees and there's been some great ideas come out of those and so i think there'll be some real effort to take some of the momentum that you guys have had and be able to direct that to to be able to talk about that to the to those landowners that are doing good and and maybe um give some incentives to landowners that aren't doing a whole lot that, hey, if I do some work to provide some uh, habitat for wildlife, there's some real incentives in that. And so it, it'll be fun to work through it. And I know it'll be quite a process. I, I think you're right, Kevin. It'll definitely be quite a process. Uh, Kevin is the right guy, though, for it. I mean, Bunnell and yourself. Uh, he's, uh, he's really done wonders on this Southern Region Committee. And, and I certainly don't want to overstate this, but I obviously feel pretty strongly about it. I, I think this new landowner rule, whether we get it right or whether we get it wrong, may have the single biggest effect on our wildlife over the next 25 years. And, uh, and so I, I really, really hope we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Appreciate you doing it, though. You bet. Thank you. Any other topics? I don't want to hog in here, but I'll keep going if you let me. Uh, one other quick one. General season reporting. Uh, I've had several people ask about that, and I know in the past we've had some discussion about it. Um, from a technology standpoint, it's very simple. From a statistics standpoint, I know we've talked about how it's not necessary. Uh, any change in thoughts there, Justin? Uh, I'd probably I'd probably let Kobe tackle that one. Uh, wait, that. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, wait, that's that's a good question. Um, at the end of the day, that's where we get some of our best data because the sample size is so high, you know, and, and, and again, statistically bootstrapping statistics, big units, lots of hunters, a really good sample size. You know, it's a small cow elk hunt that we're more concerned about where we only have 20 plus hunters. That's when we have a possibility to really get harvest success, not, not getting as good. And we also understand that there's public demand to sample everyone. So the division has been working, our, our DTS, our technology department has been working on e-tagging. And that's the direction we're pushing. It, I, I'm not sure where we're at in the process. With COVID, it was supposed to have some of the first uh, tests out this year. Um, and we're, we, we talked about starting that with cougar and bear, smaller sample sizes, stuff that we already check in, um, and then pushing it out to general season. We are headed that direction is, is the short answer. Um, be, a, be a little bit patient with us. Um, we can make all the, the reasons in the world as to why we should or shouldn't do it. And at the end of the day, when we hit e-tagging, 
we'll be sampling everybody that had a permit anyway. And, and so we're, that's the direction we're headed is the short answer. Oh, that's good. Thank you. I've got one item that I'd like to, to talk about, and that's um, the HB 295 and the, the trail cameras. And uh, one of the things that I think that uh, the reason it got to where it was is because we never really um, give the opportunity for the public to have a voice on, on that issue. It, it was talked about by individuals, but it never went through as an agenda item. And I think as the legislature, <laughs> they tasked us with that. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna thank them for that, but I think one of the things that we need to do is make sure that this go around that the public has the voice. And it, it's a lot bigger than the rack chairs or the wildlife board to have a seven member vote how we feel about it. I, I, my ultimate goal would be that we fully know what the public wants on this process, that, that they're the ones that have the voice. And so I was talked about that technology survey. I, I really appreciate that that survey was sent out because we've been asking for that. But to me, that is just for the technology. I, I believe that there needs to be a survey just on uh, trail cameras since the legislation give us that. And the wildlife board had over three, 300 emails that was sent to us during HB 295 with a lot of ideas. I don't think that a lot of those emails were shared with the division and it would be my hope that there was a lot of ideas in there. And it'd be my hope that, that there is a survey done that would, that would let us know what the public wants and not that the wildlife board in any way would influence what those questions are. But I think there's certain information that the public and the wildlife board needs to know. And at the division, they have their own guy, uh, that, um, their own people that can, can write that survey. I think we need a lot better information. So the public feels like they, they are helping in this decision. And, it, and it's not just our, our personal vote, how I, Kevin Albrecht, want. But the, the public um, feels like they were surveyed and that we can look and say, hey, this is what come back. And so I, I would request that uh, that we have some really good information coming up for that meeting. Hey, Kevin, maybe I can address that a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so, so we were in the process of writing that technology survey and then when HB 295 um, went through the session, we, we specifically did include some trail cam questions, really pointed specific trail cam questions as part of that survey. Kobe and Justin, I know, have heard a lot of ideas too, and they they helped write that survey. So um, I got an update from our social scientist that uh, put that survey out. We got a really, really high response rate on that survey. He told me yesterday or the day before that it's more than 30% of the people that we sent it out to actually uh, responded. So we're, we're going to have several thousand at least responses on uh, you know the, all kinds of technology questions, but one of those, uh, some of those issues are going to be trail cam specifically. So, so uh, I think we, I think we feel pretty pretty confident that that we've got some really good information coming, and certainly um, anything that comes, you know, any any trail cam recommendation that goes through is going to have a chance for the public through the rack and the board uh, process to be able to put their their ideas in there and have the board weigh that in the end before before you all decide what it should look like or approve so, what we what we recommend. Just just to be honest, if I can, I, um, there, there was only three questions on that survey about trail cameras. Um, and, and you know how much went through the legislature. And I, I personally, there was not even a question that asked uh, about season date uh, closures about that August um, date. And, and I feel like if we're gonna make the decision um, that are, that wasn't a date that come from the board that come from the legislature. And I think that there should be a lot better questions um, sent. If we're gonna have to make a decision that the legislature sent to us, I think we need a lot better data. That That's just me personally, but I feel like that, that doesn't even start to give us the information we need. You know, Kevin, if I could speak to that a little bit too, I'm glad you brought it up. I, that was, I think, 
the whole HB 295 thing was a bit of a learning process, I think, for everyone involved. The division, the legislators, uh, the, the, the proponents of the bill, I mean, uh, all everyone that was kind of following that and, and in the middle of that, I think it was a learning uh, experience for all of us. Uh, certainly, there were a few people that were really pushing the trail cam component of that bill. And, and I think they kind of got their hair blown back a little bit. Uh, the, I think the motivation, at least, you know, according to the discussion on the Senate and House floor, the motivation was, oh, there's a few individuals out there who are just, you know, that same thing. Bad apples spoiling it for everyone. They've got a hundred cameras out there. It's just ridiculous. The deer can't move. We all heard that same story over and over again. And it seemed like a little bit the motivation behind the bill. Well, that's not who showed up uh, in opposition of the bill. It was the average person. It was the average hunter who they felt like my three or four cameras uh, aside from the fact that I enjoy doing it, even when I don't hunt, uh, it, it's, it's like shed hunting. It's an additional season, it's additional activity I can go do instead of hunt. Um, but they also felt like, hey, this is one of the ways that I can get out in the field. I work until six or seven o'clock every night. I don't have the ability to go out there and, and scout hours on in. Uh, this is my ability to get out there and find what's there. It was the average hunter that showed up in opposition of the bill. So I, I agree with Kevin. Uh, there's a lot different dynamics to this than I think anybody thought of when they first walked into it, and certainly the sponsors of the bill. And so I, I think there's a lot of information out there that needs to be collected. Uh, I agree with Kevin. Yeah, I do too. I think uh, the three questions, they were good questions. I. My wife got the survey and, and I, I got to see the questions right up front and good questions. But I think uh, at the end of the day, if we had, you know, an additional 15 or 20 questions that uh, to, to actually nail down some of the topics that the uh, public sent us, suggestions they sent us uh, would be would be uh, better for me to make a decision on than than maybe just the three questions we already have or that we will get. So I'd like to see a, I'd like to see a, a, a question, a survey sent out just on trail cameras. Um, just, this is a hot topic. This is a, this was going to be a pretty pretty uh, public topic, I think. And I, I guess I'd like to have a little bit more information to to make a decision on. And, I, and I'll echo that. It uh, it we're going to be watched on this one more than anything we do this year. So. Uh, well, except for maybe mule deer numbers, permit numbers, but we 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 need to take this serious and and uh, ask a few more questions. What it seemed to me on that topic was everybody was so uh, on one side or the other. It seemed so divisive between all the sportsmen. You was either want cameras or you don't, and it was like flip a coin on who's going to want them or who doesn't it, it to me it's i don't know it's uh i don't want to say it's a how do you win kind of a situation but i don't think there's any way we can win either way i to, to add to that brad i, I actually think that there is a, a win and, and and the win in this is is to give the public a voice so if we do a really good survey and maybe it comes back 50 50 or, or maybe it's 100% don't, um, um, don't want any regulation. The win is that we heard, we heard the public. And then from there on out, every meeting that's, that that few doesn't want it, we can say, hey, we give the public a voice. You, we're not going to act on it because of this. Or we are going to act. We did act on it because of this. And so the win is we finally give the, the public a voice through a really good survey. And it like like mentioned before, it's bigger than than your vote or my vote, but if we vote with what the public wanted, we, we that's where we get the win. This is Carl, I apologize, but I've got a meeting at four that I, I couldn't move. So, so I, I need to leave, sorry. Carl, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Time. 
Kevin, can I can I address that? And I certainly don't mean to play the devil's advocate on this because I hear where you're coming from on this one. Uh, wildlife are the public's resource. The public needs to have a voice in this. I think occasionally doing what you're suggesting, there's some value in it. <clears throat> but what you're suggesting really is, if we call it by its real name, it's just managing wildlife by referendum. And it really does take away the point of the rack and the point of the board. Uh, all we need is a calculator. Um, you know, we just tally up what the public wants and then the board doesn't even need to vote. And, and I get that occasionally that is the right thing to do. You know, we do have referendums occasionally, but we live in a republic and that is what this process is. There have been people appointed by elected officials to go in and make the decisions for everyone. That's, that's the process we live in. And so... I would caution us, let's not get in the habit of this. And let's remember that we were appointed by an elected official uh, to make these decisions and that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't delegate those to the public very often, if ever. I just think we need to be cautious with that. I, I, I fully understand that. I think, but I think part of the reason we got in the situation we did is because the public never felt like they had a voice. And on, on this one where it's so, so social, I think that we need to, to make sure the public feels like they, they have a voice on this one and they're heard. Whatever that decision comes out of that, we can always point back and say, hey, um, th this is what come out of that. And so I think I think that's why we're, we're there on this one. Maybe just a couple other thoughts on that then. You know, the division certainly understands the heat that's associated with this specific issue. And we certainly want to make sure that our recommendations are sound and solid. That's one of the reasons why we, you know, are asking survey data on it right now. Um, we certainly would, would want to leave today with, I guess, a realistic expectation. So all of us are on the same page. And so your expectations are satisfied as well. Um, if, if, if the board really wants the division to do a, uh, standalone trail cam survey, it's going to be really hard for us to probably be able, well, it, it would be a, probably not going to happen that we would be able to do that and be able to have a recommendation back to run through the May, June cycle, which is fine if that's really the way you want to go. I just, you know, earlier, you know, we had talked about uh, having our technology survey back and we would look at that data. One of the other options is, is, you know, we're, we're planning on sharing the technology survey results with you at the May, at the May meeting. Uh, at the May RAC and, and June board meeting as an informational. Um, maybe maybe having you see the data of what came out of that technology survey first before we decide if we need another standalone survey is another way we could go. But we certainly want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what the time frame would be because writing another standalone survey is going to take some time. It's going to take time to get it out. It's going to take time to analyze it and then take time to work through what a good sound recommendation would be. So I guess just any anybody's on the board's thoughts about that. Um, I I probably have spoke too much on this, but I'm I'm going to because I, I think it's important to give the public a voice. But we on the landowner committee, there are a, a lot of people in Utah, and I think wildlife board included that fully don't understand the landowner rule. It's a very hard rule to understand and how it affects the um, the landowners. And we are embarking on possibly writing a landowner rule. And I feel like if, if we're able to do that, educate the public enough to do a survey on the landowner rule, then I have no doubt that we can write a survey on, on, on cameras. And so my, my feel like maybe it, maybe it does push it back, but I think if we, if we don't give the public a voice on this one, it's not going to end here. It'll, it'll keep coming up. And so I think it's important that we get it right. And I'd like to hear what the rest of the wildlife board feels, but I would rather delay it and make sure that we get it right and we do a good survey. And, and um, in no way do we let the wildlife board influence what is written, but we share what information we need back to make a correct choice. And, and so it would be my vote that we 
do that survey and we make sure that we get the information back that we need. The legislature didn't give us a date or didn't give the division a date, did they? I mean, are we on a any kind of a time schedule to have this uh, this completed by? I don't I don't remember one. I just thought it said they directed us to or directed the, the division to do it. And so I guess that that's where I'm thinking. I, I, I don't want to try to cram this into a, a, a next meeting if if we don't have to. I I would like more discussion on this and more information from the public on this. And I'm not, you know, my, when I when I joined the board, I, you know, I the re the resource was going to be the the dis, the deciding factor on my decisions. It wasn't going to be social or or anything like that. It was a resource, but I would like to know additional information on 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 season dates or um, uh, you know if we did this or if we did that. You know, how do you feel if we did this? Or how do you feel if we did that? I'd like to see more input from the from the public on that uh, than than just just uh, than what I've already been able to be privy to. So I, I guess that's where I'm at. I'd, I'd like to extend this uh, another month or two or three, whatever it takes to, uh, to get it right in my, in my opinion. Well, I, I agree. Go ahead. Mike. I think it's important that we do it right. If, you know, if it takes a little bit longer, I don't know if all of you have seen that uh, on TV the last few nights about the Ogden Middle Fork area has been overrun by people up there, which is that wildlife management area is there for wildlife. But we've got people up there just, you know, mutilating that place with the garbage and a number of people. And there's still going to be a bunch of people up there. This, you know, now the weather's getting warmer and this state keeps growing leaps and bounds. People coming here and we need to look at the wildlife component of it. Why we got these WMAs and how they're going to be used in the future. Because we got some that, uh, you know, people just drive in on, you know, ATVs or whatever. And we don't want to be moving those deer around at, uh, you know, critical times of the year, which, you know, just coming up here in a couple of months when we start fawning. We need to, you know, look at all the different things that are going to affect, you know, deer and our wildlife going forward and also our WMAs that uh, I don't like if I'm watching TV and here's our WMA. It's highlighted. that. uh you know, people come up there at camp, there's drugs and all kinds of things going on inside our WMA. That's just not right. And, you know, I'm sure that uh, I'm not sure, but I don't know how it's, you know, working throughout the state on our WMAs. But with cameras and all the things we're talking about, I think we need to take the time and effort to, you know, dig deep and make sure we get it right. Just do it one time. You know, let's not, you know, We've already done it one time through the legislature, but the next time, let's just take aim and just do it with one shot and get her done right. right Fair enough. We'll, uh, hey, board, uh, wildlife board members, we'll we'll go ahead and just plan on doing an information on the technology survey that we've already done, and then we'll we'll do a standalone camera survey, and, and we'll we'll bring you a recommendation through the process at a later meeting. That not, not at the main. Thanks, I, just, I wanted to chip in on this one too, and I I agree with all three of you that we need to we need to do it right. The legislature didn't do it. The legislature chickened out. Uh, they they kicked it to us, and and I agree. We do need to do it right. Um, but the survey is not the only way to do it. I mean, I certainly understand where Ashley's coming from. That uh, uh, you know, th there's that's got its own set of issues. Uh, we we can get an awful lot of input from from the public, and we will whether we want to or not. We thought the few hundred emails we got when it was the legislature's decision was a lot. Wait until it's our decision. We will be getting thousands of emails, um, and and from the ones that care, you know. And and so I would suggest that uh, yes, let's do it right. Let's let's listen to everyone. We're going to get. 100,000 proposals and recommendations from people, RAC, uh, Division, everyone on this one. And I think we can still have a pretty good idea what the public wants without a survey. So maybe just something to consider. Is 
So no, actually, is that something you would bring back to us after the May, June? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if there's specific comments that you are receiving and ideas that are coming to the board and you want to share those with the division so we can figure out how to move forward with that trail cam recommendation, that would be great. Survey or no survey or however we do it, but it would be nice to know. Obviously, you're hearing enough ideas and input from the public already that you feel strongly about that. So if you can forward that information to us so we can see what's coming in, that would be helpful for us to know how to move forward and what the timeline might look like. Byron, do we just want to do a quick vote? Of course, we're not taking action today, but we could do a straw poll just to give the division direction to do survey or no survey. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I, clearly, Ashley's looking for a little direction from us. So you want to make that in the form of a semi motion? Wait. Uh, well, I'm not have sure. A straw poll, raise it. Yeah. I'm not even sure we can there. do motions in this, can we? <laughs> I think I feel, Byron, I think I feel pretty comfortable that we know where the board wants us to go with it without you needing to make a motion today. So Sounds um, good to me, Ashley. Byron, could I steer us back to the, the legislature? Uh, and I don't know if this is for Ashley or Greg or who wants to tackle this. Uh, the, the entire legislative process is really what I had more questions about. Uh, I don't know why, and maybe I was alone in this, but I kind of felt like the Wildlife Board uh, was the authority, was kind of the final say on wildlife issues and wildlife management. But in my other life, I talked to a couple of dozen legislators this uh, session and and it became very clear they sat me down and gave me a little education that uh i i think i was naive to the process we've always badmouthed the legislature for taking up wildlife issues and taking it out of our hands because we felt like oh that's the last people we want to have making decisions about season dates or whatever and and certainly you know uh we've encouraged them not to do it but from time to time, they do weigh in on wildlife issues. And uh, and I guess I would just love to have somebody share a little more experience. Um, what I was taught and instructed is that the legislature has all the authority, that they can delegate portions of that whenever and however they feel, and that they have delegated that wildlife management, the DWR's portion specifically, to the governor, and he has organized a wildlife board and a RAC process. But at any point, the legislature could take up any wildlife issue that they feel like they want to. And I don't think I ever understood that. That is part of the process. I mean, I talked to a few at the division about this. Um, I think it's important as board members for us to realize that. There is a far bigger component here than the seven of us. Uh, Anybody with some more experience than me, you have some insight into that? Greg's our Greg. resident expert on this, so Greg, why don't you go ahead and tackle that? Sure, I'll give it a first shot. Uh, Wade, you're you're pretty spot on in your your explanation. Um, both the Wildlife Board and the Division of Wildlife are created in statute by the legislature in Title 23, Chapter 14. Um, the, the authorities and responsibilities for both the board and the division are laid out in statute and the legislature can modify or change those um, at their discretion. Uh, they also retain an independent ability to legislate on wildlife matters um, subject to limitations that are in the state and federal constitutions. So they do have their own set of limits as well, but um, they retain an, an awful lot of authority in uh, passing statute that the division and the board are obligated to follow. Um, there are some pretty technical components, uh, like you mentioned, season dates, permit boundaries, things of that nature that just aren't well suited to go into a statute that's only changed, you know, once a year. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why legislature 
delegated that responsibility to the board and the division to, to handle those more specific technical matters. Um, but at the end of the day, the legislature does hold an awful lot of authority, uh, even though the division is the designated trustee of Utah's wildlife. So I guess then here's my question, Greg, and I appreciate that. Um, obviously, it's a slippery slope. I mean, I think we can all see why we want the legislator to legislature to stay in their lane and let the entities, the RACs and the Wildlife Board kind of handle this stuff. Um, I mean, there might be a half a dozen of the 108, 104 legislators that hunt that even know what's going on, and yet we've got all 104 of them weighing in on issues they don't have anything they don't know anything about. And one of the legislators actually was joking with me, but he he meant it. He said, "That is true. Welcome to the legislature. You know, I mean that that is the nature of the legislatures. You've got 104 guys." And, and ladies who are, are just making decisions based on things they know very little about. And they're passing 500 bills in a, in a matter of six weeks. So clearly we don't want them to do it. It's a slippery slope. But, but I guess I never understood that at any point, if a sportsman's group, uh, if uh, the wildlife board, uh, members of the wildlife board, members of the division felt like the wildlife board got it wrong, they can always circle back around and go call up their legislative friend and have him run a bill, which is kind of what happened, if we're being honest, with 295. There were some sportsman's groups in the division kind of said, this isn't going to work exactly the way we want it. Let's go ahead and run it through. Well, it kind of crashed and burned on the trail cam part of it, but I just, it just, to me, shined a light on the nature that, uh, of the entire process that we need to be careful. It is a slippery slope, and anyway, I'd love to hear some of the other board members' thoughts. I, I just think, you know, it's, it's kind of like what you said, the way, and I totally agree with you. Uh, we need to stay in our lane, and we need to do our stuff, but we need to be proactive in making sure that we, we take care of the business at hand the way it needs to be taken care of the best of our abilities, and, and granted, I don't, I don't know everything there is to know about things, but I can I can talk to people to find out things I don't know about and try to get better, more knowledge about that particular subject. And I'm I'm bound to make the wrong decision. I mean that's 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 the nature of the game, but just to do our very best. But I think we just need to make sure we're proactive and going after the right things and uh, and making the best decisions we can and and hopefully the the legislature won't have to trump us on on stuff. You know, they, they have the ability to do it. Hopefully that doesn't happen if we're doing our jobs. At least that's the way I look at it. Silence. Actually, I like your uh, proposal to bring it back to us to discuss it. If that's what you made your recommendation. Yeah, well, I heard I heard that the board would like to make sure that we hear what the public thinks about trail cams, specifically trail cams, and they want us to slow down and make sure all the, all the right information. So. I think our plan still will be to, in the May meeting, this will bring an informational to you, just let you see what the technology, the full technology survey looks like. Maybe at that time we can, you can all help us decide how we come back to you on a trail cam recommendation. Whether or not another full survey is needed, we can decide what the time frame is, all those kind of things once we see what the technology survey looks like. Thank you for for hearing our discussion today, and I think that um, I think that'd be really good. And it would help us. Of, of again, just to reiterate, it would help us if you're hearing a lot of input from the public already. The wildlife board members you may or may not be getting it as well. But if you've got things that are coming through and information that you think would be us and making a good recommendation to you, please send that information along. Well, I think in the end, we need to make the best 
decision for our wildlife, what it comes down to. Just not what you know somebody's personal opinion is, but what's best for our wildlife. In the presentation is today, almost every unit uh, we're below our buck where we want to be. And there's a lot of work out there to do with habitat and everything else, but we just need to move slow and do it right. Like I said earlier on this, just, I think we will, but just, uh, it's a hot topic. It was a hot topic during the legislature and it's not over till it's over. So gives us some time to work on it and you know, make sure we come up with the right, right solution for wildlife in the end. Yeah, Byron, I feel the same way. We need to make sure we do what's best for wildlife. There was a lot of people out there that were just interested in their own own agendas. But bottom line is we do need to do what's best for wildlife. And uh, But we need to get the job done the best of our ability. So let's take it slow. I, I would just... Uh, um... I'd like to tell the division thanks for today. I, I think that it was really good to hear from the regions. Um, to, to take a full day to be able to understand um, some of the regions that I don't know as well was, was super helpful to me. I think there was a lot of effort that went in and I just wanted to tell um, the division thank you. I think I will go into this next meeting a lot more prepared and have a lot better understanding. I think if we can encourage um, RAC members and the public to be able to to watch this meeting. I think they'll be a lot more educated also. So, um, but thank you to the to the division. Byron, could I bring up one? We've already talked about this just a little bit, but maybe just a little different flavor of an earlier discussion. And this really has to do with kind of how we function as a wildlife board. Um, it uh, we've all been hearing the comments uh, and the frustration over the last few years about from the racks and from the public in general that uh, you know the northeastern region voted this way and then the wildlife board voted a different way and why don't they listen to us? Um, and, and I just would love to have a little input from the other board members. I mean, certainly it's a little bit of a sticky topic, and and uh, but I think it's one that needs to be addressed. We do have a lot of RAC members who are volunteering their time, who are wonderful individuals who know an awful lot about wildlife in their regions that are feeling unappreciated, feeling like uh, the board doesn't care what the RAC's uh, recommendations are. Um, and and it's a tricky thing. I, I really, there's not an easy answer. We would have fixed it long ago. Uh, I kind of come back to what I mentioned earlier. Um, if the wildlife board just looked at the recommendations that came to them and did some math and said, okay, three regions want this, two want this, we better go. Then the wildlife board's nothing more than a calculator. Um, and I don't, think that's the purpose of the board. Uh, you know, it, we're not, this is not a democratic uh, process. It's, it's more of a republic and we've been appointed by an elected official to do what we think is right. And we get enormous amounts of recommendations and proposals from every corner of the earth. Uh, you know, certainly we get the division's recommendation, but we get a lot of other people's recommendations, public, phone calls, emails, legislators, uh, racks. I mean, you know, and then now we have the new public comment online thing. I mean, we get nothing but bombarded with recommendations. It's hard for us to be a calculator. And so it, I think it puts the board in a weird place. You know, how do we prioritize recommendations? Do we put the division at the top and then the public and then the rack or the public at the top and then the rack and then the division? Where, where are we at on that? Because I feel for the rack members, we've all been there um, and they make recommendations to us, but how do we balance all that? You know, that's a really good point, Wade. I'm glad you brought it up. 
And, and let me tell you how, you know, this, this new process with what COVID forced us to do is, is not get together. We're not, we're not hearing uh, the comments from the public at times at, at some of the, the RAC meetings like we used to. And I used to really enjoy going to RACs. But to be honest with you, I really enjoy this process too because it allows me to go back and watch every single meeting that Iraq had and that, then I can feel the passion that's going on in that room and I can actually feel better about my decision making because I got to listen to, to that passion and, and hear what, what the RAC members were talking about. And so, you know, I, I guess I, um, you know, because we got to make decisions for every, you know, we can't just be a calculator, like you said, we got to make decisions for the entire state. And, it, and, and this, this process we do now, it actually is helping me attend each RAC meeting, which in the past I couldn't do. I, I would add to that too, Wade. I, I feel like um, now having had four years on the wildlife board that um, you do get a lot more information at the wildlife board level than you ever did at the RAC. And, and I feel like there, there was times that I was, well, I was upset with the wildlife board when I was on the rack when they voted differently than our rack did. But now having sit in this chair, I fully understand why they did that. Because it's just the way the process is, more information comes to the wildlife board. But I feel like we can do a better job as the wildlife board to explain to those racks some of that additional information and how we come out with that process and, and to, to be able to fully explain that. I think that that, that could be on us. I, I remember there was a time when Paul Niemeyer was the chairman of the wildlife board. He, if they voted against how the racks wanted, they actually wrote a letter back every time and explain why. And, and I'm not advocating that because we'd have to hire a secretary. Um, but I think it's important that, that uh, you know, if, if it's something really close, we, we could explain that. I, I think on the decision that we did with the, with the elk, part of that problem was, I think many of those racks didn't even fully read the rack packet. And, and so we were making the decisions on stuff that they weren't fully prepared for and and we could have done a better job to share that to, with them and so um i'm glad you asked that i think that we we have improvement we can do on this yeah i i think those are great comments i agree kevin i think we probably could do a better job at letting everyone not just the racks i mean we're, we're answering to a lot of people it's not just those 70 or 80. Um, Certainly, I, I weight I weight their opinion uh, quite heavily, but um, you know I I think we can do a better job educating everybody of all the input we're getting, and heaven forbid our own opinions and, and input. And it's not like we were appointed because we didn't have good ideas. I, I think we ought absolutely ought to consider our own opinions and our own feelings on this. But I think we could encourage. Uh, or we could do a better job educating the racks, the some of the sportsmen's groups. I had a sportsman's group call me last week that just said, we think the wildlife board is a joke. You guys, uh, everything you're doing isn't right. And uh, and I totally get where they're coming from. They view themselves as, you know, similar to a rack. And then they're making recommendations. And then we are merging and melting these 42 proposals and recommendations that we get and then nobody gets what they want. And so we're all a bunch of idiots and we're not doing what we should. And we don't listen to the RAC or SFW or anybody else. And so I that I think we do a better job educating everybody as to how we come to the conclusions of why I raised my hand, yes or no. Um, just because there is a lot of frustration out there. And, and again, we all felt that we were all on racks. You know, we all talked to the deaf ears of the wildlife board members in the past. So uh, we all understand the frustration. It's real. But I, I just don't want to lose. I don't want the board to lose the effectiveness. And I don't want the process to lose the effectiveness. And I most certainly don't want the public to lose, uh, um, you know, support and, and their trust in the whole process. So I, I do think we could consider this and maybe make some changes. One one thing to add to that, Wade, I think part of part of the problem is with the pandemic, 
those that feel really strong about something, they would come to the board meeting. And when you had to look at them eye to eye and make a vote, there, there was a lot to be said about that. And now I think many of those feel like they don't have that voice because they, they can't come in person. I think when we at some point get back to that, I think it'll solve some, some of those issues because what whichever way we vote, they will feel like they had more of a voice. We've got eight minutes left to our allotted time. So we can go longer if we want to make sure we get everything covered and air this out. So any other comments? We've, we've been uh, seven and a half hours already, Byron, and I'm not going to be the reason we go longer. So even though i got a few more items on my list, I say we we uh, throw in the towel. Well, we're not going to throw in the towel, but we'll save those for a later day, Wade. That uh, Maybe, you know, I think Kevin mentioned it earlier, maybe we need more meetings like this throughout the year and stuff like that, just to, especially in the pandemic you know, that we're in right now, everything's changed over the last 18 months that we do. And hopefully it's gonna change back and make things better. I, I think it will. No, I agree, Byron. I think this is our this is our best chance to kind of discuss amongst one another and, and to learn from one another as board members. We, we get very few opportunities to do this. So I'd like to see us do this more often as well. I support that. This is it's been a great meeting. It really has. Well, it's a, we've got a lot of great people out there. Just to, and the information that they supply us is just first class, so we can make the right decisions. We're not always going to make the decision that pleases everybody, but as long as we make the right decision for our wildlife, I think we're doing our jobs, and we can all learn more and work together more. Just to, you know, as we go forward this process and then when we do get back to that day we can all sit together you know side by side and talk no i i'm certain that it added a lot of work for the division to be able to to put this together and and it's not taken lightly i'm very appreciative to them but i think one of the things it does is it gives um, those local biologists a voice because they can really tell us what's important and what's going on and so i'm very appreciative of that and if there's you know, if we need to do that again on other topics, not just mule deer, but, and, you know, if it comes on bears or whatever it may be, to give those local biologists that voice, I, I think that's very important. Justin, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think our biologists and our wildlife managers and Kirby and, and everybody did a, a fantastic job. The one thing I'd ask is, if we put together another work session in the future, we're, we're happy to have them um, whenever and how frequently you'd like and provide any data we can. Time-wise, this was a really difficult time to work through all the harvest data and the hunt recommendations and everything associated with that and then put this on top of there. So um, I, I guess after having done it and seeing the, the workload it put on our staff and the weekends and the long nights. And, and they, won't, they won't say that, but I'll say that. Um, I, my hope is we do these at a time that's not February or March. Um, maybe we could have it later in the summer or uh, later in the year. But um, I, I think that the feeling's mutual for us. I, I enjoy the opportunity to have work sessions and to have our staff be able to talk about and highlight some of the good things they're doing for deer. We still have a lot of challenges with needle deer management. And anybody that studies deer, I don't, I don't care which state you go to in the West, deer are going to cycle. They're going to have highs and they're going to have lows. And I think collectively, our job is to make sure that those lows um, are, are not crazy low, that, that as they cycle, they do more of this instead of these giant peaks and valleys. And, and so uh, anyways, that, that would just be my plea to the board is the timing issue on these work sessions. But again, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. And Stacy. Can you comment just a little bit about the rack and board training coming up later this year?
You bet. So you're talking about the new rocking board training that we held in August? Yeah. Correct? Isn't everybody invited that all the rack, rack and the boards both to attend those? Absolutely. We put that invitation out to current members, obviously to the new members, but we would encourage every member to attend that training as often as they can. Um, I'm sure in the environment that we're in right now, that meeting will be a hybrid. I'm hoping to have in person with a virtual component to it. Um, I understand a lot of people don't like to travel at this time or, or can't, but we're going to offer it in both fields so that we can get as many people there. That is the training that we go over conflict of interest, um, that we go over the roles of the board, that we go over the roles of the RACs, um, the, the process of how to get to the recommendations, what you can put out to the public. So it's a vital training that happens every two years. And we would open it up to every RAC member, every board member, and every division employee. Um, Justin and his staff do an amazing job of covering the topics that they tend to vary from year to year, depending on what the hot topic is for that. But it's it's a lot of information that's valuable to a lot of people. So um, I would imagine we'll get to the point where that meeting would actually be put on our website for the public to view. Because I agree with a lot of what you guys have said today, that the more education we can get out there, the more um, the, the better results that we're going to come from it. I know that changing this process over the past year has been difficult for a lot of people. And I appreciate the willingness of the board and the RAC members to kind of roll with us as we figured out what this virtual meeting looks like. Um, I do think that we have found a way to allow the public to have their voice be heard. We have received more written comment through this online approach than I've ever taken in comment cards at an in-person rack or board meeting. So I know while it wasn't optimal, um, it did make a path available for people to still be heard. And I think there are some things on that that we'll keep as we move forward. Um, I agree with Randy Durth. You know, it's nice to go back and watch all of the RAC meetings to be able to get the feel for the conversation that goes on there. We would like to bring back the public attendance portion of it to allow public comment to be taken in person at meetings. So this coming May and June, you're going to see a recommendation from the division on what a hybrid RAC meeting might look like going forward. And hopefully we will have captured the good parts from both systems. Um, now, having said that, I can remind the board that the Wildlife Board application process ends today at midnight. So if there's anybody watching that's got a last minute desire to join this group and to be able to hash through all of these um, interesting topics, you have until midnight to supply your application to me and we'll be moving forward on replacing um, Byron and Donnie this year. So um, I don't have any more on that unless you guys have any questions about it. I don't appreciate that, Stacy. Just, you know, we've got more training available, you know, coming up. That's what I just want to get out. And we will have that for the new people coming on. And plus the people that stay on and go forward. Brett, did you have a comment? Yeah, I don't think it's possible to replace those two. <laughs> I would agree with you there. They've been an awesome addition to the board, but I'm going to do my best to get some decent replacements. So. We've got a lot of great people out there that can do a great job. We just, we're blessed. We're blessed in this state. We're blessed with our Division of Wildlife Resources and all that you do for us. I mean, everyone just did a great, fantastic job. And like Justin and Shannon said, that uh, yeah, we picked a tough time of the year, but you guys got it done. Yeah, that's what you always do. You always dig in a little bit deeper. When the going gets tough, you know, the tough get going. Just to, it's the way you guys Bye. do it throughout the division and that will continue in the future i'm sure and get better and better as we go along so any other comments uh byron uh i i just wanted to chime in and second what brett said uh you you and donnie have uh, got some awfully big shoes to fill appreciate all you guys do but i also wanted to comment on justin uh i think that's a very valid point justin's bringing up um, you know, putting meetings together like this for them is uh, th that is a, a big ask. So uh, I certainly think we need to keep these to a minimum. And I think we need to, you know, consider our timing throughout the year. Um, but I would also find some some value in just having the board circle up and uh, and just, you know, kind of chat like we have these last two hours. 
and that wouldn't require any prep and time and effort on the division's part. So I think we could have these without burdening them uh, like we have today. Uh, I agree with Wade. And, and another thing I wanted to mention with all the information we received today, um, with all these callers and studies we're doing on these mule deer, holy cow, it's taken the guesswork out of this. Uh, the division knows what's happening to these mule deer and they know what's causing it. And to me, that's just amazing. I just, I just love that because we know where we're going and uh, more so than we ever have before. And so um, my hat goes off to all of that work because, it, you know, some of us have guessed what was going on, but now we know. And that, that's awesome. So thank you. Kevin, any closing remarks? No, just a, just a thank you. Uh, um, please send that out, Justin, to all those that, that uh, work behind the scenes and work the weekends. I'm, and I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad that you brought up the, the amount of work it took to put this um, together um, because we need to know. But uh, please make sure that uh, our, our thankfulness goes out to them. Will do. Thanks, Kevin. Donnie? Yep, we thank you. You guys done a great job. Wow. It's, uh, and it's going to be something the rest of you can use for your whole career there. We, you taught us a lot about the other regions and some very, very important things that goes on and really how passionate you guys are to our wildlife. I want to thank you for that and thank you for all you do. Randy, closing comments? Uh, just just uh, ditto, ditto what's been said. Uh, you guys are amazing. It, it, it amazes me what you do, how you do it. Uh, you know, I've, right now I've got the ability to be out in the field a lot, and I see your trucks out there a lot. And uh, those, those guys are out there you know, doing a lot of stuff out, out in the field, and, and it, it's, it's amazing. So I appreciate everything you guys are doing, and keep it up. And, and I'm sorry this did put a burden on you. I, I know it did. Uh, because of uh, the, the timing, it, but the, the timing really helped us for the, our next meeting. So thank you so much, and, and tell all your, all your people thank you. Wade? No, just did a, all that. It was a good meeting. Appreciate it. And, and Byron, this is Carl. I jump back on. Uh, okay, okay, Carl. Carl. Go, just, go ahead. Thanks, thanks to everybody. I, I really hope that the, the hunters in our state take the opportunity to listen to this because it it educating ourselves is important. I believe we're smarter than we were this morning, and uh, and I hope they take the chance. and And Justin, please thank your team and everybody else that worked on this. I guess that brings us to the conclusion of this meeting. Do we need a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. I'll second that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everybody. We're done. Thank you.